What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to Star Wars Reborn as Anakin Skywalker, Part 7. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Back to the Emperor and they went. By the time they arrived back on Tatrine, everyone except Anakin had completed their lightsabers. Barris with her own synthetic crystal, that had in fact not turned out to be red, but instead magenta, which is something rare but not unheard of when it comes to synthetic crystals. Then there was Ahsoka, who now had her signature silver lightsaber blades made from the Ultima pearls collected from Dak. Its exact design being a copy of the one she had done with her future counterpart. Not that she really knew of this. But it was perfect for her. Shark had collected her very own lightsaber crystal here on Tatooine. One such crystal actually being a pearl from a crate dragon. It is blue in color. Something that contrasted with her mainly red colored skin. And paired well with her blue strip montrals. Then there was Isla. Who with her very own ghost fire crystal. Had created something that couldn't even be properly seen. Anakin could see it. But that was by simple virtue of using the force in combination with his enhanced eyes. That could see more colors. Others would still be unable to tell. And it worked well with the way she went with things, considering most of her skills at work much more better for stealth. Everything, every single one of them had completed what they wanted, and there were some developments in the relationships between Anakin and the girls. More specifically to do with Shark as she has seemingly succumbed to her in a need and desire to be with him. To fully and truly be with him proper. Arnie. Padme ran up to him as he entered the palace throne room. There was no one present but Padme, Shmai, Jira and another girl along with them. You're back. Padme left her seat, the seat that she had been using to act as regent until he returned and embraced him. Yes, I am back. Thanks for welcoming me. Anakin replied as he also embraced her, while the other girls from the trip weren't bothered by this display. They knew that they had hogged more than enough time, and that dividends of Anakin time was properly already used, at least for the day. Padme doesn't hesitate to go in for a kiss, and Anakin easily replies with passion of his own. After this passion however, Anakin had to address the problems within the room. Well, one problem within the room, and that was the stranger. And who might this be? He already searched through his own mind to find the answer, and knew already. It would be strange even for him to suddenly know out of nowhere, right? Well, yes about that dash Padme is interrupted however by Shmai. Arnie. This is Meryn, Shmai said as she stepped up with the girl following as well. Meryn, eh? Anakin didn't want to unnerve the girl or anything, but she seemed to be unnerved by being in his presence. While Anakin had a lot of control within the Force, that didn't mean it was all that perfect, because he would subconsciously release small waves through the Force. His power level was reaching that level, and in fact it had already reached a level of power that was hard to control. It was similar to Nihilus and how he would feel within the Force, a scare, a wound that absolutely disabled any and all of the energy field known as the Force. For Anakin however, he was starting to become the Force, not in the sense of becoming one with the Force, but actually becoming the energy field himself. He was starting to create a field around himself that most Force sensitives would start to feel. Anakin didn't realize this himself of course, just as he hadn't at the start realized the bonds he was in inadvertently creating, or how they were being created and connected to him without his knowing. Why yes sir, Meryn was still trying to get used to the unfamiliar environment, and it didn't help that the person she is supposedly engaged to seems to be incredibly imposing. Careful there Sky Guy, you're scaring the poor girl. Ahsoka voiced her thoughts seeing that she was a little withdrawn. Anakin looked towards Ahsoka, whom was still here then just going off to do something else. Shark had already retreated because she was still an isolationist by nature. Isla was still here, interested in what was going on, and so too was Barris, because why not? Am I scaring you little one? Anakin knew she only about a year younger than Ahsoka, but he couldn't be having yet another one of her around, especially when Ahsoka was in her current state. No, it is just. Meryn started before shutting down mentally. It is just. Anakin tried to get her to continue, but it would seem she has given up speaking. It is okay. Anakin didn't mind this and wanted to actually either get to work on his lightsaber project, that may or may not be an actual saber, or something else in the works. Don't mind her, she has had a rather weird experience. Padme filled in for the girl knowing of her situation and feeling saddened for her, as while well Anakin is the best, at least within her own mind that is. That doesn't mean she should have this fate. It's fine. Anakin said with a shake of his head before looking at everyone and saying, I do have something to do. So if any of you have something to say to me now, right, right? You want to get to work on whatever special lightsaber project you have going on. Isla said as she wasn't exactly upset, but started to feel jealous at the amount of attention he would be spending on his lightsaber not weird at all, and definitely couldn't be taken out of context and be put into an inappropriate context at all. There are a few things. Anakin's mother spoke up at this moment and would then try to get Anakin to see from the perspective and benefits they would gain by making the Night Sisters an ally. He had considered everything like all of these things before, but he was surprised to find that Talzin was willing to give up the position of top dog within the hierarchy. He would never have guessed she was capable of putting aside her pride and desires, but it would seem either his influence or the influence of Grievous got to her. Either way, directly or indirectly through Grievous, it would seem that he had gotten to her and started to change her way or view of things. 
At least within the sense she doesn't absolutely despise or look down on men, but in fact see men who are strong and smart as valuable. Of course, men are still within a lower position within their society, and Anakin doesn't believe that he would be changing that anytime soon. He doesn't mind it either, as long as the men were okay with it, he wouldn't try to liberate them in a sense. While Anakin was discussing things with his mother, alongside Isla and Isla, Barris and Ahsoka decided to both introduce themselves to the girl called Marin. They got along well enough, and the two already seemingly created a bond with her, a sisterly bond, as they became aware of why she was here. Neither were worried, most defiantly not Barris, whom was already married, and in a very passionate romantic relationship with Anakin, that would probably never die. Ahsoka though she felt a bit threatened by this new perceived rival in love, because she was seeing some signs of being replaced. I am supposed to be the youngest and cutest here. She harumphed inwardly, but was actually all smiles on the outside. Women were like that, they could show a smile and look all happy, while inwardly seething and just ready to explode. Of course, this was for women that had some modicum of self-control, as Anakin had seen people lose that sort of self-control over one's emotions like that. Overall, everything had seemingly come to a calm. A calm within the storm, because a storm was brewing in the horizon, a not too distant one as well where the Emperor would be put to the test. Of course there is a reason, more reasons as to why Anakin wanted to build up his military, other than for defense. All of his preparations is for when he starts taking over more and more territory, and expanding his political, economical and militaristic influence. All over the star systems he integrates into the Emperor. He planned to see if he could either fully destroy the Hut Empire, or abolish slavery throughout the Outer Rim, by enforcing a war of liberation, where the Huts would be forced into signing a treaty that makes them enforce non-slavery laws. It was simple really, and Anakin preferred the abolishment method better. It would save him time, effort and resources for trying to take over the future Hut's territory. It would simply be too much of a waste, and a faster method would be simply to force them into doing what he wanted without them actually coming into his command. He believes much more in defending his territory and what he has, rather than always trying to gather up more star systems. If he was really that stupid, it would cause massive instability within the Emperor, especially when it comes to the aspects of integration. From turning all of the people or residents of other planets into firm believers of his societal rules and changes done, to the other religious aspects of his empire. It all mattered and was all important, and conflicts of interest from within, should not be to the level of needing to change the entire system to accommodate others. He much preferred if others would change to him, not that he is unwilling to modify and evolve himself and his way of thinking. Far from it, as he doesn't intend to be the forever emperor, and instead would pass down his position to one of his children. Then his children's children would become the emperor or empress, and further along the line other things could happen as well. He would become sort of like an underboss, a boss that was the real boss, while someone else took the spotlight. It wasn't like he wouldn't still be worshipped, or people would stop talking about him or anything like that. No, he would simply take more of a backseat role when it comes to the future of his dynasty, and their rule over the Emperor. On the topic of Meryn however, he really doesn't know what to do, as Talzin will not come under the Emperor officially without him marrying the girl. She wouldn't even allow him to just be betrothed to the girl instead of straight up marriage. Talzin even had the audacity to leave the girl here, like he would change his mind, once he saw her and lived with her, and then she just had to go to his mother, and his mother being the kind woman she is, she would no doubt listen to whatever sob story she had given the list went on and on. While Anakin doesn't mind being schemed against, those who do will have to face the consequences sooner or later. Why does this woman want me to get together with the child? Anakin thought to himself as he really couldn't see any other reasons than the ones provided. Maybe I am just overthinking it. He could be as it was a possibility there was nothing more to it, and to be honest Talzin really doesn't intend to gain anything else out this, other than a bigger protector for herself and her people. This was mainly because Talzin was seeing that the Republic was crumbling. The empire that Palpatine wanted to build wouldn't be sustainable at this rate he was going. She saw this and attributed this to Anakin and Shmai. One of her desires was being fulfilled, even if it wasn't by herself and yes, even though her son was not hung too much, and she hadn't exactly gotten him back, she could still see the value in whatever Anakin has done for her. Occam's razor the right answer is probably the simplest Anakin thought inwardly, despite everything the Emperor is. That doesn't mean it doesn't have its own problems. While yes it is pretty close to utopian society, and Anakin doesn't as much as he can to make sure it stays somewhat this way, it does take some work. Things he had to think about and things that he had to consider was everything. The economy, the laws, the health system in place, in case of a massive epidemic that even the super serum can't help combat. Everything. As the population increased once again, by an influx of people wanting to escape either the conflict between the CIS and Republic, or to escape the grim outer rim regions throughout the galaxy for their lawlessness, he needed to expand. The problem with that however is he is getting closer and closer to the limit of expansion, meaning he is getting closer to other planets, star systems that have a bigger backer. He can't just steamroll through everyone. Anakin had already set up himself to take over the vacant systems of both Bifarun and Afarun. It was only natural since it would really expand the spice trade he has going on throughout the Emperor in and out. He took Sifarun a little time backwards as an outpost first before he continued to take over the rest. The problem comes that now he wants the star system of Cranon 12, as it would expand the production of ores and minerals for the Emperor. It would increase the Emperor's independence economy-wise from other factions when it comes to this area. He would have to start a skirmish, no matter how small with the mining guild. But if he could frame it in a certain way, he is sure people wouldn't mind him taking it over. Either it is that conflict or he takes it by buying it off of them. And because they would know he wants it, and people know what systems are under his control, they may try to force him into giving them more money than it's worth. Anakin couldn't take GD4, because of its connection to the Hut Cartel. 
It is also another mineral-based planet where he could increase the Emperor's dependence on foreign trade, another potential conflict. He knows however that the Hutts would likely care very little for this takeover, if he is to go through with it. So Anakin decided that he will occupy this planet, another reason is because if he takes it, he would be able to cut off Kranin-12 from the rest of the galaxy. In doing this he could put pressure on the mining guild, and get the system at a lower price. Then there is Issa within the Issa star system. It is currently the most powerful planet within its system, meaning that if he took it over, he would own the system. It is currently not affiliated with anyone, but it doesn't have anything in particular that could help him elevate the Emperor. It was just another point, another choke hold from the rest of the galaxy. He could cut off from getting closer to the core of the Emperor. It is an industrialized planet however, and could serve to better increase the amount of jobs his people would have access to. He has no one dumb, maybe there are crazies like he had seen when those dissidents were still here. But other than that the average intelligence score was higher. Even so, common sense doesn't always go with higher intelligence. Taking Issa would be great, as then he could start expanding even more in the region of space. While Anakin's expansion may seem slow, that is because he wants to secure these planets he takes over completely. He is of the mind that when you do something, you should do it to the best of your ability. Of course this isn't for everything, but for things like work, it makes sense that one would try and do their best, unless it is some shitty job, or your boss is shitty, or the pay is not worth the workload okay. There are other and more reasons as to why one wouldn't or shouldn't be motivated to do things when it comes to work. For Anakin's situation however, it requires some level of diligence and patience combined together to create something truly amazing. For himself, for others, his people, his loved ones and now that the possibility is on the board, he would do so for his future children as well. It is unfortunate that Issa is under the protection of the Republic currently. So he would have to pick his battles wisely. The last place he is looking to expand towards is Vusa. Vusa is an Alta Rim Territories world located in the Arcanist Sector. It served as a refueling point for starships traveling along the Transgulf Route Hyperlane. This systems, this world would be a good place to start building up some more fleets. He would have to buy Pi 3 first. Which, now that he has everything under control with the Emperor, he could go through with this idea which would increase the Emperor's independence. No conflict is needed to take this place because it had no one to really protect it, just another galactic corporation that owned the world. Pi-3 was a planet famous for the luxury grill wood that grew there. It was located in the Pi system inside the Arcanist sector of the galaxy. It was here that he would be able to make use of this commodity, and put it to good use within the Emperor. Everything seemed to be going on the right track in terms of the expansion of the Empire. However, this expansion wouldn't be easy because some old enemies wanted to make his life harder. Within Hut space in an undisclosed area, the Fallen Trade Federation had gathered. It was a strange relationship between them and the Huts, considering they both had an enemy in mind to face off against. While the Huts may not exactly overtly endorse the Fallen Trade Federation's behavior, they did however house them, and even sometimes provided ample resources or information. The Huts were not that all that happy with Anakin, Shmai or the Emperor in general, but that also doesn't mean they are willing to risk getting themselves caught in the ongoing conflicts of the galaxy. They still had control over their main territories, so why would they care all that much about Jabba's Fallen Empire? No, they would be dragged into a conflict with the Republic as well, and the Hutts have been seeing some movements for the Emperor, that would indicate their military strength. They weren't going to risk everything just because they wanted some revenge, but if they had someone else to act as a sort of go-between, then they are all the more for this organization that started up as a result of Anakin's actions. Hut space was an autonomous region of the galaxy on the border between the Mid-Rim and the Outer Rim territories, near the entrance to Wild Space. It encompassed the Seclata Cluster and bordered on the Chon Hegemony. Hut space was named for the Hut species, who dominated the region. Differing accounts attributed different numbers of planets in hut space, but reasonable estimates range from a few hundred to a thousand inhabited worlds, meaning that it would take a very long time for Anakin or anyone else to identify where anyone is within this space. Also considering that the huts wouldn't appreciate his intrusion, they would most certainly try to find a way to retaliate. Back within a meeting room, the current leader of this fallen organization of the Trade Federation was making plans. Plans to further stop the Emperor's expansion because there was nothing they could do at the moment to cause internal instability, while they could only cause some chaos from the outside. It was something that was only natural to do, as they have exhausted all other options at this point, and Anakin was dangerously close to figuring out where they were holed up in. They are close. Someone spoke. Yes, those Emperor bastards are getting closer and closer to finding us. Another interjected. The rest of those within the Federation of Vengeance will not be pleased. We have barely anywhere else to go to. And if the huts can't keep us covered, that doesn't matter. The person who spoke here was King, the current leader of the Federation of Vengeance. One only needs to look at everything that was going on. That would draw the attention of the Emperor from them onto other ventures. The Emperor was currently looking to expand, and was successfully doing so with no pushback from another else. However, the huts were getting annoyed by how the Emperor had gone to taking something that would be considered under their control. It was a move that was perfectly calculated, considering that the huts hold very little sway in the region of space that encompasses the current empire of the Emperor. Sir, what do you mean? King answered, we will have to try and make it harder for them. Specifically, we will try and back up the mining guild on that planet they now have cornered. Anakin, after successfully taking the planet that he wanted from the huts and after occupying it, was putting pressure on the system owned by the mining guild. The mining guild was one of the many galactic corporate entities that operated during the time of the Galactic Republic. It would survive the fall of the commerce guilds during the Clone Wars, and would have the potential to continue into the Galactic Civil War. The mining guild was originally founded in the early days of space exploration, predating even the formation of the Republic. 
The guild was established in the core worlds, and though a specific home world did not come to light, Korra's major was one of their strongholds, because of its abundance of carbonite, so valuable in the early space travel. Eventually the guild was based on Coruscant during the rule of the Galactic Republic, though they maintained a regional headquarters on Empress Teta, where they ruled by proxy through the Emperor. The mining guild grew into one of the many quasi-political corporate entities represented in the Republic alongside the Trade Federation and the Techno Union. They often were engaged in confrontations with rival company Exaga Mining Authority, that was settled through the courts. The guild dominated operations on billions of young, metal-rich worlds, scattered throughout the galaxy's spiral arms, and mined resources there extensively. It was on one of these anonymous planets that Zam Wassel gained her Korra 2 Exodraver speeder, subsequently using it far from the wastelands of these worlds, where there was a lack of complex life forms, that could be hurt by the more noxious gases produced by the miners' vehicles. Around five years prior to now, the guild had holdings on Barlock, where they were represented by Guildmaster Gilfram. In fact the mining guild was quite the cheeky corporation, because they wouldn't be taking sides with either the Republic or the CIS, which would only lead to them being taken advantage of by Anakin. They were doing something similar to Anakin when it came to engaging with either the Republic or the CIS, as he too, wanted to make sure there is some distance between himself, the Emperor and those two factions currently going at it. King could see this as well. He wasn't a stupid person, and knew his resources were limited as well. He didn't have the power to go up against anyone else within the galaxy, let alone the Emperor. It is foolish and maybe even mad, but that is the only thing they could do to get some vengeance. It is a path that was futile, maybe even completely hopeless in whatever endeavor they would try to do but they would still try. If Anakin was a part of this fallen organization, he would at least say they had some spirit and will to do something. Unfortunately, he would not be helping them, especially when they have gone after him, his loved ones and his citizens as well. Their future does not exactly spell survival. First, we will start here. King pointed towards the system currently under control of the mining guild. We will make contact with the guild, but we will only use pawns. We can't be exposing ourselves more than we already have. They have a very powerful intelligence network. King continued as he finished. There were a whole host of planets that Anakin could expand towards, but he wouldn't be doing at least not yet, because they are simply not worth it. His current population, the population of the Emperor is growing, and people seem very intent in making love as the population just skyrocketed. Not that he blamed them because they are finally free of the oppression of the galaxy at large, and wouldn't have to worry about too many dangers to them or their families. There is also the stipulation that he encourages more and more people being born. It is quite good that there are people that are smarter and smarter because of the super serum, because they could read in between the lines. Of course, it didn't actually make people smarter, but instead increase the speed at which their thoughts are processed. Their ability to take in information is far greater than what it could have been before, and by default, this should make his population smarter on average. It is the only term he could use to describe the situation going on within the Emperor. He was also looking towards his next planet. Kubi was a misty, nondescript industrial planet that was located within the Kubi system of the galaxy's Outer Rim Territories region. A part of the Arcanist sector, located in turn within the regions known as the Slice and the Spice Triangle, Kubi lay on the hyperlane called the Old Corellium Run that connected it to the planets of Vordio and Shimir. A smaller hyperspace route known as the Vashian Way linked Kubi to the world of Hefron. Compared to the planet's industrial profile, Kubi was more widely known as a stopover for spice smugglers that traveled down the old Corellian run from the world of Ryleth to the planet of Tatwine. On Kubi, it was possible to encounter individuals of such sentient species as humans, Huts, Rodians, and Twi'leks. Then there was even further out from Cranon 12, that stepped more and more into the reaches of the unknown parts of the galaxy. Vakdrion was a mining colony in the Arcanist sector of the Outer Rim Territories. Its dense jungles made it a suitable habitat for the Alex. Here the Emperor would be able to increase more and more of its own minerals and ores, which would further serve the purpose of proper independence from foreign entities. During the Cold War, a scientist had lost an incredibly valuable anode no bigger than a grain of sand somewhere in Vakdrion's desert. Around 2500 years prior to now, records showed that the Sith invaded the colony but were driven out by the natives there. Some said that it was destroyed by the Sith, since the whole colony disappeared somehow. Anakin could make use of this planet that had barely next to no inhabitants. It may be unfortunate for the species that used to exist here, the colony that may have bloomed into a spiraling civilization, but Anakin had more uses for it now. It wouldn't simply be another colony that he starts up himself, and would instead serve a proper purpose within the Empire. The last system that Anakin could expand the Emperor into was a system outside of the Arcanist Sector, which would be his first steps into the regions of space outside of the Emperor and space he had created. Melnia's world was a murky, swampy planet located in the Melnia's world system, a part of the Arcanist Sector in the sliced portion of the Outer Rim Territories. Melnia's world was located on the Crane and Excarga route. Mel Melnia's world was situated on the hyperlane known as the Crane and Excarga route. It was settled by miners from Tatooine, after local mining operations failed and the arrival of the huts, subsequent to which the world was transformed into a smuggler's hideout. The smuggler traffic encountered by Vordio came from the worlds beyond Cyrus and Melnia's world. It wouldn't be no smuggler's hideout anymore, just like the rest of the galaxy he was taken over for himself. The expansion of the Emperor is eminent, and there is nothing to stop him from achieving one of his goals of conquering, and another in achieving the outlaw of slavery, freedom and liberty freedom and liberty. It was something every citizen of the Emperor kept in mind, because a lot of the laws while not everyone was used to or all that wanting them, they accepted the reasoning behind the logic of what was in place. Or the lack of what laws were in place to be more specific, is there were laws that the people would have accepted as common sense within the Republic that weren't present here. One amongst them being stuff to do with drugs, 
it was regulated, heavily so, but that didn't mean it was illegal to use, grow or even create substances that are like that. It wasn't Anakin's business, and it certainly wasn't anyone else. Plus he considered that his people should be far more immune to substances like that with the Super Serum as well. All in all, it was still a win for him. Another wedding had taken place on Tatooine, a wedding that was between Anakin and Shark to finally commemorate their proper union as man and woman, husband and wife. That officially increased Anakin's total amount of lovers and wives to a grand total of four. It wasn't the largest harem a man could have even within a galaxy that Anakin lived in, as there were a lot more people that probably had more. That didn't however mean that he was only going to stop there. He would have more, and that would all depend on the bond, which kind of confirmed who he is going to be in a relationship with, romantically that is. Of course, Padme here was an exception, but he had a feeling that once he somehow increased her force sensitivity or midi chlorine count, or even both, he would connect to her through a dyad. It was an answer he held with full belief in, himself, and he held that it would also be possible through the force as well. It was very willing to tell him about those chances, which were in a 100%. First however, he needed to make sure she was capable of using the force, and the only methods he had available to him to transform her as such wouldn't work. Any form of genetic manipulation is over, or past the point where she could actually go through with the benefits, and the Super Serum is something she had already gotten injected with. In fact, Anakin had gotten everyone new to Tatooine to get the Super Serum, meaning Padme, Shark, Isla, Barris, Ahsoka and reluctantly even Meryn had all gotten their doses. They all experienced a power boost to their physical and mental states. They now knew what it felt like to be like him, at least in a small infantile percentage it may be, but they still got that taste. All of them. But that still didn't mean anything in comparison, as now they had to get used to their new capabilities. Not that it didn't take them that long, at all. They were all extremely astute women, smart and intelligent in their own fields. They all adapted really well to this, and now Anakin had another way to feel safe and assured that they would be able to handle themselves, if they ever got into a situation that required them to not rely on the Force that is. They all needed some way to fend for themselves if the Force wasn't an option, and having enhanced physical and mental capabilities would surely get the job done for them. The Emperor in space was also expanding greatly, where sooner or later after these small skirmishes, people would start to look into his expansion. Only those from outside however, as the people from within the Emperor and only grow more and more zealous by the day. At this point, Anakin had given up on any hope that he could somehow, maybe reel in the absolute madness of the religion that has started based off of himself. There was just no one to tell everyone to stop this worship of him, without also making a big political explosion from within his domain. It is both a good thing and bad thing. Emperor. Grievous walked into the throne room, approaching Anakin with his new form. It was quite something to see, and while Anakin was going to only give him a completely new body with some extra bits, he decided to be a bit more kind, and also help Grievous out in the height department. While Grievous were in a relationship and Talzin would probably accept Grievous in his new body, that didn't mean there wouldn't be a height difference. Talzin just about nears his own height, and it would seem weird if he at least didn't modify his height to better suit these two together. Trouble. Anakin asked. Yin, trouble. Grievous replied. What is it then? Most of the girls were either doing their own things or together doing girly things. They needed their time off and didn't need to constantly be around him or doing any work, and even Anakin himself doesn't have that much work to do as well. Every now and then, he would have to convene with the officials that have only started to increase more and more as representatives are elected for different star systems under the Emperor's banners. We have some reports about those pesky dissidents, while all gone, we have found their allies. Grievous stated. And what do the agents say? Anakin asked. His intelligence agency was really hard at work, and he wondered if this had to do with the increase in efficiency provided by the now commanding modified synths. He started to classify them into all types of variations, which included the basic modules that they had more resources for and the Primrus kind. The Primrus were usually generals as well, and if not in the military of the Emperor, they would be working elsewhere. He can understand if there are those that don't wish for violence, and instead wish to do other things, like medicine. Even if their forms weren't exactly meant for that type of work, it didn't matter as Anakin wasn't going to force people to do something they didn't like, no matter how beneficial to him as he sees both the negatives, and it would mar his own sense of self. We have isolated the group of allies, and from what they have gathered, their name is the Federation of Vengeance, and they are the leftovers of the Trade Federation. Grievous supplied, finally, a name to the organization that was trying to help those dissidents. Anakin said aloud, yes, and we have isolated their potential hideouts. One of them being within the hut space, but we are unable to pinpoint where that could be exactly. Then there are other areas, speculative outside of the huts, but Grievous left off. But, hut space is the most probable for their hideout. Anakin finished for Grievous. Yes, Grievous confirmed. That is fine then. From what you have told me, I can already guess that the huts are in some way covertly helping them. Anakin said stopping Grievous from continuing. Also, yes. Grievous nodded with his head, and was still trying to get used to his new body. While he has had some considerable practice within the week he has had this body, that doesn't mean it is perfect. With a mechanical form he didn't need to work out and would always be in peak form. That was if his parts were alright. Which most of the time they were, especially with the upgrades Anakin had done for him. 
but this new body was still better. What about the systems we are taking over? Any problems there? Anakin asked two more questions even though he could probably get any and all information extracted from Siri if he wanted to. This was still better. Well, it wasn't, but it was better for relations. If he was an emperor, a king that didn't come out of the shadows, not ever and forever stayed holed up by himself within his throne and not talking to anyone, it would certainly slowly start to impact the stability of the empire. Specifically it had to do with how people were usually social in nature ever species, or at the very least, most species, humans, and every else that was a variation of human or species that weren't even human at all. They would most of the time fall under a social structure because there is power in numbers. Why do you think humans as a whole was able to be so successful and take over the planet? Because of their intelligence, their strengths, their ability to create weapons and tools. All of these things contributed to the rise of humans within his past life. But the most prominent feature is that humans are a social species. This was also observed within this universe as well, for both humans and other species. There should be no problem with the takeover. There has been some minor resistance for the heart controlled world. But other than that, everything is going well. Grievous stated. Oh, before I forget, there is also the Pi system. Has there been problems when negotiating for the system? Anakin asked. Yes, and it is the FV. They are getting in the way by turning the purchase of the system into a bidding war. They will continue to increase the price, which is good for the seller. I am guessing the seller doesn't want to interfere and is in some way influenced by them. Because this bullshit continues. We believe that to be true. I think that the FV have contacted them and are in cahoots. Cahoots? Huh? Anakin looked to the throne room's beautiful interior ceiling as he contemplated what he should do. The seller doesn't want to give an outright buy option, do they? They have, but it is quite the ridiculous price and would actually be way more than the system is worth even with its future projections. Grievous replied, how much? Grievous gives the amount, which is really absurd, but there really isn't anything Anakin could do, not unless he either threatens the seller, complies with the demands, tries to outbid, which is futile or he could just outright conquer the planet. Not gonna lie, out of all of these options, the simplest would be to just conquer. But while the short-term effects are nothing, the long-term could affect the Empire's ability to expand. Anakin thought over the solutions, and there was only one thing he could do. That is to apply some subtle economic manipulation. To creatively disrupt the market for the Pi system, he would lower the value even more, and the bidding war would immediately go out the window. There is also the possibility of further crippling trade, but redirecting people through the trade routes he has access to. While the Emperor is no galactic economic powerhouse in the sense it owns and secures some hyperlane routes, it certainly has become a massive center of trade, a republic of which would even outshine the actual republican on itself with its monetary attached value. That only increases with more time. Anyone that passes through the trade routes connected to any of the systems, specifically through Pi, will just have to go the long way around. We will just have to spend some extra time trading, while the influx of economic trade they have been getting, because they stand in the way of the Emperor will vanish. Anakin said already going over the most peaceful solution. Peaceful indeed, as it would cause a massive internal struggle of powerful within those trying to sell the Pi system. It would also lead to many people being fired from their jobs. But even though this would be indirectly Anakin's fault, he can't be lenient to a corporation just because of that. No, it would most certainly be much better this way, as it would send a message to the rest of the galaxy, that the Emperor doesn't mess around, and even when it is slightly peaceful in nature, it will find ways to bring others down, if they get in the Emperor's way. If anyone gets in Anakin's way, that is more like it. But technically the Emperor is also well placed here. Whatever you say, but wouldn't that like hurt the innocent people involved? It's great marketing. Great marketing. Yes, great marketing. We will frame it as the other corporation's fault. And in fact it is their fault for exchanging in this type of behavior. But that is besides the point. Anakin confirmed before continuing. It is great marketing because it would tell those employees. If they are fired that the Emperor wouldn't do something like that. We will pull for their people and indoctrinate them into the Empire. In doing this. The galaxy would be on a side. And it would further increase the amount of population growth we are getting. The faster and more people we have. The better as it would fill up the economy better. Anakin finished. So you intend to make the suffering of others only temporary, but you would also be benefiting off of it. Grievous could now actually raise an eyebrow. Sometimes you have to be somewhat evil, and I believe myself to be the lesser evil within this setting. It isn't fair, but it will provide for those that lose their jobs because of this decision. They wouldn't have to worry within the Emperor, as I have made it my own job to increase the amount of jobs available within the market. Anakin replied, I have seen this progress. Grievous couldn't dent that Anakin had taken into account what the dissidents were saying, as even though they were led by an insane leader, backed by people looking for some revenge, they started out because of a problem. A problem that Anakin had taken into account and had worked hard on fixing it. Arnie. Isla came into the room, seeing that there was only Grievous she strolled right up to Anakin, and gave him a peck on the check. You coming or what? Isla was referring to getting some action. She had already sent some very elaborate feelings and messages through their bond, but Anakin had mostly ignored them. So she had decided to see just what exactly he was doing that was so important for her to be ignored like this. They were already trying for some children, well, Isla was adamant about wanting to be the first to have his child. Not that Anakin all that minded and in fact was also ready to go at it with her, but he just needed to make sure he relayed his thoughts on what was going on to Grievous. Yes, yes. I know. Anakin replied as he looked towards Isla and decided that he would claim her lips for himself in this moment. Abu, what was that for? Obviously flustered, Isla questioned him as he leaned in, where his breath left a tingling sensation on her skin. Didn't you want to have a love-making session, maybe with a little sprinkle of baby-making? Stop that. 
General Grievous is here. Isla, even though she exclaimed like that, was feeling incredibly hot at this moment and couldn't wait to take him away with her. You D don't mind if I take him now, right General? I don't. Grievous was highly amused, but decided that he should give the two some room as he had already gotten everything he needed. I will be leaving now. I have received my orders. Thank you, General Isla thanked the man. No problem, Empress Skywalker. Grievous knew that Isla likes it when people refer to her by her new last name. Of course, she preferred when it was her close ones that called her by her real name. Nonetheless, it was something Anakin had told Grievous, so he would be prepared to address her as such. Nodding her head, Isla begins to drag Anakin away with her. She was in a rush. See you later, Grievous. Maybe some other time we can continue our talks. Anakin said before the two left completely, also gesturing to him that he is dismissed. Perhaps Grievous replied as Anakin and Isla were now gone from the throne room. Ah, young love Coruscant. Night cycle. Palpatine was not having the best of times as he was hit again and again by multiple, various curveballs that would come out of left field. He would be lying if he said he saw any of these things happening at all. And he had believed that Skywalker was nothing but a pawn. Someone that could be used for his own purposes and goals. Then there was the fact that he connected some dots that seemingly connected Vader and Skywalker together. But the thing was, they were completely two different people. He had overtly felt it, or at least he believed he did anyway. There were many things for him to keep an eye on, and the surprise military rising from out of nowhere was certainly not on his plans. Then there was the lose of the 501 elite unit, having no idea where they went. From reports they had just disappeared and people assumed they had died in some horrible way, while Obi-Wan was somehow incompetent. Sidious knew better however, as there was no way Obi-Wan, one of the most patient Jedi ever, would not be so reckless as to lose an entire battalion. He had checked with the Kaminans, and his fears had sort of been confirmed. The chips that were seen as active had gone offline, either meaning they had died, or someone was plotting behind the scenes. Much like he has been doing and things were starting to unravel more and more for him. Master, Darth Tyrannus had patched through to him on his communication device. My apprentice, is there something you need information with which is vital perhaps? Palpatine spoke and asked the man. Here is a fun fact, Dooku is actually older than Palpatine. That is right, Palpatine had managed to successfully get an apprentice older than himself and sway him over to the dark side. It was one of his more weird factoids included in his long list of facts or achievements about himself, including the eventual downfall of the Republic only for his galactic empire to rise from the ashes. Master, I don't know if you have noticed but it would seem that the Emperor is making moves on the Hut Empire's own star systems. Dooku said, Yes, I have noticed this. Sidious replied, I have it on good word that they have been expanding rapidly. This expansion should come at a price that we could make use of. But, but, there is no use in trying to exploit something that is not exploitable. Sidious finished for him. There is many more things to focus on. Tell me more about your side on the war efforts. Dooku and then go on to tell Sidious about the progress of the CIS and that he has been successfully in some endeavors while failing in others. What was probably the biggest blow to their plans was the lose of the Dark Reaper, which could have been used and taken for themselves. Unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. Since they had no access to some be-all, and all weapon like the Death Star, because of Anakin's actions, they were starting to take on a much more stealthy approach to their situation. Instead of outright war, which they would still engage in, they would try and look for things that would enable them to turn the plot around. Challenging and changing the course of their actions would help them divert the Jedi's attention, and the attention of the rest of the Republic as well. How could they not take advantage of the Republic's lack of agency, and placing all of their hopes and desires to win the war on the clones and the Jedi? It was quite pathetic when Sidious thought about it, and he would much rather prefer people that wouldn't be so weak. He desires weakness just enough so he could control someone, but not so much that they would be completely incompetent. The Battle of Moonlance was a major engagement that took place within four weeks after the Battle of Geonosis, initiated by the Republic to put a curb on CIS funding and battle droid production. Storming the planet, the Republic assaulted the main city of Haradan using a team of advanced recon commandos to eliminate key enemy defenses within the city. Meanwhile, Obi-Wan Kenobi led the space assault taking out various separatist orbital stations. This was the first battle Dirge was seen in, and caused major Republic casualties when he appeared. The IG Lancer droids also made their first appearance, jousting with the similar clone Lancer troopers of the Lancer Battalion. Despite heavy separatist resistance, the Republic nonetheless succeeded in capturing the Separatist Command, with the efforts of the Moonlance 10 and other contributing to this. The battle would also signify the Jedi's first encounter with the minion of Dooku's known as the Sage Ventress. That is all. So the Jedi have come across you Acolyte. Sidious wasn't all that happy with Tyrannus training assassins and other Acolytes himself. He recognized their use of course, but he would much prefer if Dooku wouldn't taint him with this idea of unity within the Sith. He rather liked the idea of the rule of two, as it served his purposes rather well. That was until he was unable to gain an apprentice in Skywalker, yes, master. But I can assure you that Ventress is capable enough, and has successfully put a calm to the Jedi. They believe that she has died in battle, while she actually hasn't, Dooku said. There was also something interesting the Ventress has come across. Oh, something interesting you say. Sidious's attention was grabbed as he could feel the emotions within Tyrannus are in conflict. Yes, the current Emperor of the Emperor was also seen on Yavin 4. It was there that Ventress came across him and another person that was presumably a part of Skywalker's group, that had left from the Jedi Temple, Dooku explained. And what could they possibly be doing there. This piqued Sidious's interest immensely so, because it was possible it could help him in some form. Well, 
failure. A voice was heard, a voice that was angry, and a large, huge amount of venom and vitriol could be heard spewing from this person's mouth. Absolute failure. Useless swine, useless trash, bantha fodder, and everything else there is that would explain all of your intelligence. Not one simple task of keeping the Emperor preoccupied could happen. It was King, the current leader of FV. All of you. What were you supposed to do? He asked not so calmly. WEW was sup PPP a person tried to talk was was practically shivering within his boots. Quivering as he tried to own up to his mistakes, but his boss was currently not making it all too easy on him. Sup PPP. What? Kai nearly screamed aloud, causing some slight echoes to happen within the chamber they were in. I am sorry. The man got down on his knees and crawled towards King, who just watched in mild amusement at the man's display of subservience. Your apology is not accepted. King stood up and kicked the man over and over, non-stop. He didn't let up as the man cried and pleaded, but nothing would stop King from releasing his pent-up frustration. This display was because a task hadn't been done properly, and they were successfully thwarted in their plans. Their operation to take down the Emperor's plans of expansion had failed, and as a result, the Emperor was able to take over the Pi system. It is of some consolation that Anakin had not attacked the system that he has through a choke hold, but that only made them lose out on Pi. It was all for naught, and everything they had planned out to forestall the Emperor had come down, crashing, and it wasn't a pretty crash as well, it was ugly. King having had enough stopped absolutely destroying the man on the ground, and decided that his life is not worth keeping. He picked up his bastard and fired. In the room King is staying in, there are some other people, mostly girls as they were having a good time. King was a man that enjoyed himself in these situations, but it seemed like he had shown an ugly face to the working girls inside. It was silent. They didn't talk as they were scared. In fact, they are slaves that work in the establishment that King was spending his money in, and it was a very common theme for stuff like this to happen. However, what King had done was something these girls had never ever seen before. Not with any of the clients they had gotten before and it was extremely disturbing. Sorry, ladies. King turned around and didn't care about the small amount of blood that was on himself from having beat the now dead subordinate. Where were we? Smiling King went back to the woman, but this time instead of trying to enjoy himself, these girls had seen too much. He didn't even have the money to pay for them anyway, so it would be best if he just killed them all. And that is what he did. Screams were heard from within the room, but no one was going to go in, assuming that something else was taking place, and King wasn't a kind man at all. How does anyone think he got his now new position of a fringe group way out in the outer rims? By being a good guy or being some neutral citizen that didn't do anything and followed every single law there was, even when there are no laws in the outer rim, specifically within the hut space. He is a man of a simple mindset. A mindset that determines who will and who will not die. He had come to a decision, a decision with which the Emperor must pay for making him lose his job, by destroying and dismantling the Trade Federation. There were many others like him in this corporation that felt the same, and he was just a simple man, a simple man with a simple job to pay for his family's well-being. A simple twisted man who had lost his family the moment he lost his job, sending him into financial and mental ruin. There is a reason why he had turned so radical, and it in fact involved his sick daughter living on medical treatment he couldn't really pay for. Now that he had lost his job, his daughter had died and his wife she left him for another man, saying he was crazy. A crazy, twisted, normal man that was upset at the galaxy. Upset at the entirety of the Republic and the CIS. But most importantly he was upset at the Emperor. They are and were the main culprit in the grand scheme of things which lead to everyone's downfall from within the Trade Federation. King walked out of the room, having finished his business within and walked past the person in charge that had guards of their own. Sir. Wait. You haven't dashed the manager was cut off as King just killed him. No mercy, and not willing to listen to the other man's spiel. He quickly got out of there. They are all whores, the lot of them. Would be snitches as well. I have heard the Emperor loves freedom, and these slaves would have no doubt snitched on me King thought to himself as he left going to cause some more trouble. What do you mean? Anakin has done what? A voice was heard, and that was came from one Jedi Master known as Qui-Gon Jinn. One of Anakin's previous Jedi Masters while he was a Jedi and there were multiple people within the room he was within. Other Jedi Masters that had been welcomed onto the Council, all discussing many, many things. Especially to do with the current war and the state of everything to do with it. Then there is them keeping an eye out on what their stray student has become and what he is doing. Young Skywalker, gotten married. He has, Yoda said. Married to who? Qui-Gon asked. Many, many people. Like I had seen in him, he is a ladies man Mace Windu, the other Jedi Master of Anakin, spoke up from his holographic position. Previous other Jedi, Isla Sakura, Shakti, Barris Offi and the Senator from Naboo, Senator Amidala, Padme Amidala. Yaddle, one of the more mysterious species, spoke. Why are you saying their last names like that? Now that it is official, they should all be called Skywalker instead of their previous last names. Mace interjected with a joke, which only went to show just how much Anakin had influenced him, at least in the tiniest amounts. Still think he is the chosen one now, Master Qui-Gon. Monday, Kai Adi Mundi spoke here and he said so with a snide tone. Of course I do. I stand by what I've said. Qui-Gon replied. Quiet now. Yoda interrupted everyone's talks as it was incredibly surprising to them. Well, it was incredibly surprising to a lot of them, but not everyone. Yoda, may even Mason Qui-Gon, had an indistinct feeling that the Chosen One wouldn't be staying with the Jedi for very long anyway. Master Yoda, I would just like to question about the other new order within the Emperor and Adi Gallia asked. New order? There is, yes, leader of this order, Skywalker probably is, Yoda continued. This led to another round of discussion, some talking about betrayal, some referencing to some of the more obscure orders, 
that had popped up and split off from the Jedi. Then a variety of other things came into the topic, like what they were going to do about the situation. Do nothing we will. Skywalker at fault, he is not. Yoda said which did silence the room. Some of the Masters had received invitations to the reception and actual wedding of these Jedi that were once a part of their order. They didn't, wouldn't and couldn't come because of the war effort. Then there was their further investigations about the Emperor. And with Anakin now as the Emperor, Qui-Gon and Mace knew that he would probably keep that position, and to even bother to come back to the order. The war effort going strangely it is. Yoda was referring to the events that took place, he even had a student that was in exile, self-imposed back back to the order. This led to some Jedi reaffirming their beliefs of the Jedi, and some wanting to leave and join with Anakin within the Emperor. And it was certainly a very contested topic, and it hampered their abilities to control and go to war. Something that Yoda detested but knew that it was too late to not follow the plans and actions of the Republic, because they had become so integrated into the system. Something that Yoda detested but knew that it was too late to not follow the plans and actions of the Republic, because they had become so integrated into the system. What are you thinking about? Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon were convening with each other. After the council meeting that had taken place, and Qui-Gon was called along to be a part of these discussions, they had come to the conclusion that they shouldn't do anything. It wasn't like they would or could do anything anyway, but they all wanted to put on a front about how Anakin was wrong in some manner. Of course not everyone wanted to hop on the Anakin is wrong bandwagon, but a majority of people wanted to do so. I am just thinking about what Dooku had said to you, and also about why Anakin has left. Qui-Gon replied, You can't be seriously considering leaving, can you? Obi-Wan asked as he was much more of a staunch believer in the Jedi compared to Qui-Gon, his master. No, I don't think I will be leaving the Order, especially at a time like this. That would just be wrong of me. Qui-Gon replied, Master, you had me worried for a second. Obi-Wan added, I was just thinking about whether the Count had said something that was correct. Don't get me wrong, Obi-Wan. What Dooku had said was right, and that we do think alike. Qui-Gon said, You can't be serious. Obi-Wan deadpanned. Oh, but I am Obi-Wan. While what Dooku had said was meant to taunt you and try and trick you into thinking you should join him, if only for a short while, it was all true. All true except the part about me joining him, that is. Qui-Gon explained before continuing to tell Obi-Wan about a great many things. From this and that to his other experiences when it came to the Force. He even taught Obi-Wan properly about how to become one with the Force after death instead of dying and keeping one's consciousness. Something that he had taught Anakin was now finally passed on to yet another person, and Qui-Gon was approaching his time to leave the Order. Obviously he didn't tell Obi-Wan that he would be leaving, but Qui-Gon saw himself as an extension of the light side of the Force. He had felt it for a while now, and knew that Anakin leaving was the start of something within the Force. A stirring like none felt before, and it was only thanks to Anakin's influence that Qui-Gon was able to tell of this. He always had this sensation where his previous hand was as if he was never meant to have his hand chopped off. In fact he had always felt as if he shouldn't be alive today. It is only through the will of the Force that I remain here today Obi-Wan. I cannot go against that, and you shouldn't as well. Qui-Gon added. What do you mean? Obi-Wan asked, because he was actually taken by what his former master had been teaching him. What I mean is that there are some things that can only be experienced, and no matter how much I can tell you, no matter how much I have passed on to you, there is still much to learn. I know of this, as I have learned a great deal from taking Anakin as my second apprentice. Qui-Gon explained. Well, I have learned that keeping such a close eye on relationships within the Order has become such a contested point. Look at Anakin now. Do you see him as a person steeped in the dark side of the Force because of his attachment to these girls he has married? Qui-Gon asked. Well, that is hard to say. There is nothing to suggest that he is and in fact there is a lot of information talking about all of the great deeds he has done. Obi-Wan replied. Then there is even the rumors floating about with Master Recruit yes. I do believe that Anakin has some darkness within himself. Qui-Gon all of a sudden said something that was immediately off-putting. Ha! Huh. Obi-Wan intellectually replied. But Master isn't Dash. You need not worry about that because even I have darkness as well. Have I not taught you about this? Told you about my experiences? Qui-Gon said as he continued. Even Master Windu, Anakin's other teacher, has seen this darkness supposedly. How did you see this master? From what I could tell, Anakin is Obi-Wan left off. Good. Immensely so and has a passion like no other, which is also something that the Sith rely heavily on. He isn't a Sith, and he also isn't a Jedi. So maybe that is his path as the Chosen One. Qui-Gon stated, his path. Obi-Wan asked. The Chosen One in our prophecies is always meant to destroy the Sith once and for all, and with the Sith become Coming even more prominent now. You believe that he would find and take care of the Sith orchestrating everything behind the scenes. Obi-Wan believed Dooku. Now that he was having this talk with his master about a person within the Senate taking control of everyone and their decisions. Perhaps, or maybe he would take care of the Sith by achieving some sort of balance. You see, Obi-Wan prophecies are strange and special all at the same time. Especially those that originate or come from a powerful seer within the Force. Qui-Gon explained. Qui-Gon continued. There is however a problem with prophecies, and that is that they never reveal the full picture. Do you know of the line within the prophecy that stated that the Chosen One would bring balance? Yes, I remember that. Doesn't it refer to the idea that Anakin would bring balance by destroying the Sith? Obi-Wan questioned. Yes, and no. Qui-Gon replied. What do you think the balance refers to? The destruction of the Sith. Yes, but also the destruction of the Jedi. What? Obi-Wan was immensely surprised that Qui-Gon would even suggest something like this. What does that mean? Would Anakin destroy the Order? I didn't say that. Qui-Gon was calm, serene as a pond, untouched by the world. Think of it like this. Anakin created an entire new Order, not because he wanted more power, 
or wanted to do anything like the Sith and forge an empire using them. No, he is already the emperor of an empire that didn't rely on force sensitive people at all. In fact, it was his mother that was at the forefront before Anakin went back. Qui-Gon added, I think he has created the order within the Emperor and as somewhere the Jedi could potentially go. Somewhere even people who use the dark side of the Force to go towards as they learn about it. Master, you are suggesting that the Jedi and Sith work together in some manner. Obi-Wan deadpanned again. I didn't say that. You did, and it is definitely something to think about, isn't it? Qui-Gon said as he laughed. Master, you can't turn my own words against me like that. Obi-Wan gave Qui-Gon a pointed stare. Well, of course I can. And I will continue to do so. When you give it the chance, that is. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan would then go on to talk about many other things outside of what was talked about previously, especially when it comes to things within the Republic and the war with the CIS. Despite all of the effort they had tried into keeping some Jedi, people were still leaving. Of course, of the people that did leave, there was such a small group within that only dealt with Anakin, and they would be the only ones going to Tatooine. There they would find themselves in a world that was different from the one they previously lived in, where proper things were put in place for their mental health and proper teachers to help them develop within the Force. Whether this means they are naturally more aligned to the dark side or light side didn't matter, and in the end, they would all be becoming extensions of the Force. There is no right and wrong here, at least if the laws were not considered and instead everyone within the Emperor in order would focus on what they wanted. Anakin only wanted what was the best for the people, and of course he wanted what is best for himself as well. How could he do everything and not benefit for himself? That would just be a massive waste of his time, if he only calculates for himself. Instead he would rather that everyone, himself included, benefited out of the grand scheme and design he had set up for everyone. As time had passed, the Emperor in order was starting to gain a reputation for itself, and those within were either people that tried to study the dark side of the Force, or from areas that were within the Emperor. And there were some stray Jedi, that had heard of Anakin and come here to learn because of the freedom that is granted to them. If people wanted to stay and become official citizens, then it was great. But if they only wanted to learn from this institution, then Anakin wouldn't force anyone to stay. The Jedi didn't really force anyone either. But it was how they tricked people into staying that was the problem. What was within the programs and current classes was everything that Anakin had learned, even information that he himself hadn't looked into. There were just too many things for his mental processes to look at. The Empire had to be run first, and even though Siri was doing great in helping him out in the process, it was still exhausting in a sense. Not that he even needed sleep. His biological functions were just too great for him to fail. What or who are the instructors within this order, one might ask. He had gotten people People that were force sensitive trained up, of course it wasn't instantaneous, but he was using his droids. Or at least, what ear previously his droid now working in the order, that is if they wanted to. He had a few of his mental thought processes have droids of their own to take over and start teaching as well. It may not be him physically, but mentally he could control and teach people everything they would want to know, and this only compounded his experience with teaching. Isla spent more time with small children of the Emperor and as she was ecstatic. The time was nearing for her to get pregnant, and while Anakin had changed his sperm cells to enable his ability to get her pregnant, it wasn't perfect. His fertility wasn't in the wrong or anything, and he had modified his sperm cells perfectly, genetic-wise. But things don't just happen instantly. There are failures even in the scientific field when it comes to creating hybrids. So of course it may take a little more time for his sperm cells to fertilize one of her eggs. Then there were the other girls, Padme was actually taking a liking to being more political. It was her job after all, and she was enjoying it as everything within the Emperor was peaceful. She basically had no worries as well, as most things were taken care of by Siri for her, and she just needed to put down a stamp of approval. She had the power to do so, as Anakin didn't really want her to waste away her talents if she so desired. In fact Padme and his mother, Shmai spent a lot of time together. Shmai was of course trying to nudge her in the right direction, by wanting her to hurry up and get pregnant, but Padme is against this. At least for now and Anakin is okay with that. Shmai is also fine with this as well, since she already has a daughter-in-law, that is adamant in having children already. Shark, now married to him was able to finally have the experience she wanted. Shark and Anakin were going at it like animals, and she surprising had more stamina than Isla did which lead to Anakin, believing that he would get her pregnant first at this rate. Shark didn't want protected sex and told him so, just as he had been doing with Isla. It would seem that she already wanted to have children with him, and he was starting to wonder if this was the instinct she was repressing when around him. He enjoyed himself immensely, and while he considered himself lucky, that didn't mean he didn't put in the hard work himself. Then there was Barris, his youngest wife and only a year younger than himself. She is probably the last one on the list wanting children, not because she doesn't want any but because she wanted to do other things. He respected that, he wasn't about to force anyone into having his children, and sooner or later once Barris starts to see the other girls get knocked up, she may very well get jealous herself. While she also may have her special time with Anakin, that didn't mean she had that much stamina. In fact, she was the worst out of his four wives concurrently, and it surprised him that even Padme could outlast the girl. Master, a voice called out to him as he was within his thoughts. Oh, that's Yuko. What are you doing here? Anakin saw the droid. Now Synth was now having her very own nano suit. He had created it just for her, and she was immediately in love with it, and had in fact started to proclaim him as a god. Not that she didn't already do so. But that was besides the point. She was overjoyed at receiving such a gift. Statement. Master, I have come to inform you of the Federation of Vengeance's location. Found them you have? Anakin asked. Statement. Their fee have been located deep within the hut space. They have not noticed we have caught onto their movement. Also statement. Master, my body feels all weird. Hot and very sweaty when I am near you. 
What is this? It would seem that Hatsuko, previously HK, didn't have any way of knowing whether or not she was in heat. Right. Thanks for the info, and for your hot problem. Anakin could practically smell the pheromones she was realizing, and she didn't even realize this fact. I think I should educate you on Anakin would go on to explain about what was happening to her, and she would ask him to take care of it. A request that he would accept, if he wasn't already married and she wasn't even connected to him, so he couldn't even make her a lie. This turned him on which would lead to his wives having a fun time as well. Who was in charge of teaching the synths about this stuff Anakin thought to himself as he redirected Hatsuka to make use of some items to relieve her pressure. Lamentable that I have some honor and loyalty within me. Some may question why Anakin needed a military at all, especially a military that involved living beings. But he had a good answer. He didn't need to say anything as of this moment however, as there was something else taking place. Something that would defiantly answer that question, but not the whole entirety of it. Captain, we have moved into position. A voice spoke through a communication device, noticeable an upgraded version of a comlink was being used. It was distinctly of Emperor in design and use, but that was besides what was going on as of this moment. Good. The captain presumably responded. The captain then started his own survey of his immediate area, and the base location of where these Federation scumbags were located. For the God Emperor, the synthetic being thought to himself as he saw the scum. The absolute pieces of trash that had a hand in making the God Emperor saddened by the death of innocents. Don't get the captain wrong, he too also had problems with these people, aside from what was happening with his Emperor. He had his own bone to pick, and also felt strong about the death of the innocent as well. It was something that was previously a part of his programming. Now, it was something that went to the very depths of his soul, something that wouldn't be changed no matter what one did. That was unless someone could somehow merge themselves with this person, overriding the previous consciousness that was, but with Anakin's training, connection and their force abilities, that would be near outright impossible for all but Anakin himself. The base, the Federation of Vengeance's base, was on a smuggle world. That was mostly isolated from the rest of the galaxy. Of course it was within Hut space, and because of this the Emperor and soldiers had to tread carefully. They didn't want to create a misstep that would have to be dealt with by their Emperor. So most of those chosen for this mission, had the greatest abilities in regards to speed, agility, perception and stealth. After surveying the area and seeing that it was relatively calm, the captain got up and slowly gestured to his men to get closer. They all approached this building knowing that they would be able to do something for the Emperor and for their Emperor. It really got their blood pumping, and as their two hearts, a result of the Sky Seed being used to enhance their being and providing them with a connection to their Emperor as his metaphorical children, all hell broke loose. Blaster were firing and the place turned into a battlefield. One only needs to look at how the captain went in and commanded his officers, and various other soldiers to move in. There was no in-between, no calm before the storm, and most certainly no time for the enemy to try and come up with a counter-attack. It was an all-in assault, one that would be uncontested, as the Emperor and synthetic soldiers would remain relatively unharmed. Even when they were shot, their bodies would be able to handle it or they would dodge their extrasensory perception, something allowed to them through the force. Report soldier. The captain asked through his device, no the device that was installed into his power power. We have successfully infiltrated the base through the blessings of our emperor, may we continue to be successful in our venture. The soldier replied. Fire and electricity was being generated as the emperor and men started to create things out of nowhere. Fire and lightning spiraled through the base as they continued to either burn this place down, or evacuate any innocents. They weren't total bloodthirsty hounds sent out into war, but instead living beings, especially as they are now. They would make use of Mekudera themselves, given their droid origins. It is only correct that they employ this method to create more armies for the Emperor. While they may be superior to their former selves, that doesn't mean expendable droids couldn't or shouldn't be used. Die. Various voices were weird, both from the Allies and Emperor and soldiers, alongside those that belonged to this fringe group. Specifically the fringe group people were either dying horrible deaths, or being let off according to the sins they have committed. Whether that be directly or indirectly because now these people would either be imprisoned and taken back to the Emperor for conversion, or they would die because they weren't worth it. Or to be more specific, the synths saw them as below even the most insignificant beings. Absolute trash murderers, rapists and criminals they were, but obviously this didn't apply to everyone here. Only those that had really done any harm were being read, their minds skewered as the synths devoured any and all information directly sent back to Tatooine for Siri to manage. That is right, Siri plays more and more an important part when it comes to things, because Anakin has big, big plans for her. In fact, he had big plans for the entirety of the planet of Tatooine as a whole. Before he didn't want to make this his capital, but he had distinctly found something more interesting. An idea that would revolutionize everything he had been doing within the Starship building, even the Death Star and variations of it would not compare to his plan and project. Run, monsters, Emperor and demons. Voices continued to echo throughout the base, as it was absolutely ravaged by the agents sent here. It is no use. They have armor that can resist our attacks. Retreat. They thought they could retreat, but the captain had already accounted for everything, and would be having everyone here rounded up nice and neat like. Heathens. There is no escaping the all-seeing eyes of our lord. The captain called out which prompted those that were emperor and soldiers nearby to start chanting. For the emperor. For the god emperor. For the divine. Blood. The captain roared as he rushed forwards in a near berserk like state that would kill many, which prompted the others to follow in his lead. Blood. The people roared back as blood was the key word. Head smashed brain matter thrown about, limbs ripped from bodies as some slowly dies from the blood loss. It was horrific, and most of the Emperor and soldiers here wouldn't have it any other way. It is what they are meant to do after all, and it wouldn't reflect well on them. 
if they couldn't help their emperor vent some of his anger, by absolutely destroying the people that were trying to mess with him, and had even added someone in doing so. Of course they weren't complete animals and were trained well enough to distinguish who was meant to die, and who wasn't meant to die. They all had their own moral stances as well, and they wouldn't be here if they were not carefully selected for the process. While Anakin had made them for this purpose, it didn't mean all of the synths would enjoy partaking in events like this. They would sometimes even drink the blood of their foes as they proceeded, which sure as hell put the fear of God, namely Anakin, into their hearts. Those meant for conversion therapy would be slowly indoctrinated and have this fear sealed into their hearts forever. They would most definitely not be willing to go up against Anakin again, if this is the result of his wrath. While Anakin wasn't of mind of the mind for senseless slaughter, what they were doing wasn't and is in fact perfectly calculated. He may not want to put a number on his own people, his own city, citizens and the innocent. But that doesn't mean he couldn't benefit in some way through the actions of the evil. While it may seem worse to benefit off of evil, rather than the good, the thing is, most of the time good doesn't exactly equate beneficial. In fact a lot of the time, doing good usually meant having to do some form of sacrifice to oneself, and Anakin doesn't like this idea. Maybe, just maybe if it had to do with himself, he would be kind enough to sacrifice his time, his money or effort for others. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't take advantage of those he perceives as his enemies. He would milk them for everything they had. Of course, one may also have to take into account Anakin benefiting off of the Republic, which most of them would be good in some way. But that doesn't mean they could remain so off of their complacency. While the innocent may suffer from within, that doesn't mean Anakin would help them just because they are like that. Sometimes a person or group had to stick up for themselves. Which is exactly what the Rebel Alliance was in the original timeline. But that happened so far into the future, way past the events that lead to the fall, that it was stupid to help people that weren't willing to fight. He will not be fighting a war like that. It was a futile effort completely useless, and as a result the Republic will have to fail. So the people would stand up for themselves. Only then would he help them. Or if they absolutely fail, then he would probably step in if their enemy is too powerful. After a while, we reconvene with the captain. So is this everyone. The walls, floors and ceilings did have blood scattered across and painted completely throughout this base. However, yes sir, there are no more people and these are the only people left behind. Some high-profile targets were identified and they haven't been outright killed. While the more innocent of people would be sent for conversion, a soldier replied, Good work. The sense stood in contrast with their bloodied armaments comparatively to those of weaker body and form. Let's take them to conversion therapy, while the more guilty will be judged of their sins by our emperor. For the emperor, right at the mention of Anakin, the soldier replied and saluted. For the emperor, all of the people started this chart, and it would continue to be like this for the entirety of this small entourage. The captured people would be subjected to the sense fanatic while the synths just considered this normal behavior. They would be shipped off depending on their designations, and while Anakin didn't like the idea of conversion all too much, it would at least keep the more innocent off of the chain of imprisonment. He wanted to keep people safe, but he didn't want to coddle them either, as that would be too disastrous for them. No, he believed he was doing them a solid by re them, and he knows it sounds horrible, but this is exactly one needed to do with inmates or prisoners. To properly reintegrate them back into society at large, a re-education process had to begin and had to finish. King was in a bad state. It was all over everything he had been trying to work on, and it was his fault for believing that everything would be okay. He knew that he shouldn't have caused a ruckus in that whole house, but he just couldn't help himself, and in his delirious state, high off of drugs he had made a mistake. This made a trail leading right back to everyone else and he had the audacity to believe he would get off scout-free. He was beaten to a pulp as those Emperor and soldiers did quite the number on him, after discovering he was the main reason for their operation. The Huts most certainly would be distancing themselves from their little fringe group, and he would have no backer. None from the Republic, the CIS or even the Huts. Especially all three of them and whatever legal system that was in place within the Emperor would most certainly have him convicted of his crimes, and possibly punished with a pretty bad sentence. You'll never take me alive, he had said. I will kill you all. The Emperor is the devil, he had said. I will fuck all of his pretty wives. He had said and laughed manically, but this would only make him get into an even worse state than he was before. Anakin wouldn't be letting this guy off even if he was innocent just for saying that. The end of the Federation was nigh at hand, and King was just another broken man at the end of the day. A man broken by the Trade Federation's wrongdoings, broken by the circumstances that he found himself in. But that doesn't mean Anakin will be lenient. No, this would only give him cause to do something even more extreme. Anakin would make sure he suffered. So it was you, huh? Grievous walked in to interrogate the main culprit, well sort of main culprit. It was stupid of you to leave that trail. Did you think it would be one of your lackeys that would be your downfall? Grievous looked the man up and down, and could say he didn't really care. With hate, absolute pouring hate, like a torrent of rain spraying down on him, King screamed at Grievous. I hate you. I hate your emperor. I hate the dowager. I hate everyone. Within. This. Stupid empire. He absolutely convulsed within his seat, restrained and couldn't do anything as he was however, you should probably calm down there. Harming yourself will not do you any good, and even if he dies, there is no way the emperor is letting someone like you go that easily. There is a special place designed just for you, that the emperor was working on. You will probably be the first to know outside of his immediate friends. Grievous didn't really need to sound so ominous, but it still came off that way. Abu, what are you talking about? King was delirious, as if he was still high on drugs. It doesn't matter but you will be going to hell. And what is that? The man was emboldened, not fearing this as he knew that was impossible. 
Send me to hell. What is he going to do? Kill me. King laughed manically. But Grievous was dead serious when he said this. Well, not exactly hell, as there is a dimension that already exists called hell. No, you will be going directly into the void otherwise known as nothingness. You will simply cease to exist. Grievous said before continuing one last time to make the man understand. Emptiness, meaning that every trace of who you are will die. Your soul, your mind and consciousness everything. Even memories of you will no longer exist. Ha ha ha. Whatever you say, old man. King was definitely not in the right state of mind. Sighing Grievous gets up and leaves shaking his head, knowing that this man will be the first to experience such a cruel fate. Not that it wouldn't be undeserved, just that it was a bit tragic that this person, so broken would not be anymore. Some might even say this is a mercy compared to all of the other things Anakin could do to him. To further help himself to increasing and developing his special project in regards to Tatrine and Siri, Anakin didn't need too many things left. He basically has most of the designs drawn up already, where his own input was added even alongside his mother and several other trained professionals. Having scavenged the broken down bits and pieces of the Dark Reaper, Anakin had acquired yet another piece of technology that could destroy entire worlds. At this point he had the blueprints for the Death Star, Infinity Gate and now the Dark Reaper. Three things with the capabilities of destroying an entire planet, if he really needed something like that. Which he didn't, but the main part was not the destruction they could cause. No, Anakin wasn't after that, but instead wanted more and more information innovative works, grand designs and structures that were giant masses of technology. What he wanted was to make something self-sufficient, with no wastage in energy, and if there was going to be an energy source, it had to be something unlimited. Name the force, and the energy field it was would either become that energy, or he would try some other way to come up with something better. Of course there was the idea of creating a Dyson Sphere, a hypothetical megastructure that completely encompasses a star and captures a large percentage of its power output. This however would be a waste because as it is, he would only be able to capture a large percentage of energy, and the rest would escape. The is the truth, the hard truth when it comes to the laws of physics. There is just no way for him to reserve all of that energy, and then recycle it, keeping it within one place, not unless the force is somehow used. So he would be looking into structures like the Dark Reaper, the Star Forge, and even the Golden Globe artifact he had taken from Yavin 4. He didn't only want to create a renewable energy source that would never run out, but he also wanted to create something else. Something that would start to transform the planet of Tatooine into a near-complete technology-based planet. Tatooine and on itself would become a living planet, much more than it already was, where Siri would act as the spirit, and as such, Anakin would be the spirit's overlord. This massive project came from some flashes of inspiration that tempted him into doing something as crazy as this. As crazy as turning the entirety of a planet into a living, moving behemoth similar in nature to what the Death Star was but it wouldn't have the Death Star's capabilities. This is why he wanted an unlimited energy source, and believed that while the Force is infinite, that doesn't mean it can't be harmed too severed in some way. Specifically when it comes to his powers or abilities and it makes sense if there are others that have the capabilities to do something like this. To siphon and create scare, wounds in the Force to disable his unlimited source of energy. When it comes to Tatrine, he wouldn't be completely mechanizing the planet, harnessing it and draining it of whatever life force it has, but instead, he would be creating what is essentially a cyber planet. This by far is the better idea instead of making it fully mechanized, because that would destroy the planet. Not in the sense that it would just blow up, but in the sense that he would be severing its connection with the force, severing its connection to him, and while he did have large amounts of stock when it came to non-organic midichlorians, that wouldn't be enough for the entirety of the planet. At least from the numbers he had gathered even salvage from the previous living droids deactivated metal bodies. Of course, Anakin had to think about other things as well, because an empire doesn't just run itself, no matter how much he would automate the process. People were still alive, those that were living were still living, and still very much connected to the Force, and because of this, Anakin would have to be a people person. No matter how much he would like to have and enjoyed staying within the shadows, in the end there is no escaping the truth. The truth will come out no matter what, no matter how well you hide your secrets, especially in a universe like this with the all-invasive force. It is practically already within his mind and the minds of every other living thing. The only difference that he has from others is his unique advantage of knowing the future, being the child of the force, and being the combination of the souls of the original Anakin and himself from his previous life. It may be that there is more to it than that, but Anakin is able to identify just what or why exactly he is able to defy fate and destiny. He is able to go up against what the Force wants and challenge it with his sheer willpower, going so far as to start to separate himself from the Force. Not in making himself not a part of the Force, but instead separating himself by leaving the connection, but allowing himself a hideaway. A place that if he wanted, he could still use Force-like abilities, but be unhampered and completely undirected by the Force. This is why he is building his very own dimension, where he just stole the name of Heaven. This is why he is starting to do some scientific projects in relation to midi-chlorium manipulation and the transformation of such symbiotic life forms. He is transforming them, or at least trying to transform them to not only become better, but also trying to make sure they would have a special connection only to himself. He was starting to notice it himself. His presence within the Force was starting to create a chain reaction like no other, and while those connected to him don't feel the effects, others that are Force-sensitive can. He has reached a tipping point in the build-up of his power, of his strength, and it wouldn't stop there. He was fearing about his control even though it is perfect, and the leftover energy isn't exactly normal. No, it was an energy field of its own, and it was all originating from him. When I said I'm going to become the Force, I didn't exactly mean this. 
But this is better than what I had originally planned. What Anakin was doing is essentially becoming the Force, the actually energy field that is the Cosmic Force. While the Living Force, which is the midi-chlorians would slowly be changed as well, as he tries to create a stronger and much better version of the Living Force of midi-chlorians for himself and others. He wouldn't keep this to himself, especially those that would be under him and his wives, lovers and family. How could he reject them from himself? There was something else he had to think about as well. What he would be doing in regards to the hearts, and their blatant attempt to try and pull him downwards. They would be getting theirs. Anakin knows that they will as he would be creating an army, an army that he has already built up enough to go against them. But this wouldn't be without casualties and loss and resources, which is something he can't really afford right now, as it would make the Emperor appear weak. Of course he could always rely on his all-crushing, world-destroying power, but that would just make everyone else incentivized to attack him. He didn't want to end up like Nihilus, but he also didn't want to do nothing about it, and not make the abilities he now has access to useless. Now to deal with someone that dared to try and do something to me, or my wife's Anakin was obviously referring to King, the lunatic. It would seem that all of Anakin's enemies were in some way, shape or form insane from their circumstances, or just outright psychopaths, for example, Sidious hello there. Anakin sat on his throne as people were presented to him, people that were a part of the Federation. He looked into their souls, their minds himself as even though the soldiers, the sense were reliable, he knew that emotions could tamper with things. Even emotions from times long since past could become tampered with when a lot of emotion is present in the present. The mind isn't perfect, no matter how much resources are put into it, so Anakin obviously for himself, didn't always use his mind, but instead use the Force. It was the best way to determine whether or not someone was worthy of punishment, as while the Force does act naughty sometimes when it comes to him, it wouldn't jeopardize something like this. If it wanted to do something to him, it wouldn't do so through others, and would directly go to him to do so. Innocent. Anakin called out as he gestured for the next person to come, and as he progressed, more and more people started to become guilty. Anakin didn't even bother to say anything anymore after a certain point, and just directly absorbed the force energy and life force of those that were guilty. They were complete wastes of space, and every time he went into the mind of someone and read their memories, he would have to further and further temper his own willpower. Some things were just best left unseen, but obviously the world isn't such a nice place, so it is better for Anakin to get used to such experiences as early on as he can. Next, Anakin called out, but knew that the last person to come through those doors is the leader behind all of those people. Look who we have here. Anakin stood up, the droids within the palace were nonchalant, but was still alert because they wanted to protect their master no matter what. Even when he could destroy the palace himself if he wasn't in control himself, by simply moving his arm in one direction. You, you are the emperor. Yes I am. Anakin walked around the down man, his limbs were actually cut off, his tongue wasn't cut out however, but he was left in such a state, that it is unbelievable that he was still alive. You did this to me. The sense, or was it grievous, had gone so far as to mutilate his reproductive organs, making sure he couldn't even call himself a man. It was very unappealing to see the man in such a state. But Anakin decided to read the man's mind just to be sure of his thoughts. As while he may be protective over his loved ones, that doesn't mean that what this guy said was actually what he wanted. Welp, I was wrong Anakin had thought that, until he saw that the thoughts of King were exactly like it was already proposed. An absolute degenerate piece of garbage. And what was worse, is that it was nearly all as a result of his own tragedies. Something that could make one stronger. But instead this man decided to become psychotic, maybe stronger in the sense he was willing to do all of this crazy stuff. Nonetheless Anakin considered him weak. Why are you ignoring me? Listen to me. King called out. But that wasn't even his real name. Now was it? Be quiet, Theodore. Shadu, why you know that? The man was startled as his real name was exposed. Are you? The whole lot of you are monsters. Theodore, you will be no more. Anakin decided that was enough out of him, and just walked up to the crippled, disabled and incapable man that was named Theodore, otherwise known as King. He reached out his hand but didn't touch the fifth in front of him, and directly pulled out the consciousness, the soul of King. You will be no more, the only person that would ever remember you had even existed would be me. No one else, you won't even have a name in history, you will be no one. In fact you would not even be no one, and would instead not even exist. Anakin said as he saw the horror-filled eyes of Theodore, finally realizing the situation he has gotten himself in. Theodore didn't even have all of his body parts returned to him as a ghost, and instead didn't even have the dignity of going out with his form intact. Anakin didn't allow for that to happen, and instead made sure when he threw him into the void, he wouldn't be receiving anything in particular. He would be slowly consumed by the darkness, and Anakin would try and do something miraculous for the man's daughter, who had died. While her soul was most likely one with the Force now, that didn't mean Anakin wouldn't try and extract Theodore's life force, and send it through to the daughter that is dead. She was more like in a brain-dead state rather than proper fully dead, and this would give her a chance to live. She would live without a father of course, but she had her mother still and a rich stepfather as well, so it was better than nothing. I hope you don't rest in peace. Anakin gave his final goodbye to the tortured soul of one Theodore Miller, otherwise known as King. He wouldn't be existing past this point of time, and even then, he wouldn't even exist in the past as well, and it would seem as if he wasn't a person at all. Within Anakin's bedroom, his royal suite if you will, both he and Padme were cuddling each other, after a rather long session of love making between each other. She wasn't the only one to come into his room to come and engage in some rather scandalous acts, as his other wives were brought into here as well. He had quite some fun times within, and he would continue to do so as well, with no interruptions by anyone. Padme, Anakin stared, as he got her attention. Groggily, Padme responded, Are we still not finished? I don't think I could do any more. 
I don't mean we should have another round. I wanted to ask you something. Anakin said. Why? What is it? Padme asked. Remember how Isla wouldn't accept you because you didn't have a die bomb with me? Anakin asked. Yes, but I also remember that she got over it as well. Padme had made her see it from her perspective and had kind of tricked the poor girl. Not that she did anything bad, but just defended her love for Anakin. Yes, that is true. What I meant to ask you about was if you were willing to experience that with me. Anakin explained before continuing. Experiencing what it feels to be like that, connected to me spiritually and fully without me having to aid you through the Force. I don't need your magic to tell me I love you, Ani. Padme said, which was something that filled his heart with a strange warmth. A warmth that would have turned into passion only if she was up for another round. But it was obvious she is both tired mentally and physically. I already know of how I feel. But, but, Anakin continued for her. I do believe I am a little jealous in just what those feelings everyone else around me experiences. I would like to know, if only for a short while. Padme finished for herself revealing her truthful feelings on the matter. Didn't I promise to make you like us, like all of us? Anakin asked her, seeing that she was being truthful. You did, but I have done my own research. Don't think that just because I spent most of my time studying and delving into politics, that I wouldn't be smart enough to understand things from a medical perspective, or even from the perspective of a trained force sensitive. Padme said, I didn't say that you did. Hey, Padme exclaimed. He just embraced her fully so, engulfing her in his arms. She even blushed as she also felt his not so little brother poke her as well. I thought I had said Padme was aroused, but she was also sore enough to know her limits. If she didn't resist this temptation, she wouldn't be able to even get out of bed proper. Don't worry, we won't be doing any more of that. Anakin whispered into her ear, like the devil he was, wanting to see if he could trick her, getting into another session of love making between the two of them. Unless, of course you want some more. I want Dash Padme cute herself off before she said more and continued. No, 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 bad Arnie, bad. All right, all right, it was worth a shot. Anakin said, sighing inwardly but not showing any disappointment on the outside. Yeah, save that for someone else. Your mind tricks don't work on me, remember? You said it only works on the weak of will. That is true. Anakin nodded his head before saying, But, who knew you could even resist the temptation of the feelings I give you? It makes me wonder whether or not you actually love Dash. He was cut off however as Padme kissed him on the lips. And it wasn't so innocent. It was full of love and passion as if to reaffirm to him that she does indeed love him. He knew this. But it would seem that she had taken his joke a little too seriously. All right? Anakin separated her from him. Don't worry. I know. She just gave him a glare before cuddling him some more, and in an attempt to make him the little spoon she failed, and became the little spoon herself. Don't joke around about stuff like that. Padme huffed. But she didn't mind cuddling him even tighter. Not that she could harm him or the other way around be harmed herself. You know, I can do it. I will make you able to feel how I feel, and form a connection between the two of us. Anakin said, promising to her that he would. You can. She questioned him, and he just nodded in reply. If you really can, when can we do it? How can we do it? And how are you even sure we would have a bond formed between us? Isn't it based off of compatibility and all of that? Are you not worried that we may not be meant to be together? It would seem that Padme had a lot of insecurities because of Anakin having many other women around him, in combination with him being much more closely connected with them, and she is the only one left out. I know I can, and through the Force. I know that we are meant to be together. Anakin replied while thinking to himself at the same time. If you are the original were meant to be, of course your coupling would have destroyed the universe, but also helped to restore it, then I know for sure we are meant to be as well. He continued inwardly. It is a good thing that Force is on my side in this instance, and doesn't want to jump scare me with being unable to connect with her. Really? Padme looked into his eyes as she said this, and he could sense her turmoil. While she does love him and feel that are meant to be, it doesn't mean she was supposed to be strong all of the time. Mentally a lot of things should have gotten to her, especially when she was only 14 to 15 years of age as a queen. Even younger than that were other girls even younger than herself. That rose to the position of queen and excelled. There were a lot of things to take into account when considering Padme, and Anakin didn't mind putting in some extra effort for any of his loved ones, and he would continue to do so because that is how it is meant to be. It is what he wants to do, and if he gives it his all, so too would those he is connected with give it their all as well. Again, relationships were not 50 50 -ths, but instead 100 100s. Anakin had to give all of himself to them, and they would in return give all of themselves to him. It is as simple as that. Anakin leaned in to kiss Padme back, and this time it may not have been as passionate or hungry as Padme's before, but it helped a certain feeling. A feeling that everything would be okay, and that he is sure, certain in his position that his feelings matter, even if the Force wanted to separate the two, he would be against this. He was already fast approaching that point of power, and it wouldn't be long now, before even the Force would be unable to direct him anymore. It would be unable to change the flow of fate when it came to things related to him and those around him. He was a push, a pulse and pull within the Force that things just naturally gravitated towards him and orbited him like planets. He was a star, a gigastar that would create a system of his own within the mighty universe that was the Force. Of course. Anakin finally replied as he hugged her back, where the both of them would finally drift off to sleep. Well, Padme would fall to sleep with a smile on her face, while Anakin would still be hard at work in his own mind within the background, as the Empire can't exactly run itself. Not yet at least, and even then. I don't Anakin wants to get engaged to the girl you have given him. I think you should wait and at the very least consider why he doesn't want a straight up marriage at the age the girl is. Grievous spoke to Talzin, as he had traveled constantly as well, to set up the transportation device on Dathoma. 
Anakin would at least give the Dathomarians a way to travel to the Emperor, and he would send out some of his armies to better protect this place as it could become a weakness otherwise. A point of entry into the Emperor that could be disastrous if he didn't fortify this teleportation device he had created for all of the star systems within the Emperor. What do you mean? Doesn't the Emperor not like my gift? I had assumed that he would have liked to take another woman for his collection, Talzin replied to Grievous, showing her view of what Anakin was like. Don't get me wrong here, but I think you are being a bit biased. Grievous obviously didn't want to upset his lover, but he also wanted to come to the defense of his savior. Biased? How is it that when I make such a simple observation that I'm biased? I had thought that he would have loved to have another girl, and I saw that we only had one girl here that was acceptable to whatever degree he is accepting. Talzin said, still a bit pissed she hasn't gotten what she wanted. Anakin may have started to help set up some better communications between the Emperor and is even building a Stargate. That still wasn't enough for her. Look, I know that it seems weird, but everyone that is in a relationship with the Emperor already accepted this caveat in their relationship. It isn't like they are hurting anyone, okay? Grievous supplied trying to ease her into being more accepting. There is a condition that the Emperor proposed he would accept, but only if you accept some different conditions. Oh, he is willing to take the girl. Then why am I wrong? Calm down, calm down. You are wrong because the Emperor will allow the girl to be better to him, and would do so because you want him to marry her straight away. This way, if a girl in the future, upon becoming an adult, doesn't want to go through with it, she may leave. Grievous obviously left out the fact that Marin would most certainly be leaving, if by that time she didn't form a diet with Anakin. What she doesn't know, doesn't hurt her. While Grievous like being honest with her, is most relationships should be, that doesn't mean that had to tell each other absolutely everything about each other. Thinking to herself, Talzin replies, okay? She had gone over the benefits to her and those around her, and came to the conclusion that this is for the best. There was no need to force the girl, especially when Talzin herself was sort of against the idea of polygamy. Especially when it came to men having multiple wives, as that just wasn't what she was into, and would much rather the females be the one on the receiving end. It may not make sense evolutionary-wise for a woman to have multiple partners, but it was at least fair within the Emperor. Anakin didn't discourage and allow everything within. Who was he to say who you could love and who you couldn't? It wasn't like it was harming anyone as well. I thought that you would have put up some more resistance, Grievous said as he looked Talzin up and down, and could only thank Anakin within his mind for at the very least making him the same height as her. It would have been extremely awkward otherwise. I won't lie and say I wasn't thinking it. Talzin looked at Grievous and couldn't help but compliment him as she much rather preferred this look rather than his mechanical self. You look quite good. She was surprised that Grievous was gifted an entirely new body. I know, I think that I like you I mean my own body as well. Grievous slipped as he was checking her out, because despite them both being quite old and incapable of have children with each other, they were still plenty capable in that department. It would also seem that you aren't exactly incapable as well. Let's leave these two old lovebirds to have their own way and talk about something else, as no one really wants to see these two flirting with each other. One reason Anakin wanted Dathoma under his control was the immense benefit of both having an outpost on the other side of the galaxy, but also because he could start looking into transforming this planet into something else. It had a very spread out wildlife, and because of this, Anakin would be taking control of this factor and transforming this place into a research area. Not just research, but for people that were interested in taming and training animals, because animals were quite important as well. Droids and the variations of droids may be important, but it isn't the be-all and all, and creating better livestock would work to his advantage. He may have massive agriculture worlds, but he is lacking in an area specifically within the market, and that was for meats. Of course he could have always created some synthetic meat, no, not from the synths, but created meat from chemical compounds, bacteria and viruses, all centered on cultivating edible and nutritious meat substitutes. This would take up too much much, not because it couldn't be done, but looking and producing this in large quantities is currently impossible due to the lack of resources. But he could create a planet that is meant to look after animals. Whether these be animals for entertainment, livestock or train pets for either the public and military. It was all on the board. That would only be one side of the planet however, as the Night Sisters would no doubt not like this idea too much, so he would compromise and set up something else entirely for them. A place that would allow force sensitive people to come here and engage with the people. It would basically become something of a training ground for the people from his temple to walk through. The ancient Jedi had something like this where if one person was too aligned to one side, they would have to travel towards the other side of a planet and realign themselves. They were the very first proper force sensitive organization after all, and it seemed like their structure was flawed. Anakin would have to take inspiration from them, but not be exactly like them because they had failed. He doesn't want to fail himself in his endeavor, so of course he needed to right their wrongs and do it better this time. There were a few ways and things for Anakin to give Padme the ability to use the Force. First was trying to increase her midi chlorine count, but anything he does himself would be very, very limited. The second is trying those magic rituals done by the Zabrakum Dathoma, but he also knows that the benefits are not as great if she is an adult, meaning it would not increase her sensitivity. So Anakin had to accelerate his plans to create his own midi-chlorians. A more advanced and evolved version of midi-chlorians, that should be able to utilize the force much better than someone that had the basic version. He was also obviously going to call these midi-chlorians, sky midi-chlorians okay? It is a mouthful and probably won't catch on. 
But since Anakin is the creator, he has the right to call it after himself. Every scientist has the chance to name things they discover after themselves, so why couldn't he do so as well? Emperor, I apologize for not receiving you much sooner. A rather large scientist ran up to Anakin and came to a screeching stop right in front of him, before he promptly got on his knees, and worshipped the very ground he walked on. This type of zealotry. Anakin was thinking inwardly while outwardly he didn't show any change in his behavior. It is okay. I did come here on no prior notice. Anakin stated as he lifted the man off of the ground. No, my emperor, I should have come here to personally greet you dash. The scientist was beginning to start up his self-loathing at having to fail him. But Anakin, but a stop to that, that is enough. Anakin said firmly, which instantly shut the man up. Anakin had come over to his research department here on Tatrine, where all of the medical pieces was being done. The department that would be the next step in his very own evolution and the evolution of everyone else that was all had for sensitivity. In fact, this research he was doing into creating a better version of the midi-chlorian would not only affect himself and those around him, but probably the entirety of the Emperor. Basically everyone at that point would be force sensitive, meaning that he may need to look into standardizing some basic force practice into the education systems of the future. For now, it would only be used on himself so he could better establish a connection, and because he could undo the damage by isolating any of these flawed sky midi chlorians. Lead me to the facility. Anakin ordered the man, and strangely enough if one compared their heights, this scientist was even larger than Anakin. He looked much more taller, by at least 30 centimeters, and was physically more imposing so to speak, but he was reserved and acted subserviently towards Anakin. This person was one of the droids that had become a synth, but he wasn't a normal droid, but instead a medical one. That is why he is down here working in this research department instead of being a part of the military like the others. Again, Anakin had said he wasn't going to just force everyone to do a certain job, but instead let them choose. Obviously they chose what they were passionate about, but most obviously what they were programmed to do. While Anakin did say he would let them choose, it made sense that they would go on the predetermined path they had been set upon by Anakin. Only a small percentage from all of the living droids had decided to do something different from what their programming from the start gave them the ability to do. It would be random, this small percentage from being something as simple as a farmer, or to something as complicated as a diplomat for one of the planets under the Emperor. Of course, Anakin allowed them to do what they wanted, he had promised them so, and that diplomat guy, even though he wanted to run for a position, had only managed to land some low-level officer power. Again, their choices don't always benefit them, but they had the right. Freedom and liberty, freedom and liberty. Of course, my lord. It is this way. The synthetic scientists lead the way towards the chambers that Anakin wanted to go towards. My emperor, if you don't mind me asking, you may? At times like this, Anakin had to put up a semi-facade of being a little uptight to make sure people knew he meant business. Even around his living droids he did so because they were now living based off of a biological species that was social in nature. In fact droids had also been designed with social interaction in mind, and that could be seen through how they are supposed to act around others. What exactly are we to do after this project is complete? You haven't issued any extra orders, and there was nothing else for us to do the scientist said completely dependent on Anakin for orders. You will have to choose your own direction. You all may work for me, and are a part of the Emperor, but that doesn't mean you have to only do the things I want. Anakin replied calmly, which surprised the scientist. Really? But what could we dash I will stop you right there. Anakin came to a physical stop as well, to make sure his entire being spoke to what he is about to say. You are not my slave to do everything I want. You may follow me and praise my existence just like your Breatharian, but I draw the line when it comes to this. Anakin continued, there is a fine line between your worship of me and then complete acceptance of giving up your own will to follow everything according to my design. Anakin didn't want this exactly because of this reason. Without people trying to be ambitious themselves and growing complacent with him being on the top, fixing all of their problems and being the only source of innovation, it only means it would spell the doom of the Emperor. He didn't want to end up like the Republic or any other eternal empire from before, from history. My Emperor. The scientists both understood what he meant, but at the same time felt renewed in his vigor and faith. I will do as you say. I will have a will of my own and through this will. I will create a better society and better galaxy for you to live in. It is good to have goals, but maybe you should think about yourself first before thinking about others. Anakin patted the man on the back despite the size difference due to Anakin regulating his growth hormones, but is since having no such thing. Yes, long live the Emperor. The scientist replied as he followed after Anakin, presumably going towards the facility housing the special project they had been hard at work on. Yes, I would hope so. Anakin thought to himself as he was now the one leading the scientist towards another direction, that was the actual place he wanted to go towards. How the hell did I end up in this position Rex was being guided by an astromech droid, that went by the name of R2-D2. What is with this astromech? It sure has a personality. Rex thought to himself as he was going over some memories of what had happened to him and his men so far. After Anakin had decided to just take the clones back with him, he had decided that they would and could do what they wanted. Even if by some chance, those within the Republic came here to take a look at what was going on or were just happening to pass through the Emperor, they could do nothing if they discovered the clones here. Where are you taking me? Rex asked the astromech droid. R2-D2 responded with some beeps and whirls of mechanical and synthesized sounding noises, and just pushed Rex forward to continue on his way towards a certain direction. All right, all right I'm going. Rex sighed as he looked behind himself and saw that most of his other brothers were doing alright themselves. Anakin had set up many things for the clones to do, as they would get bored otherwise, 
where most of them just stayed inside most of the time. They were basically becoming her Kikimoris, what with being able to experience all of anything they would want through the virtual experience. Anakin knew that he had made many addictive games, but it would seem it was so addictive, that it stopped the clone troopers from doing anything else. Technically he had wanted for them to go out into the world and do their own things. But if they stayed then that meant they would be joining up with the military. While they are not as good as his sense, by virtue of Anakin Mac and sure his sense were overpowered, they were still good enough to earn a place within his military. It wasn't like they were incapable of anything like that, but instead they were all very good at combat, and Anakin had made sure they at least were able to keep their skills through the use of the virtual reality video games. They were so advanced and so addictive, that they couldn't help but not leave and stay within the place he had assigned for them. It was both extremely funny to Anakin and at the same time not all that concerning considering that while they had goals of freeing their other brothers, they didn't seem to be making much progress. Rex was probably the least addicted to the games, but even he played the games at least a few times. How silly, and here I thought we would be rescuing some more of my brothers Rex thought to himself, as he was being directed by R2-D2. One only had to look at the situation, as while the clones were motivated, they were also drawn into the Emperor's allure to the common folk that wish for a peaceful life. Not that they always had it peaceful with no upheaval, but instead they did encounter conflicts as well. No, it was because the Emperor and lifestyle allowed for people to be free, and to do nearly whatever they wanted. It was incredibly alluring, and the clones were living their best lives rent-free, meaning they didn't even have to do anything important or special to live the lives they have now. While not the most productive, it wasn't like Anakin needed them for anything. Well, there was something he needs them for, and that is the recruitment of more and more clones that are slowly being siphoned from the Republic. Why would Anakin let the Republic keep all of their clones to themselves? He had even gone so far as to tamper with the Kaminan's devices. He had installed himself into their systems and changed the way they manufacture their biological chips inserted into the brains of the clones. He didn't make them loyal to him or anything, but instead made it so that they wouldn't be influenced by anything trying to control them. Anakin had decided that he would use Mechadero on the system controlling the clones rather than use it on the clones themselves. He couldn't use Mechadero on the clones as well, because, again, they are not mechanical and are instead biological. Rex came across the glorious side of the Skywalker Palace. R2-D2 had lead him towards this place for a reason, and that reason is because Anakin wanted to see him. So this is where you were taking me. Huh? Rex turned around to see that R2-D2 was going somewhere else, not even bothering to lead him further inside. Hey, wait, where are you? Dash Rex was interrupted as a droid came up to him. Are you Sir Rex? The droid was not any random droid, but was instead C-3PO that was speaking to him. Huh? Ah, uh, yes, I am. Rex answered as he saw the droid, covered in gold-looking plating. Whether this be real gold or just paint, it was anyone's guess as C-3PO was redone and upgraded many times. Come this way, please. C-3PO gestured towards the palace and started to walk with Rex following in line behind the droid. The master would like to speak with you. So the Emperor is finally going to do something, Rex said with some hope as while he did say he was going to do something. It had been too long. At least too long for Rex for him to do anything. It felt like he wasn't planning to do anything at all. C-3PO didn't answer and just continued to walk through the hallways of the palace. Then coming to a stop it just just to go inside. Please, this way. Right Rex was kind of freaked out. He wasn't going to lie to himself here but he would continue with whatever the droid was doing. That was something he had noticed within this empire. The droids were weird, or at least they were weird until they got replaced by sense, and then there are other droids that didn't seem to serve a function at all, but did things for the system here. Rex also noticed that the droids and technology in general was a massive part of the culture here, even going so far as to say that Anakin, their emperor, was some sort of god, and was the creator and protector of all droid kind. Of course, there were revisions being done every day to account for the legend of Anakin, and of his exploits, either within the Emperor or on the outside as well. It was like the people worshipped him, and it wasn't Rex who was going to tell them otherwise. They were actually quite scary, the people that is, and even the children were better than him and most of his men, if not all of them. They were smarter, stronger and faster. It was kind of scary. There you are. A voice was heard coming from the back center of the room, right towards where the throne was. It was Anakin, and he was sitting on the throne with a look that said something was a fault. Ah uh, yeah, you called me here. Rex was still confused, but he had some expectation as to what was about to happen next. Well, you see well, you see Anakin began, but let off here to build suspense. Yes, Rex asked animatedly awaiting the words he wanted to hear. I have brought you here for something important, specifically it has to do with the clones within the Republic. Anakin decided that he has had enough of building suspense and just continues. Sir, if you don't mind me asking, but what exactly are you going to do then? Why have I been called here? Rex asked. You see, there is a lot of things going on at the moment, and I don't have the proper resources, no. I do have the resources necessary, but I am unwilling to expend these resources right now, because there are just too many things for me to care about here. Anakin started. So, I have come up with a plan that involves you, and all of your men from the Elite 501st Legion to come together and help me execute it. Anakin finished. Sir, does this plan involve anything dangerous? While Rex wasn't exactly the person to focus on safety, that didn't mean he didn't have some time to mellow down, after coming out of some very intense and highly stressful situations. Describe dangerous. Anakin wanted to know what Rex thought of as dangerous, because there were many factors to consider when taking into account what Rex was afraid of. Was he afraid of death to himself and, or those of his men's lives? Or was he afraid of Anakin exposing himself to Palpatine too early? 
Not that Anakin had to worry too much about Palpatine himself. He was old and kind of nearly crippled because of his flagrant uses of the Force, specifically the Dark Side. It was corrupting after all. Well, you did tell us all of what you had planned to do. I just didn't expect that Rex started only to leave off. That I would all of a sudden change my mind and decide to speed up my plans. Is that what you were going to say? Anakin finished for Rex, who seemed amazed at his ability to know what he was going to say. How dash Rex started only to be cut off by Anakin. Did I know what you were going to say? Anakin finished for him. Yeah, Rex was freaked out. But this was something normal as Anakin liked to do this to other people. It was quite fun to do and it was a good joke. Of course, it was only a joke to himself. While the other person didn't know he had just read their immediate thoughts to do something like that. While Anakin may be prone to doing those sorts of things. He could see that being so uptight about this was both good and bad. The Jedi were able to do it. And even other Force sensitives that don't even have training. Could at the very least read the emotions of another person. So Anakin had taken to making sure people got used to such experiences from himself and from others. As while it was intrusive, it is going to either be a part of the norm. Or he would spread techniques to everyone on how to better protect their minds. He couldn't account for every single person after all. And if they had pertinent information leading to people discovering his secrets. Then there is only so much he could do. Well, with more and more people with the Force coming to the Emperor. I think people should get used to this. I can't really help people protect their minds. Other than selling some high-end products. That would cost way too much for the common person. Anakin said this going off topic. Sir, I think you are getting a bit off topic. I was. Of course he was. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say this to someone. Anakin had been within the throne room all day at this point bored because he had nothing physically to do. His wives were all busy doing their own things. Because they also had their own lives. And those that were not his lovers also had their own lives as well. They didn't spend every waking moment alongside him. There was of course another reason other than to prank people. Or to do some sort of inside joke with himself when doing this little thing. He did it to other councillors and others that were members of the current parliament. He did this because he wanted to make sure everyone knew that if he wanted, he could look into their minds and find out any wrongdoing. Out of respect for his people however, Anakin obviously didn't do this. Because it is only meant to work as a scare tactic, to make sure these people remain loyal. They don't necessarily have to like him to get their jobs done, but they do have to both fear and respect him. That is necessary when it comes to ruling over people, to make sure you have some level of fear to you. Of course it is not for the general populace, because you would want them to only respect you, while those in leadership positions are those that you want to keep under control. The common person is usually content with their leader, as long as he or she isn't outwardly cruel or malicious, and all of these other things that would give him a bad reputation. They like pious and prestigious people in position of leadership, especially people that have a really good public record, and is a good person overall. Why do you think he heavily plays into the role of a savior while complaining internally that he isn't? It is not out of some weird self-humbling personality quirk, but because that was the truth of the matter. Being a leader is hard, especially when you have to lead those who lead as well. Anyway, the reason why I have brought you here is to discuss our plans. Specifically our plans that I have started to call the Great Clone Vanishing. Like the name. Anakin explained and then asked Rex. Ah, it is fine, I guess. Rex replied, unsure of how to answer. That is good then. So here is what we are going to do. Anakin started off going into what he wanted Rex to do, and how to do it. Why? Where and everything else relevant to what he wanted. Anakin has had enough of fostering the clones where they just did nothing. Not that the economy of the Emperor couldn't handle a few jobless people. No, it was because Anakin didn't want them to grow complacent in their positions, and that they should at least get out some more. He kind of felt like a father in this instance, trying to make sure his kids didn't end up as failures in life, and stayed inside all of the time. Not that there was anything wrong with doing that, it was just they should at least do something productive with their time if they were going to do that. Rex would become sort of a public figure for the clones. This may sound silly and signal to Palpatine that it was Anakin all along that was messing with him, but at this point, there was nothing he could do to stop him. Then there are of course the Jedi, but they wouldn't do anything to him as well because he is such a beloved figure from within their order and outside as well. He was at the very least known to the entirety of the galaxy at this point, and there would be no point in trying to hide it any longer. When it comes to Sidious however, he is still unsure of how to exactly start talking about him. Anakin hoped to draw in some clones voluntarily, but he knew that this wouldn't work, so Rex would only identify himself after all of the clones had their chips removed. Obviously Sidious might try to do something if he straight up revealed his plan. Or he might do nothing and instead get rid of any evidence of his involvement in the whole thing. After having Rex go public and having taken all of the clones' chips out, at that point, Sidious would either be on the run or would try something drastic. Anakin may have said he didn't mind the Jedi dying, because a balance had to be maintained. But that doesn't mean he wouldn't try to save them anyway. Not everyone actually deserved to die, not even those that were treading the line, as they hadn't done anything illegal or against his own moral line as well. There were a few however and the complacency of the Jedi to just take children away from their families didn't sit right with him. So he would make sure the Jedi die. But no in the same sense that the Force may be hoping for. Arnie, what is that? Padme asked Anakin as he was holding something within his hand. A syringe that held a liquid within. Midi-chlorians were intelligent microscopic life forms that serve as organelles within all living cells, existing in a symbiotic relationship with the beings they inhabited, and comprising a collective consciousness among themselves. 
Present in all life, midichlorians were isomorphic on every planet that supported life. Midichlorians, in fact, were necessary for life to exist. Anakin liked to think of them as things that acted as a connection, a device to communicate with the Force. Of course, because he thought this way, he also believed he could upgrade them and make them better, allowing for them to evolve and break away from the traditional sense of what they were. They had some form of connection to the soul as well, as it was midichlorians that formed a Force ghost, not just the person's soul itself. Oh, this. This isn't anything too special. Anakin had a smile on his face as he said this. Padme moved closer to have a better look, not afraid of what Anakin might do with the needle. Is this what I think it is? Padme said, trying to come up with an idea of what it might be, knowing that it wasn't the super serum Anakin had created as the liquid looked different from that. Probably not. Anakin still had this silly smile on his face as he said this. Then what is it then? Padme asked finally getting impatient but not so much so that she would lash out or anything. Just that she wanted to know and Anakin was teasing her with the lovable smile on his face. This is the thing that will grant you the ability to use the Force properly. Anakin had already used this thing on himself, and had already established a connection between this version of the midichlorian between himself and his own energy field. Meaning that however has this version of midichlorians, they would have a connection to his energy field he was starting to generate as well. It would enable people to be free from the tyranny of the Force, not that it was evil, just that it didn't always have your best interests in mind. Really, Padme eyes lit up as while she didn't really want the Force in particular, she did want to be connected with Anakin the same way everyone else was. She felt that it was unfair that the Force was so biased and believed it to be her duty to prove it otherwise. That she and he were meant to be together. That was. Yes, really. Anakin nodded before continuing. I do caution you however, that this process won't exactly be your feel good. He had gone through with it himself, and had gone through the process of maximizing what it could do. And he could say for certain, that it should allow most people the capabilities to use the Force. It would increase Force sensitivity by rebuilding the midichlorians already present within someone. But not increasing how many a person had. It would double the connection and power of those midichlorians. And it would enable enable someone with 5,000 midichlorians to be equal to someone with the potential of 10,000 midichlorians. Thankfully Padme had a decent amount of midichlorians, above the average, but that didn't mean it was enough to become a proper adept at the Force. For Anakin, this small boost doesn't even really matter, except for expanding upon his already powerful natural advantage. Another thing to think about was that now that he had done this, his children would inherit this specific type of midichlorian as well. It would become something where almost everyone would finally be able to use the Force, that it would become a situation where there are rare few that don't have enough to become anything. So obviously Anakin wanted to make sure that even the few left behind would be able to use the Force as well. He was already working of the next version of this midichlorian upgrade and trying to get it to be three times as powerful from the original instead of only two. Padme had a midichlorian count of 4700 which was actually really a lot compared to the average person. Oh if she has this injection she could officially become one with Anakin through a diet. I don't care. I want to do it no matter what. You have done it on yourself haven't you? Padme said with conviction. Woman intuition is scary. I didn't even tell her that Anakin thought to himself before replying. Of course. The magnitude of the midichlorian count served as a measure of one's potential in the Force, though there were other inheritable characteristics that could influence Force ability as well. This would become another one of those inheritable characteristics that would influence the galaxy at large. It wouldn't only be within the Emperor, as sooner or later people would be going along accordingly with their life goals, which is usually to reproduce. But one should be able to get Anakin's point. Then, do it. Padme said resolutely. Okay then. Anakin would guide Padme back to his room, as there was no need for this to be done in a medical facility. He would be able to stop anything bad from happening, and really wanted to be here for her. Ready? Yes. Padme nodded as he then proceeded to inject her with this new serum. Anakin could feel the changes by using the Force, and was able to feel a connection being formed between himself and Padme. But it wasn't a diet. Not just yet. It was instead a confirmation to Anakin that he had successfully become the actual living Force, as it also connected to his own energy field of the Force. Then it was what happened next that didn't surprise Anakin, but instead only made him happy. A diet had fully been established between Padme and himself, but he didn't have long to celebrate as he would also have to suffer through Padme's pain as well. It was well worth it however, at least to him as was. What Anakin wanted to do with the clones were to have them come back with him to the Emperor, further destabilizing the Republic. At this point there was no turning back, and Anakin needed or more like wanted to make sure that Palpatine wasn't going to have an easy time. It would take some time, and would take some careful planning as well, but they should be able to siphon their manpower away. Sidious would no doubt be upset, but it would be something Anakin would do within the shadows, to make sure he doesn't expose himself too early. He has many plans, and he knows for sure some massive splintering will happen within the Republic as a result of his shenanigans. Anakin knew all too well the after effects of an empire or republic, or any government type burning and collapsing. He had played a lot of CK2 after all. Besides that, there was a point to be made, and Anakin wanted to make sure the people throughout the galaxy knew of this point. He may not be the best person in the world, the galaxy, whatever or wherever else he may be at any point of time. But he knows he isn't the absolute worst either. Which is a good thing. Who said flaws are actually flaws when they could very well be what makes something perfect or beautiful. Without the existence of flaws, 
There would be no concept of perfection, without light there would be no dark. It is as simple as that. Emperor, here are the reports. Someone handed him some papers, documents that shouldn't be uploaded to the cloud of the Emperor's virtual network. There are just some things that would be best left to his eyes, and his eyes alone. Of course, if there was something that was uploaded that was somehow dangerous or in some way compromised the security of the Emperor and obviously it would be deleted. Good. You may leave. The agent left back to do his work as Anakin looked over these documents. Documents that were for the project he was working on, specifically the project of taking away the clones from the Republic. Thinking about many of the aspects within the current Emperor and many of the aspects of various other organizations and galactic powerhouses, Anakin needs to be careful about what he does. He worries about the health of his citizens, the well-being of people even outside of the Emperor and once he starts to rock the boat even more than he already has. How many people would die because he wanted to make sure no one would die? You heard that right. In an effort to save people, one could inadvertently also be the cause of their deaths as well. There is consequences to one's actions, and with his great power, there are also responsibilities that he would have to assume as a result. Dathoma was already beginning its first phases of becoming a part of the Emperor and where some people have decided to move themselves to there. It was a quick and easy process because Anakin had set up a Stargate connecting Dathoma to the various Stargates on every system that was a part of the Emperor and Talzin, well, what would he do with Talzin? She didn't seem to be doing anything other than governing her people well. In fact, it was great for Anakin, as he had one less thing to worry about. There are many, many things that Anakin was interested in, but having to also look after the Night Sisters and Night Brothers of Dathoma would surely be a hassle. He may have made an impact there, but that didn't mean anything in the long, long run. Their society would most likely follow that same idea of a female being on top of their society. No, he had checked and used whatever connections he had to see right into the future. They would continue this trend even after having more respect for the males of their species, and even males of other species as well. If was not something he could just wish away. He did however have someone here, that while he knows won't become a lover of his in the future, she could be used in another aspect. It may seem strange, but Anakin was going to have Marin, now that she was betrothed to him, and make her become the new leader of the people on Dathoma. Why not? There are many factors as to why, as this would make it easier on his conscience for having the poor girl around him. He didn't want her, even if she would grow to become interested, simply because he knew that she wouldn't form a dyad with him. Age mattered as well. But with time age passes, as just with Ahsoka, he would probably crumble to the fate of also making her his. Not Marin, however, even with him knowing it was a slim possibility or chance of happening. Another thing to think about was what Anakin would do to balance him trying to take away the clones from the Republic, and the only thing he could think about on this topic, is he would have to do two things. The first thing was to initiate a trade deal between the Emperor and the Republic, so he would start sending them droids, which would in turn allow him to get an in on Palpatine. It was basically doing a you know reverse card, by instead having the clones turn on the Jedi, he would instead have the droids turn on Sidious. Doing so would be a great way to see him crumble. But obviously Sidious would foresee something like this. Not because he would actually see it coming, but because he was a very conniving and scheming individual. There was no way he would let the Emperor made droids get close enough to him like that even if he got a personal one from one of the Emperors or more specifically from Skywalker Industries designs, he would still be against it. He is way too well aware of his position and how tedious it is to fend off against assassination attempts even ones forged by himself to go against himself. That is right, Sidious is crazy enough to have trained professionals even go after his own life. He is obviously playing the long game and it was paying off. Anyway, Anakin needed to do something against the Confederacy of Independent Systems. If he didn't then it wouldn't be even with Anakin wanting to supply them with droids whilst taking the Republic for everything it's got fair. It would not align itself with the idea of balance. Something that he was constantly trying to maintain himself, not that it isn't his normal state of being. No, the way he worked was that he would spiritually and physically be resist to neutral, or a balanced state, and would sway from side to side a lot of the time. It was a biological and spiritual thing that he had done to himself. That is the consequence of messing with his mind, body and soul, kind of making sure that he is kind of done for. Not that he is, it is just that it is something extremely annoying to deal with, because he needed to keep these two sides of himself balanced. Anakin had no idea what he could do to even the playing field, if only as a temporary solution before B is able to take away all of the clones, and simultaneously after that supply the Republic with droids of his own. Maybe something would show up soon to tell me what I should do. For now, patience would be key to what happens next as Sidious is able to play the long game. Then I too should play it as well. Anakin thought to himself as he went back to looking over some things. He really wouldn't be here if anyone else was available. He would much rather spend some time with loved ones, than just sitting around all day on this throne. Thankfully he doesn't have to always spend his time here, and could go and do something else with anyone else that wanted to do something. Rex didn't know what to say or feel as of this moment, except he was feeling well. He was feeling really, really good as the clones, his brothers that were in arms, now living peacefully were brought to the Emperor and safely. He was given a rather important task and so was the rest of the 501st Legion. That couldn't really at this point be considered warriors anymore, as they had gotten used to sedentary life. Rex means, how could they not? This place was amazing. No matter how critical he wanted to be or somehow compare it to the Republic, there was just too much going for it, making him see the Jedi and the Republic, not exactly in a negative light, 
but perhaps in a manner that suggested there was more than what meets the eye. Anakin had been trying to guide him down a path that suited his skills, which surprisingly enough had him being a leader. Okay, maybe that isn't all that surprising because he is a leader, and has already shown his talents to others, that made him be promoted to his current position. Wait do I even have the position of commander anymore? It was questionable if Rex did still hold that position as officially he really doesn't. His supposed death coming in to mess things up. Not that it really got in the way of anything he did or got in the way of any of the other clones as well. While Rex was thinking of many other things, the clones that were being introduced to their new situation was being addressed throughout the facility. Anakin had put in the work and had been secretly brining over clones, as much of them as he could to ensure the maximum amount of life is saved, while at the same time making sure the clones also get rid of their chips within their heads. They were brought to the 501st Legion in particular, so that they could explain to them what was going on. A familiar face, one that is in fact their own staring back at them, would do well in this situation, and that was why Anakin wanted Rex to be the main face for what he wanted to do. There was no way they would trust the words of a stranger, meaning himself so readily, and would instead be much more at home and feel safer, once knowing that there are others like them, that believe in and trust in him. The only reason he was able to pull his heist off with the 501st was because he knew of their positioning in the battle, that he had gotten them from. Taking that into account along with his ability to see a bit into the future basically enabled him no flaws in his planning here. He could have also always just brainwashed them all, and it wouldn't have been for negative purposes, and instead just make them more malleable to his words. Anakin believed this was a dark path however, and should be treaded lightly, and instead he believed in his own ability to convince or charm others into believing him. It worked on a lot of other people. How could it also not work here as well? Excuse me sir, but, um, a voice was heard as Rex turned around to face someone he had met recently, and got along quite well with this clone trooper from another squadron. Don't mind me, we are all brother here, and in fact we were all brothers out there as well. Rex says the last pass was some reminisce, because Anakin wasn't able to save everyone after all. There was only so much he could do to prevent death. But that was just it. He wasn't a god. At least not yet he wasn't. Right? The other clone rubs the back of his head nervously. By the way sir, I think you can just call me Fives. The now identified person known as Fives said. Fives. Five is a number isn't it? Rex questioned. No, not five. Fives. Fives said. Oh, how stupid of me. My apologizes. So your name is Fives, eh? Rex should have seen that coming. What with the rather unique and strange bunch of people he was surrounded with. He was practically surrounded by himself, his face, his eyes, his nose. Sometimes Rex wondered what it would have been like to look different what how he did now. Not that he wanted to, but it would have been something to compare himself and the clones to. Yeah. Fives was no longer nervously rubbing the back of his head and instead wanting to ask another question. By the way, you want to know more about what is going on here, don't you? Rex had heard of people requesting him to speak more to them multiple times already. He was used to it now, because he would always give a big announcement, so that the others had an idea of what was going on or happening. What Rex was truly surprised about was how no one wanted to actually leave, as he assumed there would be at least one person willing to go once the option was given. What Rex didn't know was this was the trap. Psychologically, Anakin gave people the option to leave, so that they would hesitate to go immediately. In fact it even worked better for the droids, because they had no command or someone to go towards for instructions. They were made that way after all, and if he gave them the two options, they would be hesitant in taking the one that seemed like the most dangerous. Especially when they were told it could end in the end of their lives. While they may be clones, supposedly afraid of death, Anakin knew otherwise, and that every creature, all of them living, had a subconscious desire to still breath. Clones were being brought in, first within the tens, then that started to escalate into the hundreds and sooner or later, Anakin would start to try and up this scale to the thousands. By that point he should have made enough progress in crippling Sidious from being able to make able moves at all, in regards to the clones. Yeah. I kind of do want to know, Five said, you and everyone else here, but don't worry as I will be explaining everything shortly, Rex replied, what does that mean, so you do know what is going on, yes and no, just wait for the explanation for everyone else to be ready, okay, you are a bit impatient aren't you, Rex said in jest, and Fives just laughed along with him, it was like they were good old friends already, clones had that sort of connection, it was something strange, but it made sense to Anakin why it was like this, they are clones after all and come from the same person, basically making them all brothers and all near genetically the same as well, come on, I'll take you to get some grub, Rex said, leading the way. I could make some use of some food right now. Fives replied as he followed after Rex. Palpatine was befuddled. There was nothing that he could say or do to help himself in this situation. The clones were disappearing, vanishing as if they had never existed in the first place and Sidious had been using all of his power, not through the Force, but his intrigue, political and financial power, to investigate this weird occurrence. Order 66 won't work if there are no clones to carry out my orders. Sidious thought to himself from his office, the office of the Supreme Chancellor of the Democratic Republic, for the past few weeks now, their forces were decreasing. The military and clone trooper forces of the Republic was decreasing. That is, with clones becoming non-existent, Sidious had to find another way to keep this war going, and find another way to kill off the Jedi. It was impossible now for him to fully complete his plans, and he would have acted rashly, using whatever clones were left to start killing the Jedi off already. But, but that would lead to me being discovered, and there is no guarantee for me, 
at least not yet from within the Republic. Sidious thought to himself as he pondered his situation going over his many, many backup plans, in case some failed. Why hadn't he had a way to deal with the clones being a failure? That was because he was used to eliminating any and all threats to his plans, making sure that he was on a path to victory. When Sidious was being challenged, generally he didn't even have to do anything when it came down to it as the people would hand over their power completely to him. It had happened before and it would happen again. He really was a conniving person, but most of the time it seemed like his problems just resolved themselves. He had made backup plans for many things, usually in the off chance he is discovered, but then again, he also didn't really have a way around having to do things off the cuff. He would constantly put himself on the edge of being discovered for two reasons. The first being that it was easier for him to go off situations that happen, and are within a controlled environment of his making. Second because it was fun. The Sith reveled in challenge and usually mired themselves in what seemed like pointless displays of strength or dominance, when in reality they are just doing those things because they wish to reach perfection. It came naturally to Sidious, just as it had come naturally to others as well. Why wouldn't he try and extract some level of joy out of what he was doing to everyone and everything around himself? This was who he was, is, and what he shall continue to be because he saw no need in trying to change his mindset. It is wrong to think that he is unbeatable, but that doesn't mean he couldn't gloat in the faces of the Jedi so openly, and they wouldn't even know why. They wouldn't even know what he was in even then. What were they going to do about it? If he is exposed, then all he needed to do is use the Republic's laws against them, because being a Sith could also be considered being a part of a religion. How dare the Jedi hate on another group of people for their beliefs? Some would say and even agree with Sidious, not knowing that he was quite the cruel and sadistic person. Even more so once he started down the dark path of becoming a Sith. Think about it. If the Jedi are allowed to exist and they do some horrible things, things that others within the Republic would say is bad, then why couldn't the Sith exist within the Republic as well? It wasn't like Sidious had done anything illegal that anyone knew of. There was just no way for the Jedi to come after him, not legally anyway, and they would be seen as in the wrong. It would be seen as such because that is just the way the Republic works. And because of that he has taken advantage of these old and kind of broken down systems to his advantage. Supreme Chancellor, you have a visitor. An attendant said as Sidious wasn't exactly alone within his office all of the time. Most of the time he had his red guards be there with him to better protect his life. Thank you. You may leave now. Sidious knew exactly who was coming to meet him. Yes, Chancellor. The attendant bowed before leaving the office, and then some more people came in. Most notably, they were politicians. He did this often bringing in those of power, wealth or of some influence to make sure his rule is ironclad. There was no other way around it, as while people are easy to be manipulated, at least from his perspective due to them being cowards or sheep, it was also required that he constantly reinforce his power over someone. In an alternate timeline, this would be done by constantly asserting himself over Darth Vader and making sure he knew who was boss. Sidious would have created a suit designed to be physically torturing, and then there was the mental and emotional torture he would do. It was all within his design. After meeting with these officials he would have to do many other things throughout the day, and would now have to start looking for something to continue this war. The longer it goes on the better for himself, and now he would have to start planning for a way to overcome the losses of the clones. He had a feeling that it wouldn't be stopping anytime soon. Chancellor, you have received a most important message from the Emperor. A feminine droid said in its synthesized voice. Oh, who is it from? Sidious was good at making his questions sound like orders, instead of questions that it had become quite natural to him at this point. He was also surprised that something within the Emperor, no, someone was willing to go out of their way to contact him. Usually he would have spies go in, but they would never come out, meaning that it was well guarded and protected at this point. He would have no way of going into the Emperor, not unless he turned the armies of the Republic against them of course. A hologram shows up, and it shows Anakin, the current Emperor and Palpatine, couldn't help but be surprised at seeing the leader of the Emperor has made themselves come to him. They would need his help, it would seem like they aren't as powerful after all. Or at least this was what Palpatine assumed, when in fact it was Anakin going to offer his help instead. It was a recorded message, so there wouldn't be any back and forth. Greetings Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. We have met on occasion before, so I would like to be blunt within this message. I have noticed for a while now that the Republic is starting to lose their forces. Anakin started. He continued. To be more specific I believe that the clones are vanishing for some odd reason, and that there is no way for the Republic to survive the onslaught of the Confederacy. So I would like to make a proposal, a deal of sorts between the Emperor and the Republic, where I offer up our service of being able to make droids, and send them to you for aid. Of course, I can't be doing this without being paid in some shape or form. We can have proper negotiations later about that, and for now I just wanted to send this message to make sure the Republic knows that I, know the Emperor is willing to trade. The recorded message finished as Anakin did some formal gestures of respect, because Anakin was faking it. Not that Sidious knew. However, what he did discover is that he may have found a way to continue and prolong the war. This is suspicious timing Sidious was thinking to himself, because it was suspicious that this message would coincide with the disappearance of many clones. The Emperor's Emperor had even talked about that subject himself bringing it up. Anakin did this on purpose, because he didn't want to seem too suspicious, and it would look better for him if Palpatine held some suspicions, but was unable to confirm whether it not was him. If he didn't mention this in the message he would only come off as more suspicious, than he already has. One must keep their opponent on their toes and make sure they are guarded against you. So once they do let their guard down, 
That was when you strike. There was more than meets the eye when taking into account everything going on. Interesting. Sidious spoke out loud as he started to pace back and forth, where he had a view of his soon-to-be empire's capital. Sidious had many ideas on why this was happening, and it was definitely suspicious that the Emperor would contact him now. But they had mentioned the issue himself, an issue even the Jedi were noticing as well, meaning that they could be involved. But instead of being the mastermind, the Emperor may just be the pawn. Palpatine was too used to politics and intrigue, that he wouldn't be able to see Anakin as the mastermind behind the events taking place. Sometimes one has to fight fire with fire. And while some may believe this is stupid, for Anakin it works. Especially against an opponent like Sidious. Within a high-rise building, specifically within the Jedi's tower that looks over everyone, the Jedi Masters of the Jedi Council had gathered around to discuss more about recent events and situations. The Jedi may not be as up-to-date with their teachings, and may be even considered backwards in the evolutionary pathway of the Force, but that didn't mean they were completely incompetent. They had people within the Order that were powerful, wise and all sorts of other things that would and could be taken into account. There was just no way that they would only know who to listen to the Republic as they were in particular considered a political non-entity within the Republic. Of course the Jedi should know better that they were not actually separated at this point, and instead had basically merged into the Republic's military force. Remember, a Jedi fights only as a last resort. If you are forced to draw your lightsaber, you have already forfeited much of your advantage. A Jedi trusts the Force and at first seeks other ways to resolve problems. Patience, logic, tolerance, attentive listening, negotiation, persuasion, calming techniques. But there are times when a Jedi must fight. Some would say that these words were wise. They were and it is always better to make sure violence is the last resort. Sometimes violence may be the only thing one can use, not exactly to be aggressive, but to be defensive. Without protecting oneself it would seem silly, right? The Jedi however put a lot of faith and trust in the Force, thinking that it would solve any and all of their problems, because they are faithful servants of it. Unfortunately for them, that is not really how it works. Originally formed as a philosophical study group situated on the planet Titan, the Jedi became revered as guardians of peace and justice in the galaxy. As mystical wielders of the Force and of their signature lightsabers, their powers inspired all citizens in the galaxy. The calm, considered demeanor of the Jedi, made them ideal brokers of peace in times of conflict or dispute. Yet, for all the power and diversity, the Jedi were few. Often beset by foes in times of doubt and confusion, undercurrents of evil often challenged their order and the establishment they served, the most notable being the Sith. These dark warriors were the antithesis of the Jedi, their sworn enemies, and the battle between them brought the galaxy to war more than once. In times of crisis, the Sith could even use the dark side of the Force to diminish the powers of the Jedi and prevent them from sensing the future. Just like the Sith had been doing now, not exactly because Sidious in particular wanted to cloud himself. He did, but it was as a result of the Force Nexus underneath the temple that it had lead to this result. Thankfully for them Anakin had been so kind as to siphon the energy out of the Nexus, making them able to see the future again. Meaning that it should be immensely more easier for them to find out who the Sith was. Maybe clones vanishing. They are, Yoda said as the room all knew of what was happening. Yes, from various reports there have been no known sightings of the clones. And because of this, we have had to cut back on the war efforts. Mace supplied. Jedi Master Yaddle interjected. Do we know where they are going? Have they died? Or have they just abandoned their posts? No, not we do. Yoda answered Yaddle's question, and undoubtedly all of the rest's question as well. Then what are we trying to do about it? Kai Adi Mundi asked, kind of upset at having the clones keep disappearing, especially for him, as when he is assigned a team or legion, they would disappear faster than he could say, may the force be with you. We are aware of your predicament Master Mundi, but please be calm. We are all trying our best Dash Mace was cut off by Deba. Doing your best. Is everyone doing their best here? This war is something that we as the Jedi should have never joined in the first place. Everyone within the room was starting to argue, and it was getting pretty heated as people from different sides and perspectives clashed with each other. Yoda would only shake his head knowing that his interference wouldn't help things much. But that doesn't mean Mace wanted to continue listening to everyone bicker. Quiet. Please. Be quiet. It was Obi-Wan Kenobi. Someone that had been promoted to Master Jedi and had even been offered a seat on the Council. It was well deserved as he had done much throughout his time as a Jedi. Saving many people and doing a lot of good deeds. Of course there are other aspects to take into account. But they wouldn't be talked about here. Thank you Master Kenobi. Mace said as he was about to say something himself. Now that I have everyone's attention, I would like to go over some other things. They would talk about this and that, the losses of their Jedi and even the people leaving their order. Something that they couldn't exactly stop even with their persuasion and talk of the Force people were heading towards the Emperor. It is there that most of those within the room want to investigate themselves just what is happening there. They had exactly a few people in mind that would investigate. Now that they had the time, the people going to the Emperor were going to be Mace Windu, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon Jinn, Yoda, Yaddle, Quinlan Vos, and Lu Minara and Julie. These people chosen in particular because of their connection to Anakin or the other girls he had taken with him. It had come. Come time for Anakin to start moving along his plans once again. Having sent the message towards Palpatine, Anakin knew that it would just be a matter of time before the Chancellor deemed that his deal was alright, not that there was any deal that had even taken place. It was just that Anakin knew Sidious had no other options currently available to himself, and that by taking advantage of this opening, it is one step closer to his fall. Of course, it is also one step closer to the balance being restored as well. The Force would be happy, if it could with everything he was doing. Or at least it should be, but how is he supposed to know what it feels? It can't feel at all. 
because it is just an energy field with some sentience, but no proper emotions. Instead, it is something that could be considered living, and only able to stay as it is because it wasn't connected to people. Once the cosmic and living force became intertwined, that was when stuff started to become unbalanced. But it also allowed people to evolve, for the force to evolve and grow its presence within the galaxy, possibly the entirety of the universe. It definitely had done so with the Yu and Vong, as they had come from outside of the known galaxy, and had very minimal access to the force. Historically they were able to use the force as well, and there are other races, species present outside of the current known galaxy. How could Anakin let this chance pass up? When it came to making sure he is taking down Sidious, he may be a selfish bastard, but whoever said he didn't care? There was very little that he didn't care about. It was just that he sometimes cared more for the things he treasured or loved. His empire, his people, but most importantly his family and friends. Loved ones that have become a part of his life, and possibly even more so when considering the bonds he has with some of them. There was no greater desire for him, other than to make sure they were safe. Okay? That was a lie. But Anakin still did want that. It was just that he had other desires as well which was something he always knew would catch up to him, no matter how long he had put it off. Thankfully he doesn't need to worry much about that as those around him can make up for that desire, hopefully. Anyway, back on topic with the entirety of the galaxy's life on the line. Well, it didn't quite reach that point, because Sidious had no way to destroy entire worlds if he wanted, as with no Death Star, he would have no way to create an even more powerful scare tactic. A military is scary enough, but imagine if he did have a Death Star, or even still had the possibility to access the Dark Reaper. It had been destroyed, thankfully, but that didn't mean there was no possibility of Sidious not trying to bring it back to life. Anakin had a general rule that he stood by when it came to many things in life, and that is, if I can do something, it probably means someone else can do it as well. This stemmed from the fact that nothing was all and truly unique or special. Not even his status as the Chosen One, because what is stopping the Force from making another one of him? There was nothing. Nothing from stopping the Force from trying to make another one of himself, maybe not exactly the same, maybe less powerful, or more powerful. There was nothing stopping the Force from doing so, and the things he was doing could benefit it, if he didn't have a way to counteract this. Which is why he was going to make great use of his own energy field born from his own power and self, where it would manifest as something to rival the natural force. He intends to get his special brand of midi-chlorians to all of his people, so he could rapidly expand his own influence, while at the same time making sure they are safe at the same time. While the Force could be trusted, it also shouldn't be trusted 100% of the time. It was something he had decided right from the very start, that he would use the Force, the natural force as much as he could, before it decided to force him to do anything. Thing. Or maybe even just guide him in a certain direction. He didn't like the idea of some all-knowing being dictating his fate, and while that may have been the real truth to anything that happened, it was here, in his unique state of being that he was breaking that mold, and casting himself anew in the forges of his mind. His body is not what it was supposed to be, signifying his physical independence from the Force, his mind or soul, is also at a state that is in balance, connected to the Force whilst simultaneously creating its own dimension. Somewhere he is the only one in control, as its god or whatever divine-like entity he may be. Now to wait for Sidious' reply, Anakin thought to himself as he went off in another direction to have some alone time with one of his wives. He isn't a workaholic, and would much rather prefer being with any of them, perhaps all of them if he could. It is quite good to see you again, Emperor. Palpatine said these words, but internally he didn't quite like the sound of addressing another as Emperor. He wanted those words to only come out of the mouths of others, not his own. Yes, greetings Chancellor Palpatine. Greetings to the entirety of the Senate. Anakin was on stage, not within the Senate itself, but was displayed by a holographic display device. He would be addressing the entirety of the Senate with his proposal, and a vote would happen among them all, to decide whether or not being supplied by him was the right choice for them. While they spend massive amounts of wealth for the clones, where the Kaminans gobble up the profits, the Emperor's droids would also be another economic factor to put into the mix. Not everyone was agreeable with what was going to happen, and Palpatine had decided that if a vote is held, and the people decide that they would like the Emperor's assistance he would accept. Of course, he had executive power over everything, but he couldn't decide when it came to this topic. It was something that he both wanted and didn't at the same time because of the nature of politics. He decided that this is the best option. It would absolve him of any guilt, if something were to go wrong. Because he had put it up to a vote, plus he has the advantage of not saying what he voted for. He is a completely non-factored in to vote on the manor, since he had handed over this decision to those within the Senate. Yes, as everyone can see here, the Emperor's Emperor is joined by one of his wives, Empress Padme Amidala, former Senator of Naboo. Palpatine had to do some theatrics and play into whatever Anakin was planning. Not that he considered Anakin to be his opponent. What could the boy, only very recently having ascended to the throne do against him, a veteran? Also he took into consideration that Anakin wasn't even the mastermind, and it was likely someone within the shadows. An example being Vader but he had disappeared off of the face of the galaxy. There was no telling where this mysterious individual went, and he wasn't able to gather any information from the Emperor as well. So, his guess was as good as the next person, and it frustrated him to no end. Anakin was joined by Padme in the holographic image that showed the two of them off. This sent ripples through the Senate as they knew about the Senator and her outspoken manner on everything, especially when it came to the production of the clones. She didn't want them to become a thing, and she was supposedly against violence and war, something that she would be reluctantly be going against as she is here to support Anakin. She knew that he was intending to sell battle droids to the Republic, public, and while she disagreed with him, she decided that it would be better if even she was here. Then there was something about these droids she could accept. Anakin wouldn't only be giving the Republic battle droids, as that would be a waste. 
No, he also intended to sell them medical droids as well. Because this would also give him more power or control within the Republic, they would see him as someone that loved peace but was also against the idea of sitting around and doing nothing. Increasing his influence was the goal in this session, and by doing so he may persuade people into the deal. That would help cripple them even further. It is like that good old saying, if there is no problem to solve, then just create some problems, and then sell the answers. Anakin also used this tactic, which applied to the current situation. With the clones having been gone for a while now, and more and more of them disappearing, he has created a problem. Then through offering his services at the right time, he has also given them the answer. Now, if I may ask, what is it that the Emperor and his Empress had wanted to say to us? Palpatine questioned, given he was the one with the highest authority within the building. Yes, I am here today as the Emperor of the Emperor, and as you can all see, I am joined by my wife, and we are here to discuss some things in relation to the war between the Republic and Confederacy, Anakin stated. While Anakin does have a non-aggression pact with the Confederacy of Independent Systems, that doesn't mean that he has stopped from trading with the enemy. It would be another thing if he decided to become a full-blown ally of the Republic, which would only make things complicated. Specifically, if he did do that, he would become a target. The entirety of the Emperor would become a target, and he couldn't allow that even with his protection set in place. He is building up an army to deal with the huts and the future Yusin Vong. That come to the galaxy, he isn't all that interested in fighting the Republic or the Confederacy. Well, maybe the Confederacy, but not right now as they were not in his way. Dooku had even been so kind as to give up Geonosis when he had occupied it, and instead of coming to him for some form of payment, he didn't. That may have been a bad move on Dooku's part, as Anakin at that time would have gladly supplied him something in return, if he didn't press the issue. Which he didn't, but he didn't without even pressuring him, which is either Dooku's fault or the fault of the Chancellor Palpatine. And what is it you wish to propose? Someone within the audience asked coming forward on the floating platform. I have already spoken with the Chancellor and have provided what you would need to know, Anakin stated, saying this to make sure that everyone knew that Palpatine had some level of understanding, but he really had the bare minimum. The Chancellor may know what you speak of, but we, everyone within this room other than yourself and the Chancellor, do not. Another person spoke, also coming forward, people that were more interested in certain things, like the military or economics. In fact, everyone here would be interested in looking into whatever Anakin had to say as he, or the things he had helped to build, the Emperor and Skywalker Industries all touched upon various aspects. The Galactic Senate also referred to as the Republic Senate, Galactic Congress, Republic Congress, or Old Senate during the time of the New Republic, was the legislative and executive branch of the Galactic Republic that was located on Coruscant. Its primary duties were to mediate any disputes between star systems, worlds and cultures, to regulate trade between systems, to protect and care for citizens in need, and to provide mutual defense in face of threats to the Republic. Then I will explain. Anakin stated before he went off to include information, more information than he had previously given the Chancellor, but that didn't matter. He told them of the droids he was willing to supply, and that he had a price. This price wouldn't be too high of course, and he wouldn't be able to melt the Galactic Republic of their money the same way the Kaminans are, and instead he needed to set a proper price. That price being that Anakin would take Naboo into his control. The crowd was bursting, because this bold move was something totally expected to them, even much more unexpected to Palpatine. Anakin spoke about combat droids and medical droids and their benefits. He also didn't leave out the downsides of having them. But no one cared about that as Anakin had just asked for something that was totally expected. Something that while most people don't really care all too much about, but he was basically bargaining with them a star system that was a part of the Republic. They had little to no sway over this type of decision. What makes you think that this August body would accept? It is not you I will have to worry about. But instead I have already contacted Nabu and those within the Nabu system. They have agreed, the Queen and all to becoming a part of the Emperor. Anakin wanted to do this for a few reasons. The first would be Padme of course, as it was her birth planet, her second home as she had grown up there. Why would he not try and bring her people under his control? and further his own plans as well. The second reason is to distract Palpatine, especially since Palpatine had also come from Naboo as well. This would make him believe that the mastermind behind Anakin was some sort of intelligence fiend being able to ferret out information about him. This would make him panic and more likely to take actions that were risky even with his calm facade, he is still a person after all. The third reason is that he would be able to start expanding all the way out where Naboo is, which isn't exactly all too far away from the Emperor, and it would be easy enough to back it up and protect it. Anakin isn't that far away from moving himself and the Emperor over towards the Naboo system, and the surrounding systems anyway. Most intriguing. Sidious thought to himself as the rest of the Senate was conflicted on what to do. Having arrived at the Emperor, everyone was kind of taken by the side of Tatrine. Every planet they had passed by was just another facet of the Emperor's power, prestige and overall capabilities. Those that were chosen to go on this small ambassador's mission was a lot of Jedi Masters. Thankfully for the Jedi. They were able to go because most Republic forces were on the back step, as they had to deal with the lose of the clones. Meaning that they had some time to think about some things, and it would allow them, those that wanted to see the Emperor, specifically, Yoda, Yaddle, Quinlan Vos, Luminara Unjuli, Qui-Gon Jinn, Mace Windu and Obi-Wan Kenobi. There had been a last minute change that even Jedi Master Plo Koon would be coming along, to see Ahsoka. Everyone here had the reasons, whether they be inherently selfish or otherwise. This is certainly interesting. Obi-Wan said as he observed the planet they had landed on. The capital of the Emperor, somewhere that wasn't restricted to people. 
and one would believe that there were spies planted here by Palpatine. That would be the case if Anakin had no way to quickly identify them, not by himself but through Ciri, and her access to all of the unliving droids. Anakin had received a message, just as he had sent his own. A message saying that the Jedi wished to come to Tatooine and come speak with him, or anyone really. That was a part of the new order here. He agreed, given that he had nothing to hide, and at this point there was nothing they could really do here. Anakin knew that showing them the more darker elements they studied here, would either rile them up, or would make them decrease favorability with him. It was a risk he was willing to take and didn't mind whatever blow to his reputation he might face, if they were to go back and report their findings. It isn't like he is trying to hide it at this point, and doesn't mind a little introspection given from a group outside of the one he is in. Why do you think that Obi-Wan? Qui-Gon asked his former student as everyone was starting to disembark from their ship, that they had all traveled in. This place Obi-Wan left off, having a strange look on his face. It is like there is a balance within the Force here. Luminara finishes where Obi-Wan left off. Light and dark, in balance they are. Yoda waddled himself forward as he also was in tune with their surroundings. While it may not be the light side they were hoping to sense, it was something else entirely, and it was something that was actually pleasant. It wasn't overbearing on one side or the other, and most of the latent energies here only spoke of harmony. Something that was impossible for a planet like Coruscant. It had long since been mired in a fight between both sides, that the force on Coruscant was like a blender. For most of his time on Coruscant, Anakin knew of the hidden dark side energies polluting the Jedi, and had even gotten rid of it now. Meaning that Coruscant should have a chance to recover from the dark side, but also from the light, also tried to violently lash out against the dark side nexus there. What do you mean, Master? Obi-Wan asked Yoda who went quiet and didn't answer, but instead just continued to walk forward. Obi-Wan, I think that you haven't really encountered a lot of things in life, Qui-Gon said. Yes, there is much you have seen and experienced, but that doesn't mean there isn't something more. What? Obi-Wan seemed confused at what Qui-Gon was trying to convey to him. When the time is right, I guess Qui-Gon sighed a little, knowing that it wasn't quite time for Obi-Wan to understand, or to even know about what Qui-Gon was talking about. While it made sense to Qui-Gon, that doesn't mean it made sense to Obi-Wan. They would continue to explore the streets of Tatooine's mainstay city, and would be both amused and amazed at the people. The droids patrolling the streets may have been weird to them, and then there was all of the species. While mostly populated by humans, or human-like species, like anywhere else in the galaxy, but these people were more, much more than what meets the eye as the group discovered that they were ahead above the average citizen. What they meant by that was that they were faster, stronger and had far more endurance than any of what their species should have. Then there was also the occurrence of a child falling over and getting themselves scratched only for the same scratch to heal automatically. In mere seconds at that, it was a sight worth seeing, as usually it would require some powers or abilities within the force to accomplish something like that. Obviously, the people here were different here in more ways than one. Where are we heading to exactly? Quinlan Vos asked as they continued, seemingly lost. We are supposed to be going towards what is called called Skywalker Palace I believe. That is before we are going to convene at the Order's Temple here. Qui-Gon answered. Lost we are. Seem, it would. Yoda said all of a sudden as the group finally came to a stop looking around for anything that would indicate the place they would need to go. While the palace and the new Order's Temple was located here and was large enough to see, there were other buildings within this dome. It wasn't like the dome that contained Sky City would stay as this one place but it would continue to become larger and larger. It wouldn't be stuck like it is. Then what are we supposed to do now? Does anyone have a way to contact Anakin? While they were talking, the citizens of the Emperor were passing them by as well, and when the mention of Anakin's name was heard, the people looked at the group strangely. Hey, why is everyone here looking at us like that? Obi-Wan glanced around them, as they were discussing only to notice this strange occurrence, as the others started to notice as well. I think that is because you dared to say their Emperor's name, yet or finally interjected, having only listened to what everyone else was talking about so far. Hello everyone, my name is Mace Windu, a Jedi from the Jedi order on Coruscant, and we were hoping to be directed towards Skywalker Palace. Does anyone know where we need to go towards? Mace wanted to see if they could get some help from the locals here. No one really answered, and most people went back to going on with their day. But this occurrence did alert some droids to something happening over in their direction. Once the droids arrived there, a commanding one took to speaking with them. State your business. The droid had already done a scan of all of them, and was quickly able to identify who these people were. Hello, we are here to speak with the Emperor. Mace took the lead here, and everyone allowed it not needing to say anything themselves. The Emperor, you guys are the guests he is expecting. The commanding droid said and questioned. Yes. Mace responded. Right, come this way, please. The droid said as the others within the group were now being escorted by these droids to the place they wanted to go towards. They wouldn't forget the oddity however, of the people staring at them for only mentioning or using Anakin's actual name, other than his title. No one was hostile or anything like that. But it did seem like that had done something wrong by referring to Anakin by his actual name. What the Jedi didn't know about just yet, was that the citizens of the Emperor had all taken to the religion the living droids, now since had created, and it had spread around so much, that it was successful in making everyone see Anakin as a divine-like figure. Not that they were all that far off from being correct, as Anakin at this point was starting approach territories, similar to becoming a god himself, taking a more in-depth look into the culture, History and religions of the Emperor, one need not look any further than the very start. The birth of the Chosen One, Anakin Skywalker. 
His mother had gotten pregnant at a relatively young age, and then had given birth to the small babe of Anakin. Most people believed that he really didn't have a father, and that his birth was of divine intervention. Not just any divine intervention, however, and instead it was the very work of Anakin himself to will himself into being. A crazy thought if one truly believed this to be the truth, and that Anakin had somehow existed in previous iterations of culture or other religions. Thankfully the droids were not so zealous against others that held a different opinion from them, and instead started to integrate the mythos of other cultures and religions into their own. This ensured that people would be able to see that Anakin was like that very figure they either prayed to or wanted blessings from. Whatever it was, everyone started to believe in the religious text the living droids had created, which was all too easy to spread. Especially when one had to consider that most of these people were not really educated, due to their status as slaves or commoners that were poor. It was normal for them to attach hope and all of their feelings of need onto one person. A person that did in the end save them from whatever perilous situation they were in, be that being slaves or otherwise poverty from the tyranny of whatever overlord they had at the time. Then there were myths or legends surrounding Anakin that spoke of him having many forms. It was strange, but it was also kind of accurate according to what he had done. While Anakin never told people of all of the things he had done, whether that be behind the scenes or what he had done right out in the public, it would seem that some things were able to be revealed. Not in a bad manner or even in a way that people with common sense would say or connect, that he was but his people even with having their intelligence skyrocket due to the super serum still believed in this actions and consequences, are a result of him. They could relate to Anakin, and him being a slave. Of course, he wasn't a slave for very long, and really not a slave for most of his life, either because he had freed himself really early. However, the people still connected with him and believed in his supposed divine right to rule. To rule over everyone and that if one is not converted or is not one of their own, then they are either considered the lost or are heathens. This religion was quite tolerant of people, but other than that, those who follow Anakin's religion are people that see others that don't as people who are lost. Then there was the idea of culture, which was steeped in the idea of freedom and liberty, which is only thanks to Anakin's influence as well, either as himself or as Vader, which had unfortunately been retired. Not that the people don't still have lingering dreams or shadows of his alternate self. His other identity of Vader was another thing that was attached to his mythology, his religious beliefs and doctrines. Vader was sort of like the wrathful or judgment-seeking part of what was Anakin. People didn't know it. But they were automatically associating Vader with Anakin, and instead of being two entirely different people, they were instead considered as one. Again, those outside of the Emperor would think of this as silly and not true at all, not realizing this was the truth. There was even churches being built in Anakin's name. Not that he did or had anything to do with these things himself. Some of the living droids, now turned since, had gotten the bright idea of having churches built in his name, and becoming priests or priestesses. Not everyone that had become since were within the army, and obviously there had to be some unique outliers to them. Anakin gave them freedom to choose what they wanted to do, and they could even leave the Emperor to seek out their own fortune. However, they stayed and only wanted to do things for him, or things that are related to him. So really, their only choices was to become a part of the army, science departments, religious faction and churches being built or somehow get a job within Skywalker Industries which was still operating. An example of religious texts spread throughout the Emperor and was the doctrines of the Emperor and that most if not everyone followed. Specifically they had even incorporated the saying, the supposed balance code of the Force within their doctrines automatically. Instead of using the Force however, they use or refer to the text with either his name or his title, which had become either Emperor or God Emperor. Anakin wasn't one to stop the people like this, and while it was cool and all he still didn't want this to happen. It would seem however, that it was either always meant to be this way, no matter what efforts he put into fixing the problem, the perceived problem, because it really wasn't. It would still happen and no matter what, no matter what he tried to do, it only made the people believe and put faith in him more and more. Even with greater intelligence, that doesn't mean people aren't cheap anymore. It just means that they would have a better potential to escape the idea of groupthink. But that didn't seem to apply to anything related to Anakin. And we are here, the commanding droid said as it dropped of the Jedi group. Thanks for the assistance. Qui-Gon thanked the droid as it then left with its squad, getting back to whatever they were supposed to be doing. The group looked at the massive building before them all, and they were in a warp as well they had seen a lot of things, especially those that were older. That didn't mean they couldn't sense the scale of the building, couldn't sense the weirdness and the force of this area in particular, as if there was something that blocked them from sensing things. This was in fact Anakin's own energy field he was starting to produce himself, and one of its benefits was the frazzling of the people's senses within the force. Especially force sensitives, while not against those connected to him or he allowed to see through, it could affect them as well. That was unless they had gotten the midi-chlorian upgrade, like he himself and Padme had gotten. Oh, well, if it isn't Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn, and his former apprentice, now Master Jedi, Obi-Wan Kenobi, E-3PO made his appearance, and had come outside to see Jesse had come to the palace, when usually no one would come here, E-3PO, Obi-Wan questioned as the droid was familiar to him, but it had been a while for him, since he had come back to Tatrine. The only person who had been here at the latest was Qui-Gon, and even he only here years ago. Yes, that is I, the first droid personally crafted by his master, Anakin Skywalker, E-3PO said quite proudly, because at this point Anakin had decided that it was about time that he made C-3PO come to life. He had installed the non-organic version of midi-chlorians into the bugger, and it was as if it had come to life. E-3PO did technically come to life in this instance, but it wasn't like it didn't already have a personality before, and it refused to become a synth as well. Believing that the first body Anakin had made for it was the best physical form it would have, Anakin would disagree, but he wasn't going to tell the exuberant protocol droid otherwise. E-3PO, 
Why are you out here? Qui-Gon asked the droid. Sir Qui-Gon, you see, I was tasked to bring you all inside. You all are quite late, and the Emperor was doing some other things in the meantime. E-3PO replied. Yeah, we got a bit lost. Qui-Gon admitted as everyone else was staring at the droid, seemingly finding there was something off about it. Anakin had mastered midi-chlorian manipulation to such an extent that he didn't have to worry about the backlash from the Force when he was granting C-3PO some life. He had also decided that he would do the same for R2-D2 as well given that the astromech droid had helped him quite a lot. Oh, then that is no worries, the Emperor is free now. You guys appeared just on time, as he has just finished up with going over something very important, E-3PO said, which prompted everyone's interest as the Jedi were unaware of Anakin getting involved with the Republic. He had after all only sent the message towards Palpatine, and no one else, and didn't publicize what he was wanting to do, as there was much more to gain by going behind and then surprising everyone. Time it probably the biggest factor and benefit that Anakin would get out of doing it like this. While Anakin doesn't really have to worry about his own time or the time of others running out, that didn't mean everyone else was eternal. Thanks, C-3PO. Qui-Gon said his thanks also on behalf of the rest of the group and they went into the palace, which only further gave strange feelings within the Force. It was balanced. The entirety of the planet was balanced between both sides, the light and the dark, but that was not the only thing that was weird. It felt like the whole building was living. It felt as if the entire planet was thriving and teeming with life, which it was, and so was the planet as well. Alive, that is. No, it was more like an actual being capable of thoughts, sentient and sapient thoughts that would be able to be communicated. In fact, it felt somewhat like what the Force feels like. Something that is alive, but not alive. Has emotion, but no emotion, and then there was other energy they all felt. It was the Force, but not the Force in balance. But not in balance. Harmonic and chaotic push and pull. It was starting to get extremely nauseating for a few of those within the group as they tried harder and harder to use their senses. Does everyone else Luminara started off before leaving off her sentence? Yes, you are quite right there Master Luminara. There is something that doesn't sit right, Quinlan said as he was starting to feel a bit nauseous as all of them tried to forcibly better understand their situation. Fight not against you should. Yoda spoke up here, with a sentence that was a bit hard to understand, but everyone realized they were all trying to fight against whatever was trying to block their senses. It was successful in doing so, and they hadn't even realized that they were knocking on something that would kind of change how one looked at the Force. Master Yoda, is there something you have discovered? Obi-Wan was most curious as to discover what was going on, especially since it seemed to be something that was the Force, but it wasn't. This sensation, this place, like the Force, it is. Yoda nodded his head as he hobbled around with his walking stick. What does that mean, Master? Obi-Wan further questioned the diminutive dwarf-like alien. Discover not we shall. Enter and talk to Skywalker, we must. Yoda had his mind on other things, specifically seeing what Anakin has gotten up to within the short separation they had all experienced. It hadn't even been that long since. But those here that missed the former apprentices, or fellow Jedi, were definitely going to catch up with them. Quinlan Vos had some words to speak of himself, as he was sort of like a father figure for Isla which would only be some trouble for Anakin, as he would most likely have to explain himself. Not that he would have to, but Anakin wasn't one for unnecessary conflict, and knew that fathers, or father figures, are usually protective of their spawn. Weird here, the Force is. Yoda thought to himself as they had finally made it to the grand entrance towards the throne room. It was quite large, huge even that they all had to take a step back to perceive the full scale of it. In the center there was something like a table, that was very, very large itself and spread itself across the place. Anakin would talk with officials that personally came here where this table was. In fact it wasn't even a permanent fixture and instead was something that could be deconstructed and rebuilt. This is referring to the nanites, with which could be constructed to form objects or furniture of all kinds within the throne room. Most of the time, this table wasn't even there, and the entire room acted as one massive projector, meaning Anakin could connect and use any point of it to project himself to anyone within the galaxy, when setting up a connection that is. It is also a way for Siri to enable herself and appear as a proper physical being, even when she didn't have a body she could fake it through virtual and holographic manipulation. It was even capable of fooling Anakin. That was if he didn't have access to the plethora of abilities he had access to. It would even go on to fool the Jedi as well. Greetings. Siri appeared from around a corner, as Anakin wasn't here at this moment, and she was tasked with keeping them busy for a minute or so. Hello there, Obi-Wan said first, given that everyone else seemed to be more interested about the building's interior or other things. Hello there, Siri titled her head. Yes, hello there. Obi-Wan nodded his head, but was a little freaked out as the woman before him was both coming back to his sense as both a living and non-living being. Obi-Wan, she isn't it. Quinlan seemed to know that it wasn't a proper living being, and had come to the conclusion that this was some form of advanced artificial intelligence technology. Oh, my bad. Obi-Wan said this. But there really wasn't anything to apologize for. The Emperor will be here shortly, Siri said before disappearing from their view. Well, at least the view of those that were looking. She believed that she had much better things to spend her time on, like interacting with one of Anakin's thought processes like she usually did. Especially with her own artificial mind that was built with thousands, if not millions or trillions of processes herself. Anakin wasn't so rude as to leave his guests waiting, as he was doing something. Specifically he was trying to bring everyone else, the girls to come along and greet their former Jedi buddies. He was sure that they would appreciate seeing some familiar faces, preferably ones that were somehow, in some way their family. Even if the family was dysfunctional in many aspects. Hello, Anakin called out as he entered the throne room, expecting to see the Jedi that had requested to come. 
but he was surprised that even Plo Koon was accepted in coming. Hello everyone. Anakin greeted them all as they were just doing their own things. I hope I didn't keep any of you waiting for too long. Anakin had entered all by himself as the girls were also off doing their own things. Well, that wasn't all he said they had some visitors from the Jedi Temple and practically all of them wanted to come even Padme wanted to see them. Master Skywalker, oh, wait, I apologize. But I guess you go by Emperor now, don't you? Luminara was the first to approach while the others also followed along, getting a better look at Anakin, and nothing had really changed much. Even his attire, which was something not liked within the Jedi, but accepted just as they had accepted Isla's attire was the same. It spoke of regal grace, and all of these other words. That would be perfect for describing someone that looked like some sort of royalty. Not just any royalty however, but it was something fit exactly for Anakin, and everyone else here were thinking to themselves that it fit him way too well, as if he had planned to come back to the Emperor all along. Well, yes, but everyone here, I am sure can just call me however they like. Anakin didn't mind however people talked about him, as the words of others didn't really affect him. It did start to affect his reputation however, as people were believing in him as some sort of god, but he was past the point of trying to change it. Your citizens would seem to tell us otherwise. May spoke as he gazed at his former apprentice. Don't mind them. It has become somewhat a part of the cultural and religious aspects of my emperor. Anakin replied. Anakin and this group would talk about many things, as Anakin had told them to wait for the arrival of everyone else. He had said that they were being silly because they were being late, and because of this, they had a good conversation with Anakin. He hinted to them all that he would be having some form of effort in helping the Republic through the use of a new contract between the two factions. He wouldn't hide it as at this point it was becoming clear that they were losing clones, and that they needed some way to recover from this. Then came the rest of the girls, Ahsoka, Barris, Isla and Shark. All four of them present, but there were some others as well, specifically Padme, whom also wanted to see some old friends. It was like some sort of reunion. Isla was emotional at seeing Quinlan Vos, her sort of father figure, and went up to hug him. Something that he did not dodge while Ahsoka being the perky personality she was went right up to one of her longtime friends Plo Koon. Then there was Shark who had decided to get along with and talk with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan as she was aware of, and knew of these two. There was really not that many people she was close to within the Order, but because she was close to Anakin, she had befriended both Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Barris of course went towards Luminaro, one of her own masters as well, because she also kind of saw Luminaro as a big sister-like figure. That only left Yaddle, Yoda, and Mace, whom these three would start to discuss some things with Anakin and Padme. Of course, not everyone stayed within these groups, and everyone intermingled with each other better, where they all caught up with each other on things that were happening. Not that the girls weren't aware of things, it was just they liked being able to see what could be considered family as well, as distant relatives, but still relatives nonetheless. So, Master Yoda, Anakin began as it was only the five, Mace, Yaddle, Yoda, Padme and Anakin, that was within hearing range of their conversation. Conversation that would be considered important for the Jedi, as there were things that were going on that needed them to be aware of certain things. What is it exactly that has brought all of you here? Cannot say for everyone, but here, to know of your order, I am. Yoda stated as he looked up to Anakin, that was a veritable giant compared to himself. Everyone within the room could feel Anakin's energy field, something that Anakin was aware of them discovering, but they had grown used to it by now. Specifically they were starting to not be able to distinguish his energy field from the force itself, and that is because Anakin took his time getting here for this specific reason. Of course there was others, but this was important as it would definitely raise some questions. You wish to know more about the Emperor and Order? Anakin asked as he looked around, seeing that Yaddle, Yoda and Mace were interested in knowing more about it. Isla Sakura. No, Isla Skywalker ni Sakura. That was her name now and she loved it. She wouldn't trade her now new name for anything else in the world. Well, that would be silly to think of. But she was well off because of her now husband Anakin. But that didn't mean she was unable to earn for herself. She just didn't need to. A privilege that most, if not all people would have liked to have. She wasn't surprised to find that the Jedi were coming to Tatooine, as she and the rest of the girls had heard from Anakin that they were coming. What she was surprised about, however, was that her former Jedi Master Quinlan Vos would be here as well. He was like a father to her, and she was a little disappointed he couldn't make it to the wedding. But now that he was here, she would send some time with him. Tell him about what Anakin wants to do and stuff. Of course, she wouldn't be reveling any secrets or anything like that, but would speak about some other stuff. Like how her life was as she lived here with Anakin and other things. She may even bring up the topic of trying to have some children with Anakin, but she is also unsure sure about how Quinlan would take that. He was quite protective of her, and seeing as she had already run off with Anakin, it would definitely be strange for him to adapt to the situation at hand. Especially since she seemed to only be one of Anakin's wives. Not that she didn't have any alone time with Anakin. She had plenty and then some more, as Anakin made sure to make time for all of them. It was something she loved about him, that he was willing to set aside his time for them, of course. That also meant that she would set aside some time of her own for him as well. It was only natural that if he gave her 100% then she should only return the favor, and return the favor 100% of the time she did. But let's not go and to specifics on just how she had done that and instead focus on the present. The present where she was finally able to talk to her father figure after what seemed like years, but the amount of time that had passed was only between one to two months. After disengaging from the hug she had given Quinlan, she greeted him after that. Hello, yes, hello. I wasn't quite expecting such a surprise. Quinlan replied as he gazed at his former apprentice. She seemed to have grown, 
but at the same time she had already physically reached her peak. It was strange to sense growth in her that wasn't an actual growth of the physical form. So it had to be something that was changed or she had experienced within her own mind. I didn't know you were coming with Master Yoda. Isla said as she was clearly not in the know about who was coming. It wasn't like Anakin knew all of whom were coming either, and Quinlan transmitted this information to Isla as well. Well, not even. Your husband knew that I was taking along, nor did he even know of who else was coming either. So I am sure it was a surprise to him as well. Both said this. But internally he was thinking, even thought he didn't seem that surprised at all, and seemed to be expecting us all. It was an uncanny feeling, and it definitely nearly put him on edge. But that was just his inner feelings coming out, as he would only think of the worst of his daughter's lover. It was natural for a father to think this way. I don't know about that. Arnie knows of a lot of things, and is hardly ever really wrong when predicting a lot of things that are happening or are going to happen. Isla didn't seem to notice what's in her feelings, and instead decided to praise her husband. Yeah, about that Vose was interrupted however as Barris had come over with her own elderly sister-like figure. Hey guys, Barris said as she approached the two. What are you guys talking about? I am sorry to say that I don't know everyone from within the Order, may I know your name? Barris was asking Vose. I am Quinlan Vose, Isla's former master. Vose answered. Oh, that is cool. Barris nodded her head as she glanced at Isla. By the way Isla, remember my other Jedi master here? Yes, I remember. Hello Master and Julie. Isla greeted the other older Morallan woman. Greetings to you as well. I was just being informed about how my former apprentice here was finally able to confess her feelings to Skywalker. But then she was getting embarrassed as Luminara continued before being interrupted. We don't have to talk about that. Barris quickly covered by Luminara's mouth and made sure to give her a look that said to shut up. Okay, okay? I was just joking. Luminara decided to drop this little joke and store it away for a later time. Anyway, as I was saying, Barris would rant as she was overly excited at having to see Luminara again. And even being able to see some people that while she knew were flawed, but were kind of like family. It was a gathering of sorts. One would think that Ahsoka would be the one to be overly excited, but it would seem that it was in fact the usually quiet and reserved Barris. After a while and everyone was starting to do their own things, or talk within their own groups, where even Ahsoka had dragged Plo Koon, along with Barris and Luminara to go off into another direction, Vos finally had his former apprentice alone again. So Vos started but left off as he looked at his apprentice. He was starting to notice something was extremely strange with her, like she had this sort of glow about her that radiated life. So, Isla seemed to be oblivious to Quinlan's obvious and blatant discomfort. How exactly is your life here on Tatrine? He asked her, it is great. I can do whatever I want, and I have been spending most of my time with the Emperor in order teaching kids about the Force and everything like that. Isla responded, Kids, I would have never expected you to be looking after some kids. Now that he thought about it, Vos could see her doing that, especially with that strange feeling and glow about her that seemed to suggest something. But he couldn't quite place his finger on what it could mean. Well Isla sort of girlishly chuckled here as she was thinking about something, daydreaming even. She had really come a long way when interacting with Anakin, which only brought a smile upon Quinlan's face. How could he not want the best for his foster child? He would have to respect her decision and he had already done so. But that didn't mean he liked her choice in a partner. Anakin, while great and all, and having been ordained by both of the girls' praise of Anakin, Quinlan couldn't help but get annoyed at Anakin. Well, Quinlan questioned her and snapped her out of whatever stupor she had gone into. You're daydreaming. Am I? Sorry about that. Isla replied. By the way, I sent something. Quinlan started as he was about to tell Isla something, but that would come another time. You wish to see the Temple of My Order, eh? Anakin said more as a rhetorical question rather than one that is to be answered, but Padme still interjected her own voice into the mix. I am sure Anakin would be fine with it. Padme said and she is right. Anakin didn't mind her speaking for him here, as she is his wife, and she is also finally connected to him via the Diabond. It was something she was trying to get used to and trying to get used to her brand new force abilities as well. That is great then. Mace said as he looked at how Padme and Anakin seemed to be in perfect synchronization within their movements, and their entire aura seemed to merge into each other. It was a very weird feeling and something that was strange to sense. It was as if Anakin and Padme were both one with each but not one at the same time. In fact, Mace also noticed this type of connection with his other lovers as well, Shark, Isla and even Barris. They all seemed to have some sort of connection to Anakin, and Mace was wholly interested in finding out exactly what it was. He knew that he probably shouldn't ask about it, but he will do so in the future once he has his former apprentice alone. Yes, I don't know why you guys are here exactly, but if it is about some of the Jedi coming here and you guys are worried, then I'm fine with you coming here. It isn't like it is all that against the Jedi or anything like that, but I do advise you all that in my order, we do things differently. Anakin had to make sure all of these people knew that he was doing it different from them. He continued, There is things related to the dark side of the Force, but also the light. What? The dark side. Have you been trying or have been tempted by the dark side? While Mace was saying this, he always knew that Anakin was probably crazy enough to try something new. Come down. Does it look like I'm going on a mass murder spree, trying to take over the galaxy? Anakin questioned. Well, you would have fooled me. What with having the Emperor and expand your territories outwards and all? Mace replied with some sass. It would seem that I have influenced quite a lot. Anakin nodded and said this more to himself, but intended Mace to hear what he said fully. What did you say? 
Mace wasn't actually upset, however he was somewhat worried about how or what Anakin was doing, experimenting or delving into the dark side of the Force. Anakin was no Sith, he knew that, and so did everyone else. Take us to them, you will. Yoda asked Anakin, seeing that the dialogue between Anakin and Mace was over. Sure, I can do that. I am sure that there would be some former members of the Jedi there. I do have to preface here, that while similar to the Jedi, we, well those within the Emperor and Order, follow a different code. I hope that all of you here can respect us, just as we would show you respect as fellow Force-sensitive people. Anakin stated, making sure to be as peaceful and diplomatic as possible. He didn't want to start a war with the Jedi, because while he was strong and would survive and most likely even destroy them, that didn't mean there wouldn't be any casualties. It was kind of a guarantee as while the Jedi now didn't seem as powerful as those from the past, he knew that they could rise to the occasion if need be. Anakin would then take Yoda, Yaddle and Mace to have a look at the Emperor in order. It was quite the basic name, simple as well. It just attached the Emperor onto order, and it was perfectly fine. At least Anakin had thought the name was fine, given its connection to him, and its connection to the Emperor at large. It did act more like an academy, than an actual monk-like temple, as there was no need for it to be anything like the Jedi Order. There was also no need for this place to be anything like the Sith Order as well, and instead Anakin just wanted to make sure people know. They know of the dangers related to the Force and the energies, light and dark. The benefits, downsides and all of everything else. Like the history of both the Jedi and the Sith, and even information pertaining to the Jedi, the old, old order of Force-sensitive people. Ahsoka may have come up with the name, and had taken such a long time to deliberate, or at least it seemed like a long time within her own Force trance, that it fit quite well. There was no need to make any adjustments or to even throw the name away because it was fine just as is. Supposedly even the Force had helped her decide the name as well, meaning that it was perfectly normal for it to come out as such. Why is it named the Emperor in Order anyway? Mace asked as they were walking. I didn't name it if that is what you are asking about. Anakin replied as Padme was also coming along, given that she was Force sensitive as well now. Then who did? Yaddle asked, given that she was the most silent and had not said anything much since being here. It was something weird to all of a sudden hear her. You can thank Ahsoka for coming up with such a brilliant name. Anakin replied, Young Tano. Huh? Mace said, Yes, Young Tano. Anakin confirmed. Tell me, what exactly is it that goes on here? Mace asked. Well, Anakin would go on to explain exactly how his own order worked, and then explain what he teaches, and what others would be taught or would be teaching as well. There was no actual discrimination of which side of the Force was used. However, there were overall less dark side users of the Force, mainly because there were more and more rogue Jedi joining this academy. That didn't mean there was no one that practiced the dark arts, and Renala and Xana can both be accounted within this group. After a bit, Renala would be teaching people about the dark side, and so would Xana as well. In fact, Xana was already doing so, of course it was something she was reluctant to do but she felt compelled to do something, or more specifically to do something for Anakin, but she wouldn't say this aloud. Ahsoka Tano. Who was Ahsoka Tano? She would have called herself a Jedi at one point, but that wasn't the case anymore. She would have considered herself someone that believed herself to only be a friend to Anakin, but now she thought otherwise. Having discovered the diet between herself and Anakin sure was life-changing, but at the same time it wasn't. Not because there wasn't a difference in their relationship, because it was made obviously clear to her that he wouldn't be interested in her, not until she became much more of an adult than she was now. Not that she believed herself to be a child, and she was fully aware of the things adults do. They held hands and stuff, right? She thought to herself as she in a monologuing about the things that were going on around her. Becoming Anakin's apprentice was something she had always wanted, but now she wanted more than that. She always knew that this was going to happen as well. Not because she was told so or any other reason. It was because through the Force she could sense it. Not that she would have known for sure, but it was a possibility. Her and him. Obviously it couldn't work out right now. But she would be cashing in on some checks, once she is old enough to participate in whatever adults do. Like hand-holding. Ahsoka was energetic and didn't like doing most things that involved sitting around. Like meditation. But it was something she was starting to do more and more of because it would seem she had the best foresight among everyone within their small group, excluding Anakin of course, as his abilities far surpass her own and the others as well. That didn't mean that she was useless however, and she would prove that she was capable herself. Not that there was much conflict like at all, and that person, the pawn that she had wanted to get some revenge for escaping from her, was dealt with as well. She didn't know exactly what had happened to the pawn, but she that he should have gotten justice for their crimes, along with everyone else that was a part of whatever organization they were a part of trying to ruin the Emperor in. She had come to love it here. She found herself immensely liking it here. But of course that was mainly because she was with Anakin. As home was where the heart was. Of course the other girls as well, as they acted like a family. It was certainly much better than being within the Jedi as she had never been anywhere else. And the first time she had a chance at exploration outside of the temple was when she left with Anakin. This signified a new era, a new change not only for herself, but for the others as well. What it would also signify was the turning of the page and the end of a chapter, where most if not all of the galaxy would start to change due to this event. She had seen many things through her visions, and was aware that Anakin was always the chosen one. One of the main reasons she had even decided to attach herself to him was because of her older self's attachment to Anakin, her future master. Her relationship with the others besides Anakin was pretty good. They hardly had any disagreements with each other, and even if they did, it wouldn't last long before they were able to talk it out. Anakin didn't have to come in and save the day, as that would just be silly, trying to mitigate and keep all of them happy all of the time. Their emotions 
emotions and feelings were their own even when they could share those emotions with Anakin, he never really got involved. Not because he didn't want to, but because if they were to act like adults or be adults, then they would have to grow up and be like them. Which they didn't exactly have the best examples from, except the mostly unfeeling Jedi. At least Barris and herself did learn from Anakin's interactions with other adults. Then there was today, a day that she knew was coming, but didn't think it would come so soon. While Anakin informed them all of the Jedi coming, not everyone knew of who was coming, or was aware of who was coming. Supposedly even Anakin, but Ahsoka knew that he knew, and Anakin knew that she knew that he knew. Quite the twisting of the mind that was there, but back onto the point, and that was she knew and he knew. So there would only be one outcome. Her already being prepared and ready to see what she considered to be someone she was close to. Jedi Master Plo Koon. Plo Koon had a very close bond with Ahsoka Tano, having been the Jedi that found her and brought her to the Jedi Temple, affectionately nicknaming her Little Ahsoka. In a way Plo Koon was very close to her, or at least she felt close to him. And while she couldn't exactly say he was like a father or older brother, she could at least say she was close to him. Little Soka. If Plo Koon could smile, he would, but his alien biology really didn't allow for that, so instead he could only transmit his feelings through his voice. Smiling herself, Ahsoka walked up to the person that had taken her away from her home planet of Shaili. Ahsoka was an orphan. An orphan that seemingly had no parents and had no one to really look after her, even when her people were supposed to be a very social species. Then there was the fact that she was incredibly force-sensitive as well something that Plo Koon was able to easily sense in her. Master Plo Koon, Ahsoka greeted him. You seem to have grown somewhat since the last time I have seen you. Plo Koon said as he looked at the little Togruta girl he had seen grow up. You don't seem to have grown at all since the last time I had seen you as well. Ahsoka cheekily replied. Plo Koon was in general a humble, polite, stubborn and difficult person. That difficulty has supposedly been mellowed out over the years. And he is now much more of a chill guys than what he was as a Jedi apprentice. Ho, oh, you can talk, Plo said with his voice being modified by the mask he wore. So what have you been up to recently? Ahsoka may have thought of Plo Kuna's family, but she knew that he was kind of like a father to her as well. It wasn't simple though to just call him her father figure, when she didn't know if she had any family of her own. She had some goals of her own, other than being by Anakin's side forever, and that was to try and someday see if she had any family at all. Did her mother and father die, and that is why she was left all alone, by herself? Or was it that they didn't want her, because of some other reason she didn't know about? Most children within the Jedi Order probably would have questions about their family as well, but that was suppressed behind other things that were taught from within the Jedi. For Ahsoka, though, she was much more determined than that, and was also much more fearless in the face of not knowing what the answer to her question could be. Well, Plo Koon started and would recap a lot of what was happening even though Ahsoka probably already knew of things like this. She was very smart and very perceptive when it came to many things. Ahsoka would also share something that would have and has happened here on Tatrine within the Emperor or some of the things she has done. Like that small adventure everyone had gone on to get their own lightsaber crystals. Just like Isla however, she wasn't about to tell him everything about what was going on even if Plo Koon was someone that she felt close to. It was kind of the agreement all of the girls had set up without Anakin knowing of course that they would keep the die to themselves. They wouldn't share this secret with others, as they felt that it was something precious for them and them alone. If Anakin could be possessive of them, then of course they could also return the favor as well. I want to hold Anakin's hand as well. Ahsoka thought to herself as she glanced over to see that Anakin was talking with the three Jedi Masters, and was also holding Padme's hand. Why couldn't that be me? She was sulking internally. Ahsoka, to get away from being jealous, decided to drag along Barris, Plo Koon, Luminaro, Shark, Obi-Wan, and Qui-Gon along to somewhere else. She left behind Ayla and Quinlan, seeing that the two of them had something more to talk about. Barris Offee. No. She is actually now known as Barris Skywalker Neofi. Barris didn't know what to think about when it came to recent events, whether that be their leaving from the Jedi Order, or otherwise her now married status to her loved one. Of course, she wanted to be together with Anakin, and very much wanted to continue this relationship from now until forever. If possible, she would even go back in time and try and take Anakin for herself, before he got to anyone else. Of course, that was her just being silly as she had already accepted that he would probably have multiple lovers, if not wives. What pained her however, was that she wasn't the first one. Not that all of that mattered in the end, as she was still able to unify herself with her lover for holy matrimony. Of course, she had done so in where it was done accordingly with the customs of her people, but the priest involved was of the religion here on Tatooine. No, within the Emperor and she had decided that she should become the hidden boss of this religion. She wouldn't even tell Anakin or anyone else that she was going to be the one operating things from the shadows. She wanted, just like all of Anakin's people, followers and creations to know of Anakin's greatness. She kept her thoughts and emotions hidden however, but she knew that Anakin probably knew about how she felt and what she wanted. He did oblige her multiple times, in the throes of passion she would have liked to make herself more durable, but it would seem that her endurance just wasn't up to any of the other girls' level. It wasn't something she ashamed of, and thought of herself as blessed. Blessed that she was the one to finish the quickest, as this meant that she felt the most pleasure with Anakin, or at least that was what she told herself. What are you thinking about? Lumina Nara woke Barris from her thoughts as she was currently daydreaming about her very passionate times with Anakin. Nothing. Barris exclaimed. She would have been the most interested in having a child with Anakin even if she didn't say so. 
because she was starting to buy in more and more into the religion created by those living droids, now turned sense. Well, you were just telling me about how you were. Luminara began up again, but Barris was distracted by Anakin, starting to hold hands with Padme, which where she was the first to notice. Damn, she is getting in some quality time. Barris thought to herself as she was also simultaneously listening to Luminara talk to her. While Barris did get to have her alone time, she was the one that wanted even more time with Anakin even when she had also agreed to this special situation of Anakin having multiple lovers. It wasn't that she was overly possessive or jealous or anything like that, but instead she just wanted more time with Anakin. Actually, she did feel satisfied enough with the time she spends with him, whether that be doing absolutely nothing at all or something that was highly physically intensive. What normally consisted of what she did now that she was here, was stalking Anakin most of the time, while also trying to reform the religious system here. While it was supposedly mostly complete, there was still some more work to be done to refine the religion. Then there was the cultural aspects of the Emperor in which she was also interested in influencing. While she was mostly good with the religion, that didn't mean she thought of it as perfect as there were things within that were imperfect. All of those that wished to become priests had to go through her. All of those that become 100% percent followers and believers, were all being influenced by her, as well Padme took an active political role in the Emperor's development. That didn't mean she did other things as well, specifically in regards to the Emperor's culture and religion as a whole where Barris was starting to become quite the influencer herself. While educational institutions are probably the best to convert people into believers of Anakin being some sort of divine entity, that wasn't an area she would go into. Not because she wasn't allowed, but because it was better to separate things like religion, culture and education. Without this distinction, many things could become merged, and that wouldn't be good to the growth and development of the empire Anakin had put in a lot of work to finish and make better. One of the prime doctrines that Anakin had taught her was the idea of conflict leading to growth. Something that she had seen developing and had seen in many areas as well, especially when it came to the Jedi as while they were backwards because of peace, as soon as they were threatened by Dooku. It was only then that things were starting to change. Of course there was another form of conflict in the form of Anakin leaving with them, and then creating his own order. But that should only have a minimal impact. What was important was the war, which did lead to the people upgrading things they had never thought of doing so before. The Jedi were starting to become more powerful because they could finally put into practice their abilities and powers within different situations. Not that they hadn't done so before. It was just much more apparent that the conflict at least brought up their combat-based abilities to another level. Hey, come on and let's go. Ahsoka called out to Barris as they were all leaving in a small group to better explore or give a guide to those Jedi from the Order around Tatooine. Coming. She looked back to where Anakin was to see that he wasn't there anymore and was most likely gone with Yoda, Yaddle, Mace and Padme. Welcome to the temple. I think I have decided to start calling this either a temple or academy. I prefer academy, but for convenience sake, welcome to the temple. Anakin said to the group as they now entered the large structure. It was a bit off from where the rest of the main city of Tatooine was, but it wasn't so far that they would be unable to catch some rides there. An academy. What do you mean by that? Mace asked, given that it wasn't that good to try and have Yoda speaking all of the time. Well, you see that I don't really do things the way you guys do things here. Anakin looked all over the place, signaling to various areas that wasn't of the usual design or set up for the Jedi. I didn't really like that you took children away from their families, so instead, I have made it similar to education. So this place is like a school. Yet a question thinking that the idea wasn't as novel. Yes. Anakin confirmed and answered her question with both of his words and nodding his head. The group of five people would travel through the academy even coming across some of the rogue Jedi that had been accepted into this place. They were of course tested, physically, mentally and medically in other areas or factors that Anakin considered were of importance. Like age, as placing people within their own age range is usually for the best. Then there was also the fact that he had to take into account people's knowledge and capabilities, and further categorize where they should be and learn, their talents in particular, and he also had to take into account what their own wants or desires were. It was a lot of work to make sure that they were both best utilized and were also happy, as this would maximize the gains they would receive, but it would also maximize his gains as well. There was a fine line between what someone was good at doing, and what someone wanted to do, and Anakin wanted to find the line for everyone that came in. He didn't want to dictate their paths and would instead train them in what their talents were at the best for. Obviously he didn't want people to have weaknesses as well, as that would mean he had hyper-focused on wanting the best of the best. That is not how people work, and there are some that would perform better if they were doing something they loved. Forget all of that do a job that you like to do or something like that. Instead you would have to compromise a lot of the time, just like the rest of life. No one will ever get all of what they want, and if they do, then they would want more. It is only how people work and because of this, Anakin made sure people put their skills to good use, but at the same time also had a good time utilizing their skills. There are outliers that don't fit into the range of having something they both like and are good at. For these people, Anakin considered trying to direct them into doing the things that they were good at, but in the end, it was always that person's choice. What do your students learn here exactly? Mace asked as he had seen some questionable things, things related to the dark side of the Force. Anakin wouldn't hide this however, as they both couldn't do anything here, and didn't have the political power to do so as well. Everything, everything. Mace further questioned. Yes, everything. Everything from the light side of the Force to the dark. Anakin responded, knowing that Mace would probably either have an outburst or would be calm enough to question him instead. So, you mean to tell me that you have people here being tempted by the dark side daily. It would seem like it was the former. Yes. Anakin answered. Are you crazy Mace didn't shout. But it was an exclamation at Anakin's supposed calm about the situation. Sighing, Anakin stops everyone and can see that the three Jedi were looking at him funny. 
They were not outright aggressive or anything like that, but they were looking at him as if he was taking the wrong path. Well, it was more like Yoda was doing that, while Mace seemed to have a look that couldn't be deciphered, while Yaddle didn't seem to care all that much. Look, I know that the Jedi have it out for the Sith, and I understand that. Anakin pauses so they would be prepared to soak in some information. What you all think of the Force is both right and wrong. Anakin didn't really want to debate or argue with them, but he knew that he was slowly whittling away at their views of the world, of the galaxy and the Force as a whole. It had all started with him leaving, and Anakin did this exactly for this reason. Among other things, speak more, you must. Yoda was interested in hearing another perspective, not that he was the best person when it came to being tolerant of ideas on the Force outside of the Jedi way. It was because Anakin was so special that he was willing to listen. That and it seemed like ever since Anakin's decision to leave, their abilities to foresee things was starting to clear up. Yoda wanted to know why exactly this was so, and knew that it wasn't Skywalker's fault for that veil existing as it did. But it was exactly his leaving that had unraveled whatever this veil was obstructing the Jedi's view. No, his view. I think you remember that code back on that planet, right Yoda? Anakin didn't address Yoda as a master, as he wasn't his teacher, not within the Jedi, and he wasn't his master outside of the Order as well. Anakin was still willing to address Qui-Gon and Mace's master, since they had been the two to help him learn and advance himself. It wasn't like he actually thought of them as his masters, but instead it was sort of a term that he would use to address the two out of a sign of respect. Remember hearing? I do. Yoda confirmed that he remembered. I remember that as well. Mace was also present, but Yaddle was the only one confused within this group. Well, Yaddle and Padme as she hadn't exactly seen through the entirety of Anakin's mind, and went through his memories. Just as a recap, here I go again. Anakin would then recite the code he had come up with in the Crystal Caves of Ilum. Flowing through all, there is balance. There is no peace without a passion to create. There is no passion without peace to guide. Knowledge fades without without the strength to act. Power blinds without the serenity to see. There is freedom in life. There is purpose in death. The Force is all things and I am the Force. Anakin finished as he could see Yaddle's and Padme's eyes light eye, especially more so for Padme, as she was still mostly new to all of this magic stuff. Well, what do you all think about that? It was something that I had discovered and come up with a long time ago, exactly within the Caves of Ilum. Anakin continued. Now that you put it like that, it does sound pretty appropriate, Padme said as she nodded her head. She had only ever heard of the Jedi Code, or the Jedi Way when she was stalking she, means doing some research into Anakin. I can see the reasoning behind your code. But May started before leaving off as he really couldn't find a proper flaw within it. And instead it would all come down to preference. It wasn't like Anakin said there could only be those balance within the Force. As he knows that there will always be extremes within anything that has a scale. But, but, I don't like it. Mace responded, not having any other argument, and that there is another problem with the Jedi Order. You all think of emotions as something that would get in the way, and I know that you mostly refer to negative emotions, but that still doesn't change the principal problem with the Jedi Code. Anakin didn't hold back any punches. Do you guys not understand the scale of what the Jedi ways could do to a person, especially with no system in place to give counsel? Anakin continued, but counsel is usually given by a master yet or started not quite understanding. Again, I don't mean counsel from someone that you have connected or bonded to but instead a proper therapist. Don't you think that sending the Jedi, even young Jedi, into the war is something dangerous, and would most likely result in the deaths of those young Jedi? Or of those that they are trying to protect? Yes, but Dash Mace was going to say something only to be interrupted. Then there is the whole child-taking thing. I don't understand why exactly this is done even when I know of the reasoning. It comes off as indoctrination, something that only cults would do to young malleable children, Anakin said another one of his thoughts. Okay, Arnie, I think that is enough for now. I think they get it. Padme decided to stop Anakin from saying anything more. I apologize. I just believe and others would agree that there are too many problems within the Jedi Order. Don't even get me started on the Republic as well. Anakin left off there because he had another appointment to get to. Padme can help show you guys around some more. I am going to be showing within the Senate today through a holographic meeting. Yes, I can show you three the rest of what you want to look at. Padme directed them as Anakin was off into another direction. Greetings people of the Senate. I apologize for my tardiness as I was dealing with something else. Anakin made himself known through the holographic form he had taken and could see the rest of the Senate himself through a screen. Yes, we know of your visitors so there is no no need to apologize, and we completely understand. Palpatine, ever the politician just had to add his own two cents into the situation, not only because he wanted to get a better impression of himself for Anakin, but also for the rest of the Senate as well. It does well to take on a kind and caring position for a potential potential ally. Now that the Emperor's Emperor is here, I would like to announce that the discussion as to whether or not we should agree with his deal, begin. Palpatine said, and this got the ball rolling as many a discussion was taking place. Most of the time there was some deliberation back and forth between various factions. Some that wanted to continue the war effort while there were those were staunch in their position of the Republic winning with what they had. Which really wasn't all that much to begin with as the Galactic Republic was made up of somewhat peaceful factions and they would all compete peacefully. Or, that is at least what they would tell you because there was much more going on both openly and behind the scenes. Politics was a game. A game in which one had to be quite the manipulator and also had to have the money to pull off some rather impressive stunts. What do you mean inconsiderate? The kind Emperor of the Emperor has decided to lend us his aid out of the kindness of his heart, because he could see that we are starting to lose the war due to the lack of a standing army. A voice called out over the many other voices shouting at each other as this long deliberation was beginning again. Of course, it wouldn't last so long, and a vote would be cast by the end of this day. 
Are you stupid? The Emperor's Emperor is obviously doing this for more than just helping us out, as he will also benefit out of our fighting. The voice called back. That is only natural when it comes to trade deals like this. You can't expect the Emperor to just give us these things for free, with no gain of his own. It would seem that some people were becoming quite wild thinkers. Or it was that they always knew about the corruption from within, and didn't have to do anything and just sit back and relax. Preposterous. I dare you say that directly to the Emperor's face. More rambling went on. But the gist of the situation was this. One, Anakin would be sending droids, both combat and medical, to help out the Galactic Republic against the Sis. Two, Anakin would be doing so while not breaking the non-aggression pact with the Sis, and would not be becoming a part of the Galactic Republic. Three, Anakin would want something in exchange, and the first thing he had brought up was better access to various trade routes throughout the Republic, something that was most agreeable to those within the Senate. It wasn't like he hadn't already started dominating the public market through Skywalker Industries. Four, Anakin wanted the planet of Naboo. Some people speculated that this was because of many things, and probably the most important factor was probably Anakin doing this for his wife. Of course he was. But that wasn't the only reason as having a way to expand from Naboo was great for him. Both politically, economically and through other factors, like increasing his influence and control of the sectors of space surrounding the Emperor. 5. Anakin did also ask for some small payments. When it came to wanting materials, it was only natural with this condition as well, because he would need the materials to cover the cost of production. 6. Anakin wanted control over the planet of Issa, something that was blocking the way for his expansion. The expansion of the Emperor and the people here were able to quickly gather upon this information. Thankfully, it would seem it wasn't of much importance to them, and Anakin was like an ally, so this went through. What the Republic wanted in return didn't count as they were desperate. Even Palpatine was desperate at this point, as it would seem weird for the Sis to not continue their attack, aggressive or otherwise. He couldn't order Dooku to keep holding everyone back because sooner or later they would get impatient. He also could afford to keep sending out people from the Republic, and it wasn't like they were just going to raise an army out of nowhere. After a long deliberation, the voting session had finally come. Everything at this point would be anonymous, as this would best mitigate any hate sent anyone's way. Palpatine didn't want too much in fighting at a precious moment like this. The vote is in favor of the trade agreement. Palpatine's voice was heard as he announced the results. A few here would believe that the results was completely fair, but most of them knew that the voting system was rigged from the start. It always has been. The vote is in favor of the trade agreement. Palpatine's voice was heard as he announced the results. A few here would believe that the results was completely fair, but most of them knew that the voting system was rigged from the start. It always has been. War. War never changes. War never changes as it is always usually about economics. Anakin thought to himself as he was contemplating what to do next. Obviously he would continue to siphon away the clones from the Republic to make them completely dependent on him for a source of protection. Once the trade agreement was done, Anakin didn't have to sign anything because he had already sent over the proper documents. Of course, there are also virtual signed agreements as well but they may be prone to being tampered with so instead, Anakin would also allow the public to view everything. Everything should be revealed as it isn't even a secret, and a secret like this could be turned against him in times of political distress. If they would somehow change the agreement without people knowing, then it would be Anakin's problem. In fact, he could have slowly made changes of his own as well, but that would also be bad, because it would make him look bad. Anakin wanted to appeal to the Galactic Republic on a larger scale, instead of just trying to win over the thousands of senators. That wouldn't work as they were corrupt, or at least a lot of them were, and because of this comma, Anakin would appeal to the people first, just as he had always been doing. So you're done then. Isla had come towards Anakin as she had also brought along her former master and father figure, Quinlan Vos. Yeah. I'm done. Anakin replied as he had a feeling that something was going to happen. He was just unsure of what that is exactly. Hello. I don't think I have formally or properly introduced myself. My name is Quinlan Vos. Vos reached out a hand towards Anakin, initiating a handshake. Likewise, I am Anakin Skywalker. You don't have to introduce yourself to me. Everyone within the galaxy should know of your name by this point. Vos replied, firmly grabbing Anakin's hand. Anakin of course noticed this, but Quinlan really couldn't harm him. Well, then I would assume that you know some other things as well. After this little introduction, a proper introduction between Anakin and Vos, the three could now talk about other things. Specifically, Isla had something to say that would surprise both Anakin and Vos. Yeah, I know about that. Have you ever considered leaving the Jedi Order? Anakin asked Vos as their current topic of discussion had to do with the flaws of the Order. Yes, there has been some times that I had considered to do so, but I have decided that I would stay. Vos replied. Anakin nodded his head at Vos' response, as there was no need to say his decision is wrong. It is his choice after all. By the way, Anakin and Vos looked towards Isla as she seemed to have something to say. It did seem important and there was some hesitance in her behavior. Anakin could sense that something wasn't exactly wrong, but there was something that seemed to be off. Something that was bothering Isla and there was this abundant amount of life force and her force sensitivity seemed to have increased as well. It was like she had gotten more powerful, but she actually wasn't, and instead it seemed like something else. Well, what is it? Quinlan asked as he also saw her hesitance. Well, you see Isla still seemed hesitant, or maybe she was embarrassed to say, yes. Anakin asked here, instead of Vos as he had already done so. I am, you are? I am at this point Anakin and Vos both knew that it was probably pointless trying to get her to say anything more. In a very small voice, one that Vos was unable to hear, but Anakin was, she said. I am pregnant. Anakin was shocked. Okay, maybe he knew that was going to happen sooner or later, as they had been going at it like bunnies. Sorry, you were what? Vos questioned as he was the only one left not knowing just yet. He didn't have Anakin 
Anakin's powerful sensory abilities. I said, I am pregnant. Isla finally said it loud enough for Vos to hear, and he should have expected like this to happen as well. Anakin and Isla were now connected and bonded through holy matrimony. What didn't make sense to Vos was how they could have a child without genetic manipulation involved to make the two compatible, whether that being they change themselves or go through an artificially made embryo. P pregnant, you say? Vos said as he was studied while Anakin didn't know what to say in this moment. Anakin did however know that he should probably show his affection for Isla, and probably at the very least show some excitement. Anakin embraced Isla in a hug and didn't say anything else. So, so, what does this mean exactly? Vos still seemed to be in denial that his adoptive daughter would become pregnant already. However, he should know as Anakin and Isla are both adults, and that the both of them are also not a part of the Jedi Order anymore as well. It means that I'm going to be a father, Anakin said as he felt quite complicated. It also means that I'm going to be a mother. Isla was incredibly happy as Anakin had embraced her, and had even declared to her father figure his intentions. Right, Vos was speechless as when he was coming here. He only wanted to check on his foster daughter, and what he didn't expect to be coming here, was to discover that she was now pregnant. She was about to become a mother of her own, well, within a few months that is, and if there are no complications. This would also mean there would be a child to be the new heir to the Emperor. It would probably also bring on some new dangers for Isla, and the new life growing within her as well. There are many that would want to go after Anakin or somehow affect the Emperor, some rather nefarious means. This meant because Anakin was someone that people were unable to harm. They may try and go after his children instead, where they would be completely and totally harmless and defenseless in the face of danger. This is the problem with having children, because they take a long time to develop physically enough to protect themselves, not to mention the mental and emotional requirements for a person to thrive. Anakin was conflicted, not because he didn't want to have children. No, he had already decided to go through with this decision, and he would not regret it. No, Anakin was just reminiscing his previous life and the things he was unfortunate enough to go through. While he may not properly remember the faces or places of his previous life, that didn't mean the feelings didn't exist. He was infertile in his previous life due to certain conditions, stopping from having a family of his own. He wasn't incapable or unable to get it on so to speak, but just had very bad luck. His body was failing him, failing him in many ways, and it started when he had developed the disease at the young age of five. He remembered not knowing what was going on, or what was happening to him at that time, and he knew he probably would have died, if it wasn't for his previous mother insisting and taking him to the doctors again and again. I mean, it may have been normal to wet one's own bed, but that doesn't mean at five where I had good bladder control. Would I do so Anakin thought to himself. He had gone for a few months without the doctors saying that there was something wrong. No blood tests were done, and he was only taken to the hospital after it had really gotten bad. Bad enough that he needed to be hospitalized for an entire month. This was the first instance of his previous telling him that he wasn't meant to live, and the only reason he did was because of his mother. Something that he couldn't thank her enough for, but he didn't even know her name and face anymore. Instead he had Shmai, and she just reignited all of those feelings from his past life. And if he didn't know any better, then he would say she was the reincarnation of his previous life's mother. Then there are things that only made things worse for the five-year-old him, which which was the death of a friend. A girl the same age he was, and he was friends with had died before his proper diagnosis, and she had died of cancer. Something incredibly tragic and saddening. But he didn't cry because in his childlike mind he would be joining her. Of course he didn't and would go on to experience having to inject himself with needles every day, just so he could stay alive. He was a good patient. A patient that when he started to be checked up on every three months, had him becoming a favorite due to his absolute perfect numbers. If Anakin was going to live through the pain of having an unknown disease, he believed that he should do so with utmost diligence, especially since it was his family that encouraged him to do so. So being the good son he was, he did exactly that who knew that no matter what one did things could and would only get worse. After a few years, in his previous life, Anakin would have some incidents revolving around the disease, and his sometimes lack of care. Then there was the reactions of the people around him when he told them, as they didn't care all that much and treated as normal, it was fine. Of course they would treat him differently subconsciously, especially since he would not look like the strongest of people, and instead was a pretty boy. Something that he had retained in his new life as Anakin, but instead of just looking weak like he was. Instead he was now looking pretty imposing. After his years of education within the system, Anakin would then be introduced to adult life with a nice little blood test. A test that should have been done a long while ago as he was starting to lose weight, and there were some other symptoms as well. Symptoms that he was aware of and had even yet again told the doctors about, specifically his doctors that helped him to manage his illness, and they said it was fine. Of course this was also his own fault as well, because he had lied about things as well. It wasn't like he was perfect and stayed the happy little child he was. After this blood test he was informed of his needing to change his diet, and that they hadn't checked for this disease in the two years since his graduation from high school. The secondary disease and the effects it had done to him was already substantial enough that it had made him completely infertile. In fact he could have died yet again, and if they hadn't caught on just in time he would have done just that, died. If they had done the testing and if he had also done his due diligence, he probably would have been perfectly fine and able to still have children of his own. He wouldn't have had to deal with these after effects, but even then, Anakin would have never had children himself out of the simple principle that he would somehow pass down the disease to his future children. That wasn't to say he didn't want a family of his own anymore. It was just something so demoralizing that it had completely floored him. Floored him so badly that he had given up on wanting a large family. 
where he could have many children of his own. Was it not the dream of every person to someday pass on their genetics, a desire born out of necessity, but also because it was something someone wanted to do, something to build and have children that one could love? For Anakin it may not have been everything, but he had bought into the idea of having a family. It was just that he would never have one, he only had his mother in his last life, before she had passed away when he had graduated. But he had also only had Shmai as his mother in his new life. No father figure or a father that was there at all in both. No grandparents or other relatives he knew of. He was completely alone. I don't have to worry about that now. Anakin thought to himself as he did have a tear turned down his face, which was something Isla had noticed. Arnie, are you okay? Isla sent through their bond love, affection and her care, concern and worry. It was something Anakin appreciated. I'm fine. I am perfectly fine. Anakin replied as he had made sure there was no tears left on his face for Quinlan to see. It wouldn't do well for his image within the presence of others. And while he didn't mind crying in the presence of his loved ones, he didn't want to do so in front of a stranger. Okay? As long as you're fine. I live you, Arnie. Isla said as she just hugged him tighter, trying to merge herself and their now developing child into him. I love you as well. Anakin replied with a heartfelt reply that was completely genuine, while the atmosphere between the two was ambiguous. This ambiguous atmosphere led to Quinlan feeling a bit awkward as he slowly started to remove himself from the room. It really wasn't his place to stay any longer, and he should allow the two of them to have their moment. I'll be going now. Those said but was ignored as Anakin and Isla were within their own world. It had begun. Roger, Roger. Multiple droids, battle and medical, were already hauled and shipped off to the Republic, where the Jedi visit to this new order had also ended. With some goodbyes that were both sad and somewhat left off with a bad taste in their mouths, the Jedi returned while Anakin and the girls went back to doing their own things. Specifically Isla was now, with the encouragement of knowing that Anakin was happy with this occurrence as well, could brag about being pregnant to all of the others. Something that wouldn't start any arguments, but instead would be the birth of the girls now wanting to compete with each other. Even Padme would give up her vow of not having children in the face of Isla now becoming pregnant. Unfortunately for Ahsoka, she would be left out of this competition, but that didn't mean she would be unable to do anything herself, and would try her best to show herself as an adult, making various attempts at trying to do the very lewd act of hand-holding with Anakin, which is where he would promptly deny her that opportunity multiple times. Anyway, that wasn't the most important part. The most important part was now that the war could continue, and Anakin would be making a profit because of it. When he had asked for the specific materials to create and reduce the costs of trying to supply the Republic, he had lied about how much he would need. He specifically wanted more than enough materials, so he could also start expanding upon his own standing army of droids. He was preparing himself and preparing the entirety of those from within the Emperor for the fallout of the Galactic Republic's falling out, and the Confederacy of Independent Systems falling out as well. Then that was not even taking into account the huts of whom would either be interested in what is going on from the galaxy at large, or be disinterested interested and not care enough to expand. Anakin had a feeling that it would be the former rather than the latter, as the Huts would no doubt be either trying to prepare themselves for Anakin and the Emperor, or they were just that uninterested. War. War never changes. This was pretty correct as it related to money. Of course it wasn't always just money, but instead people fought over things. But it always came down to resources. There are rare occasions like what the hell was happening with Palpatine, where he didn't exactly want more resources, but he wanted more power. More power for what? Anakin only knew that Palpatine's desires had to do with wanting immortality, just like his master before him. He obviously wanted more than that however, and it probably had to do with the idea of becoming the Sathari. Sathari was a title that, in the ancient Sith, meant Lord or Overlord first claimed by King Aedas. After Aedas' death, the term became the subject of a legend prophesying the coming of a being that would lead and destroy the Sith, but in doing so, would make the Sith more powerful than ever before. In this context, the term came to mean perfect being or God. The prophecy, which was in many ways similar to the Jedi prophecy of the Chosen One, retained its significance for the Dark Lords up until the time of the Order of the Sith. Now that I think about it, doesn't this kind of make me the Sithari? Anakin was turning into a godlike entity after all, and the Sithari prophecy also had connections or similarities to the Jedi's Chosen One. It almost fit all too perfectly, with Anakin right at the center of it all. This probably didn't mean all too much, but knowing the Force and how it worked, it may be that Anakin was both the Chosen One and the Sithari at the same time. Technically it is possible, but there are also a few things that Anakin didn't fill in for the Sithari prophecy in particular, one who has freed themselves from all restrictions has reached perfection, their potential fulfilled. Perfect strength, perfect power, perfect destiny. Anakin said aloud as he was within his room, meditating over recent events. This does kind of fit me however, the idea of perfection is kind of flawed. How so? A voice said as someone had seemingly come into his room. Anakin of course knew who this is, but didn't say anything else as he awaited for them to join him in his meditation session. While unorthodox to do so here, it was the only place she was willing to come and felt safest. Which it wasn't exactly a lie, but it did have something to do with Anakin as obviously she was infatuated at this point. Ahsoka, how nice of you to join me on time. Anakin replied as he floated, levitating off of the ground. It had become a normal occurrence by now, and Ahsoka had grown used to it. Anakin a lot of the time would allow Ahsoka her little victories over the other girls. Simply because while it is true he will not be getting into any relationship with her, not until she was older, that didn't mean he would ignore her. That would just be cruel, so he would continue to treat her as he usually did, with no change at all. Anakin didn't know if this hurt her more, or it actually made her feel relieved at knowing that he wouldn't treat her differently. Either way, 
he wouldn't change his decision. Yeah, yeah. It isn't like you like meditation as well, Ahsoka said with some sass. Well, I will have you know that I am always meditating. And what you see now is when I focus most of my effort and time into it. Anakin supplied, still with eyes closed, and as if he wasn't distracted by Ahsoka being within the room. Really? There was some doubt playful in nature when she replied. Yes, really. Hurry up now and start tempering yourself. With your temper and aggressive nature, I doubt that you would be able to last very long. Anakin stated to rile her up as it was best meditating, not when one was calm. But instead, he had found meditation was at its best when one was emotional. When one felt something is what would lead one to becoming calm or peaceful. What were you talking to yourself about anyway? Ahsoka sat down as she started to meditate as well, as she also was trying to reach a state where she could float above the ground magically like Anakin could. Just going over some other prophecy that didn't originate from the Jedi. I may have been named as the Chosen One, but that doesn't there aren't others or another that could be like me in a sense. Anakin said. He continued. There is also a chance that another prophecy would also apply to me as well. Just what kind of prophecy from the Sith would apply to you? The Chosen one Ahsoka did have some snark in her voice. Okay, okay. I can hear the snark in your voice. You can calm down now. There is no need to be so aggressive. Anakin replied calmly to her little bit of snark. Whatever, can you be quiet now? I am trying to meditate. If Ahsoka could, she would turn her back. But there was no need, as she would only need to close her eyes to stop seeing Anakin. Not that it would help her if she didn't want to sense his presence, as she would always be able to through the diet bond they share now. Sure, sure. Anakin waved her emotional state off, knowing that this was exactly what he wanted to achieve. Emotion is always a key factor to meditation, or at least he believed so, as there was much more drive or action when meditation began because of it. The real problem was channeling that emotion into the meditation itself, something that Anakin was trying to get Ahsoka to practice. By the way, don't you think that it is quite inappropriate for the both of us to be alone with each other within my bedroom? Anakin asked Ahsoka as he wanted to know her thoughts. Abu, what do you mean? Of course she knew what he meant. It was just that she was trying to play dumb. She didn't just ask Anakin to meditate within his bedroom for no reason after all, and she could be quite cunning herself sometimes. She did after all come from the same species shocked he was from, and going by her behavior, Ahsoka may have some of the same tendencies of being a predator. Oh, nothing, nothing. I just thought it would have been better for the two of us to practice somewhere else. Anywhere else really. Anakin continued implying that they should do this training session somewhere else. Of course not. I think staying here is the be best. She was cracking under the pressure. Humming, Anakin doesn't break from his meditative form and says, Well, if you say so. Of course he knew why she wanted to get him alone, and that is exactly why when she brought up the idea of the two training within his huge bedroom, he had decided to instead make it about meditation instead of physical exercise. This was the best way, at least to him, to mitigate whatever she is trying to do and otherwise redirect whatever energies, emotions or feelings into the meditative session instead. He was not stupid, and he was not dense. Or, at least he believed he wasn't. Now back on to meditating about this whole Chosen One and Safari prophecies business. Anakin then started to tune out Ahsoka, and instead focus on what he was doing before. She would have to face and deal with her own problems, by herself, just as he would have to confront the possibility of himself being a part of this prophecy as well. While the original Anakin would have minimal connection to the Safari prophecy, and could still fulfill his own prophecy of the Chosen One, the current Anakin could see where he could fit into those lines. The Safari prophecy was considered too sacred to be put into writing by the Kisai, who passed it on verbally from generation to generation. Sorza Sin recorded it thus. Around 6900 years prior to now, the Sathari will be free of limits. It was here that Anakin was starting to see that he was free of all limits, whether that be the limits of society, the limits within himself, his physical and spiritual form. Then there was consideration for Anakin's limits within the Force, and how he was exactly pushing himself through those limits, and turning himself into the Force itself. It was fitting a little too well. But as always when it came to prophecies, they could and would be interrupted in various ways. The Sathari will lead the Sith and destroy them. This could also apply to him as well, because while Palpatine is technically the one and only Sith Lord, there is however Xana, Renala, Allison, and other rogue dark side users, that may or may not be considered part of a Sith. Especially Xana who would still consider herself both a Sith, and now as a part of his faction as well. Again, more interpretation was at work. But Anakin could very clearly see the possibilities, and the chances of him being connected to this prophecy increase. The Sathari will raise the Sith from death, and make them stronger than before. Now, even more interesting was the fact that this could be taken in more ways than one, where Anakin would lead the Sith, that being those dark side practitioners within the Emperor and Order, and then destroy those Sith outside of his order being Palpatine and those Sith under him, Anakin would fulfill that part in a way. Since it also lines up with his destiny of the Chosen One, they technically don't both conflict at all. The idea of raising the Sith from the dead and then making them stronger fit all too well with Anakin as well. He raised Xana from the dead, and had made her stronger as well, through her now died connection to him. Then there is also the fact that he was increasing or strengthening dark side practitioners within his own order as well. What is this? Anakin thought as he came across a vision of the past. A past that included Darth Plague saying some words that are better fit for himself. Like smoke, and kind of like what you would see when viewing a memory through someone's eyes. Anakin was starting to see things through the eyes of Plague Prophecies are generally wishful thinking. The fact that the Sith created their own savior myth is predictable, yet these predictions seem uniquely specific to the actions I am taking now. 
I am not a creature of superstition, but if the robes of the safari fit, I see no reason not to claim them. Anakin couldn't help but agree more with what Plagueis had said as while he was evil just like Sidious, and had manipulated events to how they were within the Republic today. That didn't mean his wisdom is invalid. Sometimes even in the greatest of evil acts does one find something that they wouldn't have found before. Of course, evil should not be done, but one must not look at the act while leaving up the build-up. Once one is left at the act, one would not know what the cause of such an act to happen. No build-up, no nothing. Context was always key, and sometimes that context was bad, while sometimes what was the result of that context may have been alright. However, one needs to think things through, and not always take things at face value. Anakin had said Plague's words aloud, meaning that Ahsoka could hear him say these things, which did disturb her. While her plan may have failed, that didn't mean she wouldn't try and get something out of this failed exchange. So she was at the very least trying to make sure she mastered whatever Anakin was trying to teach her. That was until he was speaking strangely. Hey! She called out with her eyes still closed, and her brow furrowed. What? Anakin asked, confused. Can you at the very least keep that weird stuff going on within your head? Stay within your head. Ahsoka asked so kindly and nicely, that Anakin couldn't help but reply. Maybe. You know, I may love you all the more now, and I may dislike you rejecting me. But that doesn't mean you have to annoy me as well. Maybe. Anakin said again, with his eyes closed and a serene expression upon his face as if he had found peace. Ahsoka didn't say anything else and just harumphed before going back to meditation. Anakin did so as well, but this time decided to do some other things, like actually helping Ahsoka get into the swing of things. He had after all disturbed her, and a little push from him would certainly direct her towards the correct place she needed to be. After the whole debacle with the Jedi and the Galactic Republic, things were starting to heat up. Only mildly however, and it wasn't anything to do with the fight between the Republic and Confederacy, but instead, some small battles were starting to take place between the Emperor and the Hearts. There were some other things to get out of the way first, so we would start there as Anakin needed to recount what he was going after. There were some star systems that he could start expanding to, as he was now getting extra materials from the Republic, and this would allow him to speed up the process of takeover. He would be taking most of the star systems within his sector, the immediate part of his sector anyway. Then, now that Naboo had been integrated into the Emperor as well, as per the deal, the Republic had to let them go. Not that the Naboo and Gungan within that star system even needed to listen to the commands to the Republic. If possible, he would have also made an ultimatum against the Republic if they hadn't let Nabi go. He knew that Palpatine was probably seething right now. It kind of brought a smile to his face. The sadistic bastard that he was reveled in Sidious's demise. With two new points, or planets and star systems that he could start expanding from, Anakin would start to be able to take over even more areas. Hopefully they would also have some things of importance as he was investing Stargates into both Dathomir and Nabu. One had already been constructed on Dathomir, but now he needed to make one on Naboo as well. First Anakin would start off from his home territories, and then explain what planets he would quietly take over in the surrounding systems of Naboo and Dathoma. The first thing of note here was the planet of Tanunga, an ocean world with some mountains that pierced through the walls and created small caves and grottos. It wasn't really worth it, but from what Anakin could understand there would always be something of worth within something. For now, he would turn it into a world where mainly aquatic species within his empire can live. There was really nothing else to add, other than its potential to increase trade with the intentions of fishing. Second there was Cyrus II, that came after Tarnunga. The Cyrus system would further expand his mineral and ore deposits, specifically as a mining world for Centonium. Then there was Kubi, an industrial world that was located within the Arcanist sector of the galaxy's Outer Rim Territories region. The planet lay on the hyperlanes called the Old Corellian Run and the Vashian Way, and it was better known as a stopover for spice smugglers. This place would just become another place to make use of spice trade and industrial activities. It would be somewhere that would give his people something to do, as people who are bored can create problems for themselves. He knew all too well about the consequences of not keeping his people entertained through any means necessary. The problem came back to Issa, but Anakin had foreseen the problems with this planet as the Republic had it under his control. He had also asked for Issa, as it was a key point in stopping his expansion outwards. It was just a simple, but powerful industrial planet and system. In taking it, again it would give people a purpose. Piriket, a trading planet located within the Arcanist sector of the Outer Rim, that was controlled by a boat and shipping company. That was until Anakin had offered them a deal they couldn't refuse. A deal that was just money, wealth, etc. They didn't want anything else as they were a business, a business that was currently looking to have other ventures. Which just so happened to allow Anakin to expand into another part of the Arcanist sector. If Anakin wanted to, there really wasn't much for the Republic to stop him from taking over planets that were under their control from them. Especially now. But that would start to lead to him needing to face off against the rest of the galaxy. Something that while he alone didn't mind, but he had to think about his subjects, his people. There was no way he was about to put everyone at risk, because he wanted to control just one more planet and instead would expand slowly where some might say he was doing so insidiously. So Malirian was off-limits. It was unfortunate, but there wasn't really anything else in between the next system and after it. So it was an acceptable loss, and some might be wondering why he didn't try and ask a Republic for this system. It was because if he expanded too close to the center of the Republic, they might start to get paranoid. Paranoid enough to question Anakin's intentions as he would be encroaching on their territory more and more. It was at this point that Anakin could consider himself the overlord of the Arcanist sector, and most of the galaxy would recognize this as well. It was completely under the control of the Emperor and as nearly all of the planets, or at least 70% of them were under him, under the Emperor, now onto the systems surrounding Naboo. 
Well, there was really only one planet and system of interest within the sector Nabu resided in. It was just a vast space of, well, empty space. How unfortunate for them. However, Nabu did have something that Anakin would most certainly like to start mass producing. Plasma. All Nabu seemed to import for themselves was food, processed food and technology. Which is something that the Emperor and the planets connected to the Emperor have an abundant amount of. Meaning, that they wouldn't have to worry about their biggest concerns, which were food and tech. Anakin would like them to focus more on plasma and there was the Miller flower, which had a calming effect. This would be best used for agents, whether it be for themselves or on berserking sense. It could also be used on people they would interrogate, as it could be used to mess with someone's mind. The rest of the things they can make, which were cultural items, wine and grains, were things that were relatively unneeded. But it would definitely start to increase the sense of luxury those within the Empire would feel. Finally, we end on Dathoma, or the Quelly Sector, where there is also again nothing of too much importance to note. However, Anakin did take over a Morris Quelly and Drachma, worlds of which there was nothing of importance. Maybe some historical importance. But Anakin decided because of how bad they were, he would give this sector control over to the Night Sisters. You see, he was in control of the entire Empire at this point, and was reaching a certain limit due to the problem of physical distance. He would be unable to continuously keep taking and increasing his own domain size. So, now that Talzin was a queen of her own, he would give some planets to his vassal, even when they were not as good as the developed places within the main Emperor and homelands. That didn't mean the Night Sisters would be unable to thrive in that sector. They had been doing so under the harsh conditions they lived in. So Anakin decided that while he keep an eye on what they were doing, it would be best to delegate. He didn't want to have to do all of the work. Delegation should be at the top of a leader's skill list after all. Okay men, this mission is important. We are here to scout out the area, and not come into contact with any of those that would be considered a part of this heretical empire. A massive soldier, a synth with a distinct look, armor and markings of the emperor was speaking to his men. Yes, sir. Many people exclaimed back, making sure not to cause too much noise as they were here as a recon mission for the emperor. For the god emperor, the captain of the mission exclaimed which got a response. For the god emperor, a response from multiple of the men there as they were considered fanatics for the emperor. Or, that is what they would at least be called because of their behavior. They were on Unigen, a minor trade planet. It was located within the Unigen system of the Arnisal sector, a part of the slice portion of the Outer Rim territories. The planet lay on the hyperlane called the Holocene Run, which connected it to the worlds of Tick and Sivirus. A smaller hyperspace route also connected Unigen to the planet Ryaleb. Due to Unigen's location near Hut space, starships that prepared to enter or leave that region frequently stopped at the planet. They were here because Anakin has had enough waiting, and instead wanted to make sure and scout out what the Huts might have. Not only has Anakin had enough time waiting, but so has those within his army, as even though they are more so meant for defense, that doesn't mean that they couldn't get aggressive. While this may seem detrimental, it is probably the best and easiest time for the Emperor to not expand, but to declare a war. A war that would force the Huts into signing a contract with the Emperor, that they would do as he says. One might wonder what Anakin wants the Huts to do, and that is quite simple. Since he wants to go to war with them, they must have something valuable to him that he wants, and that is to make them free all of their slaves. He thinks that if he waits any longer, the suffering of the people that haven't had a chance to yet come to Emperor will continue to suffer. Of course, he wouldn't openly declare why he is going to war with the Huts, as that could give them a reason to hold the slaves as hostages. He needed to make it seem he wanted to go after them for another reason, and that he was only retaliating, while the treaty that would force them to outlaw slavery would only be secondary. Politics is a scary thing, and giving your potential enemies your weakness, would make it easier for them to do what they wanted. It would also be harder for Anakin or anyone from within the Emperor to act because they were not perfect. Of course, he could always go after their leader, but like always, the Huts would just grow another head. There were many, many of their species and many, many families that could easily take over the leadership position from within the Huts. So, Anakin needed to make sure they were alive and that their leaders stayed the same, at least for now. We must move in slowly. Because the Huts don't have control of this planet and it is not considered a part of their space, we will make this choke point ours. The captain said to all of the men as their new mission was to secure this planet. Planet. They would have to do this by destroying and getting all of the rats and heathens to come out. The smugglers that have set up here. The criminals. Where do we strike first sir? One of the soldiers questioned as they needed or more like wanted to get into the action already. Here. Here and here. Teams Beta and Delta are already at this two hideouts. We, Team Alpha are going to get the main spot. Once this is taken, we will then start the plan for what needs to happen next. I heard that the God Emperor is intending to go to war with the Heathen Huts. Is this correct? Not everyone within the army is always told of what was going on, as good soldiers follow orders. You are correct. Now, focus on the mission at hand. We must not fail the God Emperor. The captain redirected the conversation to what was going on, their task at hand. We rejoined this troop of soldiers, with all of their newfound power, gifted by the Emperor himself that he would even sacrifice himself to torture himself and give them pieces, small as they may be for them to have these new and extremely powerful bodies. When one worded it like that, it was no wonder these men, the living droids that had now become these modified sense, were so loyal, devoted in whatever word could be used to describe how they were. Go in. Yes, sir. Entering the bar. That doubled as the main hideout as there was an entire underground bunker hidden just underneath. They were quite imposing. The rowdy noise from within the bar stops as those people within look to see huge, armored men within power armor. They were incredibly tall compared to all of them, and it was lucky enough that their heads didn't touch the ceiling. It was only 3 meters off of the ground after all, and these men were all around 2.4 meters tall. We are here for the heathens. 
The captain said, not realizing that no one here would know what he is talking about. Heathens. There are no heathens here dash amen tried to speak but, having identified that he was reaching for his weapon, the captain shot him down. Then and there, any resistance to our orders will be met with aggressive use of force. The captain wanted to do this as peacefully as possible. But, if there was going to be any bloodshed, he had orders that it was completely fine as well. Because most people that were here, were either working with the heathen criminals, or with the criminal heathens. Hey, you can't just do dash another bites the dust. No, Frank. Someone screamed as he went for his own gun. Mark, don't do it. Someone else screamed towards the man to not do anything. But it was too late. I'm gonna kill you all. Mark was unfortunately gunned down. Silence, and another one down, and another one down. Another one bites the dust. After this small silence everyone is tense as the hulking and imposing emperor and soldiers make their rounds around. Everything here seems clear, sir. A soldier said to the captain of Team Alpha. Good, let's go down. But before that, the captain turned around to see everyone within this bar were unmoving. Whether this be due to shock, or fear, or anything else. At this moment none made a move. Die. However, it would seem that everyone here, including the barmaids and other females, were a part of the criminal group here meaning that they should die for their insolence. Kill them, the captain told his men as the shots from these criminals was absorbed easily by their armor. Armor upgraded too to withstand shots from blast rounds. But of course it isn't perfect. But it is more than enough to deal with low caliber weapons like these heathens have. Ugh, Barbara, no. You killed my favorite war dash, and this man went down just like everyone was from within. Someone that wasn't a part of the fight was the woman behind the bar. She pressed a button that sent out a signal to those underneath. The emperor and soldiers will have a fight it would seem as they go downwards. Having taken care of the heathens within the main bar, the front shop, the synth marines decided that they should head in deeper, given that there is no speck of life or living creature within the bar. None but them alone. Sir, I do believe that there are none left alive. A soldier reported as he said this to his captain. Good, make use of the force that the god emperor has given us. Using this you should be able to tell whether or not those within this place have been purged. The captain replied as he looked around at the devastation. There was no going back now. Not how things have been before is this planet would come under the control of the Emperor. The Emperor would not use this as a place for its citizens like all of the others, and would instead make it a base with which would be used against the huts. There would be no one to stop them, and there would be no one to build a Stargate here. Anakin wouldn't do so because it is only to be occupied for a short while. Long enough to where he could fabricate claims of the huts doing wrong to the Emperor, and then using these claims he would attack. Force them into signing a treaty while him as the sole benefactor. Going deeper into the base, the captain and the rest of Team Alpha easily breached the defenses that had been activated because of that woman alerting those underneath. Having not needing to think much about anything anymore, the captain and the men just go on a killing spree, slaughtering people left, right, center, down and above. None were left alive as they wanted to make this place clear as soon as possible. Well, they didn't kill absolutely everyone as there were some slaves that needed to be freed. They were easily freed as those within had the capabilities to use Mekuderu, which deactivated the implanted bombs within them. They were subjected to unthinkable and thinkable horrors, where the criminals did things that were best left unsaid. To think that the heathens would do this. The captain thought to himself as the soldiers were also trained in using healing-based abilities through the force. They started to repair and heal what they could with some soldiers needing to leave as well. There was no way all of them could stand the sight of it. Not because they thought of the slaves as below them or were disgusted by what had happened, but instead they were like this because it made their blood boil over. They didn't want their bloodlust activating over these things, so some of them needed to leave, because they were both a danger to themselves and others. Right, I guess we are done here. Let's try and support Team Speed and Delta, if they need the help. The captain communicated with those other soldiers through his communication device. Roger. A. Okay. Yes, sir. Many voices replied with their own reply of confirmation. For the God Emperor. For the God Emperor. They would chant this for a while, as their fervor and zealotry only increased as they were reaffirmed in their beliefs. That Anakin was doing the right thing. Why? Just look at the poor enslaved people that deserve freedom, justice and liberty. Within the Hutt Empire, the Hutts were completely unawares of what was happening on one of the planets that were not a part of their space. There was an entire war, or mini skirmish happening just outside of their doorstep, and they didn't seem to be none the wiser about the situation. There was no panic, no hesitancy and no reaction to such an event taking place. No, instead they were too busy doing their own things within their own time. Whether that be tacking and making money or using and abusing the slaves that they have created within their territories. Millennia ago, we were idolized by the younger species. We brought a golden age to a million worlds. The Hutts would say as they remembered their good old days. The Hutt Empire was a large pre-Republic Empire in the Outer Rim. That arose to be a galactic power. The Empire was founded and ruled by the Hutts using economic means as a way to control its population. It rose to power after the fall of the Infinite Empire. That was founded before the formation of the Republic. That was once the dominant power in the galaxy. But its power would fade, forcing it to adopt a new philosophy known as Kajidic, and to advocate indirect control through commerce. And, as it developed, the criminal underworld, the Hutt Cartel, while the crime lords continued to maintaining their political base as means to an end. The Hutt Cartel, also known in plural as the Hutt Cartels or alternatively as the Hutt Clan or Clans, was a powerful criminal family, or business alliance of Hutt families in the galaxy, making riches through smuggling and myriad illegal businesses across worlds. Aside from its criminal activity, the Hutt Cartel ruled over swathes of territories known as Hutt Space. 
After the devastating civil war known as the Hutt Cataclysms, the Hutt Empire collapsed, the Hutt's clans re-established themselves the Hutt Cartel, under the leadership of Badhila Hestilakamora, who adopted a new philosophy known as Kajidic, a renunciation of war and conquest instead advocating indirect control through commerce. It was certainly the smart move, by taking control of the economy, especially within their own areas, it would make it near impossible for others within to rise up against them. During the time of the Great Galactic War, the Hutt Cartel was displeased with the Sith Emperor, because he did not include them in his plans and intrigues. However, due to the subterfuge of Imperial Intelligence agents, the Republic was unsuccessful in gaining the Hutt's support against the Empire. The Cartel remained neutral in the war, like most others in the criminal underworld. During the Cold War, the Hutt Cartel owned and ran the Holonet and the Network Access Division on Nar Shadda, which was operated by Kabura. Around 3600 years prior to now, the new Supreme Mogul, Taboru, led the cartel's invasion of the planet Maka, and Imperial and Republic forces began to arrive on the planet with their own agendas. With their empire now a semi-republic of their own, they could both be as open as they were, and as quiet as they were with the things they do. This included the slave trade that was happening and frequented the Outer Rim worlds. Now, during the times of the Clone Wars, there was someone within that was stirring things up from within. Booker the Hutt held considerable power in the cartel. During the Clone Wars he cooperated with Severance 10 during the early days of the war, after he gathered information about the Decimator, a Republic superweapon which was still in development. He was annoyed by the Galactic Republic public's trade activity near his territory, and agreed to reveal their secret plan to the Separatists. He would have also lost most of his forces, except for a few mercenaries for turning against Jabba. Instead, he would be protected by the Separatists. As a reward, he would give them information about the Decimator, provided that someone destroyed the Republic spaceport. Booker would then later be killed by Republic forces during the Second Battle of Tatooine. The Republic would be deeply encouraged to do so by Jabba the Hutt, after he offered them a 5,000 Nova Crystal bounty to kill him. With all of this information at hand, Anakin could use this to his advantage as well, given that Booker still wanted all of this to happen as well. Now that it was Anakin that was in control, Booker would be unable to do the things he wanted. He would have to try and set up some sort of deal with Anakin, and by doing this, Anakin would be able to leverage his position on Booker's greed and anger to get him into hut space. Booker was a male hut crime lord with a masculine personality who operated on the planet Tatooine at this time frame. Around the time of the outbreak of the Clone Wars between the Galactic Republic and the Confederacy of Independent Systems, Booker received information from Bajiga Buding, an operative on the planet Eridan Prime, about a new series of superweapons that the Republic was building known as the Decimators. Unfortunately for both of the Hutt Cartel and Booker, they couldn't operate within Anakin's territories, the territories of the Emperor, and neither could the Republic really, as well. So instead of people trying to go after the Republic, specifically the Separatists to go after whatever spaceport that is under the control of the Republic, Booker would go towards the Separatists to see if they could attack the Emperor. He would obviously fail in his negotiations as the Separatists, specifically Dooku and Anakin had an agreement and some level of understanding with each other. Anakin didn't contact Dooku all too often to tell him or get information from him, as that could be dangerous, and instead decided to do so only on a very infrequent basis. It would be something silly for him to do. What interested Anakin, however, was that if he crippled the Republic here, with their research into this battleship known as Decimators, it would give him an easier time in the future. There is also the fact he had to consider what the Hearts would do with him taking over a planet so close to their territories. The Decimator was a war machine developed by the Galactic Republic at the start of the Clone Wars. Equipped with shields and a long-range turbo laser that could target air and ground vehicles, the Decimator could engage and defeat craft as large as the all-terrain tactical enforcer. They were also able to ferry infantry around the battlefield, protecting them within the confines of the Decimator, though the vehicle itself was slow. Developed at a secret testing facility located on Eridan Prime and constructed at Alaris Prime by Wookiees, the Decimator was considered one of the most powerful combat vehicles of its era. However, before the Republic could use them, the Decimators were stolen by the Confederate General Severance Tan. Tan used them to capture the energy-producing world Serapin, striking fear into the inhabitants of the Core Worlds due to the ensuing blackouts. Her campaign provoked the Republic to send Jedi Master Echu Shen John to hunt down Tan and her Decimators. Shen John ultimately succeeded at the Battle of Krant, and the Decimators saw no further action in the Clone Wars, meaning that it was all up for the taking, all ready to be swallowed whole by the Emperor and to take and to redevelop these special war machines for further and future use. Anakin wanted to be wholly prepared when he needed to start taking control over both the center of the galaxy, and for when the Yuuzhan Vong came. There is also this little tiny, small thing known as the Hutt Cartel, standing in the way of total galactic unification, but Anakin would wait for now. If everything was going according to plan, then he should be able to completely defend himself and the Emperor from any attackers, whether they be from the broken and shattered Republic, the Hutts or even the Separatists in the future. There is also the Yuuzhan Vong, but that threat was so far away for now, that he wouldn't have to worry about it. That was what he thought of at least, because there was going to be massive things shaking up the time stream. There was no way, for sure, to know whether or not everything will stay the same. Not with Anakin's influence and his indirect influence through touching others as well. If what he predicts will happen, it is also entirely possible that the Yuuzhan and Vong could try and come early as well. Back to the Decimators, as they would be added to the droid armies. The characteristics were the Decimator's body was roughly rectangular in shape, save for a tower that rose from the rear of the vehicle along its midline. Just in front of the tower, in the center of the vehicle, was a large red orb that served a purpose in the firing mechanism. Even when not firing, energy circulated through the orb in green waves. When the weapon was activated, the energy would coalesce, causing the orb to glow a brilliant green. 
before launching a single, focus green beam toward its target. Decimators were described by historians as having giant turbo laser cannons as their main weapons. Each decimator was comparable in size, armor, and firepower to the largest Republic vehicles in service at the start of the Clone Wars, such as the All-Terrain Tactical Enforcer. It was also described as possessing tremendous destructive power. Besides their firepower, decimators also possessed the ability to transport up to 10 infantry, and were sheathed in thick layers of armor, as well as protective deflector shields. However, for all their firepower and armor, decimators were restricted to operating from land, and could not float over water or lava, nor could they directly cross over cliffs or thick forests, despite possessing repulsor lifts for propulsion. Its role would be with its powerful shields turbo laser and thick armor, the decimator was suited to frontline combat. It could easily defeat comparable vehicles in combat relying on its shields to absorb damage. The decimator's weapon was limited to firing at just one target at a time, and had to charge before it could fire again, which meant that getting off the first shot against comparable vehicles was not assured. The unique weapon of the decimator could traverse the beam itself electronically, though without need to traverse the emitter to hit aircraft as well though it still had to charge between discharges. The slow speed of the decimator and low firing rate meant that it was better equipped to combat other frontline assault vehicles rather than greater quantities of swifter adversaries. In particular, opponents that could close inside the firing arc of the decimator's main weapon, such as Jedi or close-range assault troops, were able to avoid its significant firepower. However, the ability to ferry 10 additional infantry inside the decimator meant that it could augment its defense by deploying these soldiers if the vehicle was threatened. Everything going according to plan, Anakin thought to himself as he started to receive a message, a message that would start off something amazing terribly amazing. Everything going according to plan Anakin thought to himself as he started to receive a message, a message that would start off something amazing, terribly amazing. So, do what do I owe the pleasure? Anakin asked as the also might Sith, but not Sith Lady, had come into his throne room and approached him. Pleasure. And who said I was here to give you any pleasure at all? Xana raised an eyebrow as she replied to Anakin. Are you thinking dirty thoughts? Why would I want you to quote unquote pleasure me? Anakin said as both he and she were well aware that they both shared a dire bond. At this point, Anakin had already explained to her the implications of what it meant, which in turn made her angry. Who wouldn't be angry as this was basically chaining herself to him, through the way of a Sith. It would mean she is limiting herself, and of course Anakin though all saw this in a different light. Sighing, Xana decides to move on the subject as she knew that she wouldn't get anywhere. She had grown to know more about Anakin the more time she had spent here, and in fact she was wondering to herself more and more why she didn't leave. It was entirely possible that her leaving has something to do with the diet, but she wasn't sure or was it really, because she also believed that it was the correct decision. Well, I have come here because I want to talk about that thing, Xana says as she had a small blush come across her face. That thing? Anakin asked her, not knowing what she was thinking. You know that thing. Xana seemed to also be getting annoyed at Anakin's inability to read her mind. It wasn't like he wasn't able to, but at the same time he also wasn't going to just go into the minds of just anyone. Especially without their express permission of course he would still do so for some exemptions to that rule. I am afraid that I do not know what you are talking about. Anakin said in a nonchalant manner. Can't you just read my mind? Xana really was seeming frustrated at this point and seemed to be paranoid that there were holes in the walls. It wasn't like this place was insecure and in fact was probably the most secure place in the world as Anakin had made sure to keep it that way. First it was constructed for the safety of his mother, and now it was used to house his wives and friends, and lastly, it would be used to house his budding family. With a new addition on the way, Anakin was making sure to speed things up to where he could have children in a relatively safe period of time. What is so embarrassing that you don't even want to say it aloud? Anakin stated as he had gotten permission, but because he was enjoying her self-torment, he would instead wait for her to blurt it out herself. Xana has had enough and just stared at Anakin, making use of their bond and in doing so, increasing her own and Anakin's affection for each other. At the same time, she was stubborn enough to do this because she also wanted him to know of what she was talking about. Oh, you want to know more about that well? This Anakin was referring to the diet bond itself as Xana still seemed to either be confused, in denial or was a mixture of both. Let me explain it to you in terms that your barbarian mind will understand. Anakin wasn't attempting to speak down to her but wanted to invigorate her emotions in a way that got a reaction. Something was better than nothing, as that indicated that they had nothing between the two of them, and Anakin wanted to know just how much he could rile the dark side user up. She was very over-reliant on the dark side, and Anakin wanted to show her that the path of the Sith was in this wrong. Not to, uh, be biased or anything, but that Sith have done a lot of shit stuff even with whatever benefits they may happen to bring to the table. The same could be said about the Jedi, but instead of indirect benefits, they caused indirect harm. A bear in mind. I am not stupid, you are Xana snapped back in quite the calm tone, as it would seem her anger wasn't the explosive kind, but it was instead much more focused. I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you. I just wanted to point out something that you seem to be overlooking from within yourself. Anakin said as a peace offering. And what could that be? Xana subconsciously knew her problem, but that didn't mean she was going to straight away openly address the matter. Anakin had two options available to him in this instance, where the first option is he forces her to work through her problems. The second is slow, but he would coax her into admitting herself that she is in the wrong, and that she is at fault or has some faults that originate from her Sith teachings. Well, I don't think we should go into it right now. Instead, why don't we get back to what you wanted to know of? 
Anakin that began to explain more about the Dire Bond to her, and how he is in fact connected to more than her. Obviously this was both confusing and a bit hurtful to know that even when she found her chosen one, she would have to share him amongst other things. It wasn't the fact that she was connected that got to her, but the fact that it was Anakin of all people. Someone that she never would have had a chance to connect with, because what are the chances of him coming across her in hell? It was all based on chance or luck. But she knew better than that, and knew that this was probably all planned by the Force. Free will. She knew that didn't exist with something like the Force around. But that didn't mean she was just about to give up and surrender herself to this power. It was also the reason behind why she was so against what a dyad was even when the origins of a dyad existed within the Sith. Way, way back when the Sith didn't even follow the rule of two. Way back when the Sith were nothing more than a splinter group from the Jedi who had become the Jedi. I don't like what this is or what it means. But I see that you, yourself and the rest of those girls you are connected to don't seem to mind, Xana finally said after Anakin in depth explained the dyad and his situation in relation to her and the others. Really. You would think that I enjoyed the idea of being connected with them, despite the advantages. I have no control over the connection, they have no control over me or the connection as well. The Force interfered with my life, and it has done so to you as well, Anakin said. He continued, the reason why I'm fine with this is because of what I discovered. Yeah, yeah. Compatibility and all that, Senna said as she gazed into Anakin's eyes for a split second longer than she should have. It didn't help that Anakin was attractive to her, even without the bond she may have tried to get him to be her lover. And it probably would have been more than a fake lover with that man she used ages ago. Yes, and it is the fact that I can love them. That I can love them all, and that themselves can also accept the situation. It isn't like polyamory or polygamy doesn't already exist out within the galaxy at large. Anakin said as he saw that Xana seemed to have some embarrassment for looking at him too much. Which was silly, but that was her problem, not his. Anakin was of the opinion that while someone could be the cause of someone feeling a certain way, that didn't mean just because they were the cause, that they were a fault. If someone had an emotion that he didn't reciprocate, it wasn't that it was his fault, but instead it was their emotions, not his. He can read minds and sense emotions, but he doesn't do so often. At least, not when it comes to strangers and his family. At that point he would just be in violation of their respective boundaries, whatever they may be. You sound stupid, and at the same time like some sort of hopeless romantic. Not everyone will see it your way, especially those that dislike relationships like the one you have Xana said to Anakin. You mean someone like you. Anakin gave her a pointed look that indicated that she was self-projecting. No, Xana shook her head, but internally she knew that it was a yes. I can't give up any of the girls for you. I wouldn't sacrifice myself for anyone else as well. Just as those I love shouldn't sacrifice themselves for me. I won't give any of them up for one or the other, because that just isn't how I work. Anakin stated, there is sometimes more to things, and sometimes it is simple and basic. I just want them as I love them all in that manner. But because I am a hypocrite, I also don't want to share them with anyone else, and keep them to myself. Anakin continued, so you admit it yourself, huh? Xana said as she then looked down, thinking about what he had just said. There is no need to go too in depth with how it works, or why they haven't gotten overly jealous with each other. There are a few reasons, and probably one of the best reasons I can give you with me sounding narcissistic here, is that I am able to love them all equally, Anakin left off as he wanted Xana to hear what he was saying properly. Look at him when I am talking to you. I want you to know, because if I someone failed to portray my feelings through my actions, then you should hear them, listen to them through my words. Anakin stated and Xana came out of her own thoughts. Okay, okay, I am listening. Xana replied as she was now looking anywhere else, but Anakin, as she most certainly didn't want to look into his eyes, or view his form at all. Instead she just focused on his forehead, as that made things easier. Well, not equally as that would indicate that I have reached the same level within a romantic relationship with all of them. I haven't as that is. Not impossible, but because of who I have started to love first, and when I had gotten into a relationship any of them, that was when my feelings and theirs could start to take off. Anakin continued. So what you're saying is is that for you and I to have a relationship and start having proper emotions or feelings for each other, we would have to have a start something. Xana saying, if she really got the gist of everything. Yes. Anakin answered. Technically, we could always try dating first because eventually, both you and I know that we will be together in the end. You sound so sure of yourself Xana left off. I am, because I have still not found a way to break a dire bond. I cannot manipulate it, destroy or create one. Anakin stated simply. You say that now. But in the future I am sure that if you had a way to create more, you would. Xana said as she was now much more relaxed into their conversation. And how do you know that? What makes you so sure that I would just go up to anyone, any girl? and make the mine out of nowhere. I just have this vibe that you would try to do something like that. Xana answered. You feeling is wrong here. I wouldn't just create a dyad between myself and another simply because I wanted them. No, I would create a dyad between myself and someone else, because I both want them, love them in some capacity, and have their express permission to do so. Anakin said before continuing. There are conditions that are also unseen as well Anakin finished. Yeah. I am sure. Xana didn't seem to believe that Anakin would act in a manner remotely similar to what he had just said. Do you take me to be some sort of man whore? Anakin stated as Xana didn't answer, but instead had a small blush adorning her cheeks, because she had been assaulted by the physical and mental feelings through the bond a few times. Whenever Anakin would go at it with one of his lovers, he mostly focuses on keeping those feelings from reaching Ahsoka, who is now connected through the bond. So every else who is connected to him through the bond, would have to suffer through the pleasure he feels, and his current lover feels as well. Well I guess that explains what you think of me. Anakin's side of silence could act as an answer, 
matter. It is not that an action can explain things, but so too does an action. This apply to words as well, where saying something may fill the silence, but that didn't mean it actually meant anything. Instead, sometimes silence can speak more and give off feelings that are much more prominent if one had tried to speak. I do hope that you understand that I can't exactly block off the connection, right? Anakin said in a tone that indicated that he didn't really like that she thought of him like that. Not because it wasn't true, but because wouldn't that mean the others might dislike it as well? I think I will have to ask them about it later on tonight. He thought to himself as he waited for Xana to answer him. Xana just glared at him as while it was pleasurable. That didn't mean she wanted to experience such pleasure 24-7. Not because she didn't want to but because a girl's got to sleep sometime, right? She isn't like Anakin, who somehow has the absolute stamina of a god or of some divine entity. You know, a girl's got to sleep as well. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't do it all of the time, every single day night. Xana answered Anakin. I don't know about that. That seems Anakin could control himself. But that didn't mean it wasn't extremely hard, and he is thankful that he had multiple women at the same time. If he didn't have many lovers, he doesn't think he would be able to be physically satisfied, not with his energy. Sighing, Xana then says, That was all I wanted to ask you about, and I guess you guess. Anakin asked, seeing she left off. I, I guess that I could try and do this dating thing, that some of the girls within the academy seem to like or enjoy. I wouldn't mind having a beautiful woman on a date myself. Anakin replied as he smiled at her, which did manage to slightly charm her. Right? I got to go now. She rushed off, feeling embarrassed, leaving Anakin. On the planet of Unigen, a planet that the Emperor currently occupies, there was something of interest happening. The huts had been getting reports from people that the Emperor has now come knocking on their doorstep, something that both frustrated and scared them, because while they were strong and were quite the overlords of their section of space, that didn't mean that didn't know of the power of the Emperor. They were very aware of the Emperor's ability to fend off their insistence when they came looking for some answers. So obviously they were cautious in trying to approach the situation as they were kind of forced to investigate the planet the Emperor had taken over. The people, or more like the criminals that the Huts had come to associate themselves with were putting in some complaints. The Emperor was going to fire in the eyes of the criminals and their other backers, because they were arresting anyone that went towards the Unigen system. The Emperor was doing this for the sole purpose of making sure that no one, no criminal would come through them. Of course, outwardly it would seem as if the Emperor was operating within the bounds of what they are politically allowed to do. But Anakin was having the synth marines placed on Unigen, and their ships cut off trade from that direction. It wouldn't affect the huts too much, but the Emperor was uncomfortably close to them now, and not only that, there was enmity between both of these factions. Anakin had made sure to create a spectacle all those years ago, because he knew that sooner or later, he would need to start trying to fabricate reasons to go after the huts. There was just no way he was going to start playing with the lives of people he didn't know of, where they were probably innocent. Of course, not every common person or slave that was bogged down by the tyrannical huts were exactly innocent, but would Anakin really let the huts go? Just because they could hold hostage a few innocent people, he would say no. He would probably go after the huts anyway, to make them an example of why you shouldn't allow slavery from within themselves. He has had enough with waiting, so he put this plan in motion to make sure the huts responded, whether that be by trying to retake and possibly expand their own space, or they would do so because they would want to get some revenge. It could also be a combination of both, but Anakin didn't care about that. Instead, what he cared about is whether or not they would try and take action. He knew that they were prone to using mercenaries when it came to most of their dealings, because of their wealth, this would have worked for them. However, the Emperor would pay out the mercenaries involved, and would do so out of Anakin's pocket himself. He may kill any of whom would try and side with the Huts because they were unstable elements that needed to be put in check. The Huts were in fact making moves. Moves that would place them directly within the sights of Anakin's scope. The Huts, from the reports and scouting of their activities, were saying that they were hiring mercenaries to try and get involved. Anakin allowed this specifically. Because he wanted to create more and more reasons to retaliate, he both must make the main reason be something entirely separate from the actual reason of why he would attack them, and at the same time make sure that it is completely hidden. Liberation was something he wanted to achieve, but he wanted to make it look like an afterthought to everyone. He would even have to make sure those within his emperor are fooled into believing he didn't go to war with the huts over slaves, but instead because of other, maybe petty reasons. This was all done in the name of the greater good. The huts were fast approaching now, with their mercenaries in tow, and Anakin needed more evidence of their wrongdoing. Once he liberates everyone and enforces the huts to outlaw slaves, Slavery, he would be set and ready to turn his attention back towards the Republican separatists. What were the Kajitics of the Huts thinking? If one doesn't know what the Kajitics are, then here is a simple explanation. Kajitic was the name of the Hut philosophy which guided most of Hut daily life and politics. It was developed by the Hut Bidhila Hastilika Mora after the Huts relocated to Nal Hutta following the Hut cataclysms. The Hattese word for Kajitic is said to literally mean, somebody's got to have it. Why not us? Something that they would learn to regret as Anakin would also similarly adopt this mindset himself when taking into consideration the Huts. They have already started to turn their attention towards the planet Anakin, or the Emperor has control over, and they were getting greedy. One of the reasons the Huts have never really expanded the amount of space control they have is the lack of reasons. Specifically, they had grown kind of fat off of the backs of their ancestors, and Jabba, the one that had went ahead and formed his own empire, was killed. Someone that could be considered to be ambitious in following or followed the idea of somebody's got to have it. Why not us? Kajitic was also a loose hut term for their clans, their business interpreters and criminal syndicates, and for the archetypal super clan they believed was destined to eventually rule the galaxy. Separate clans would usually run their own Kajitic in competition with other clans, 
The Kajidiks were governed by the Hut Grand Council, which oversaw their operations, and each Kajidik had an appointed leader called a Kajidi or Lorda. Using this broken Mensa to his advantage, Anakin had made sure that they got greedy. He knows well enough about his own possessiveness and greed, which may have resulted in him accidentally getting multiple wives and lovers for himself. However, he has some temperance and control over that desire, simply because it would be impossible to have it all. No matter how much more powerful he gets, it would slow him down in a manner. Unlike the usual crime syndicate that operated in secret, the Hut clans operated out in the open, claiming leadership over dozens of worlds. The Kajidics employed those of all species as vassals, such as the Nikto and Gamorians. Though once being in constant conflict with each other, such as during the Hut Cataclysms, the Hut clans were kept in order by the Hut Grand Council, the ruling body of the entire Hut species, Hut space, and Hut clans. However, some rivalries could not be contained as was the case with the prominent Basadius and Desilogix, who were bitter enemies, and the Nemro and Phaethra clans, both of whom had members that were major rivals. The Huts were famous for their ruthlessness and success in the underworld. Many Huts would ransack ships for their load. As masters of the criminal underworld, they would steal, cheat, and murder without regret. They often hired smugglers to transport illegal spice. They would often have a fortress of some kind, often on remote planets, such as Jabba's Palace on Tatooine. That was actually no more. It was destroyed because Anakin didn't like it. Of course, there are other reasons as well, since it had slightly become a place of latent duck side energies as well. He liked the harmony he had created and was starting to create on Tatooine at the time, so he had to have destroyed it. Hut fortresses would usually be guarded by selected mercenaries or bounty hunters. Gamorians and Weequay were common species to fulfill this duty, leading an organization of crooks and scum meant competition. The huts that got involved with criminal activity were often killed or enslaved. Only the more cunning and clever huts, like Jabba, stayed at the top of the food chain. Some huts, like Jabba, had such an influence that they actually controlled entire planets. However, there were a few huts who didn't follow the lifestyle of a crime lord and stick to their Kajidik's criminal activities, such as Juvet of the Illip clan, who became a droid engineer. Hut kingpins often had torture chambers to deal with failures and unwanted guests. Other huts had pets which they would watch in enjoyment as the victim was devoured. There had been several Kajidiks that produced some very successful huts, such as Gorga Desilogic Arpo, Jiliak Desilogic Tyron, and Jabba Desilogic Tyre, all from Clan Desilogic. That proved to be very successful crime lords. Also, Clan Basadi also produced some successful crime lords, such as Gardala the Elder, Aruk Basadi Era, and Durga Basadi Tai. Clan Angeliac produced some successful crime lords itself, such as Mika Angeliac Chiera, a force-sensitive crime lord, and Kajidi Vito Angeliac Ataru. Also, the Illip clan produced the famous scientist Dr. Juvid Illip Ogirub. Naming off and listing every single one of these huts, lead Anakin to want and destroy their cartel even more. There were some that were absolutely disgusting, if not all of them, and it kind of made Anakin's blood boil, a problem that he knew was a part of his being, because he is the combination of his two selves, the original Anakin and him from his past life. In the war to come, Anakin would be focusing on capturing the leaders, the Kajidiks, because of their importance to the stability of the Hut Cartel. It would only be appropriate that he went after them even when a lot of the Kajidik, or at least a few of them, had been slain by Anakin, while that whole rebellion happened years ago. Not only would he be focusing on taking the leaders, the Kajidik, but he would also be focusing on taking the heirs to those clans as well, whether that be the children of the Huts or the Kajidik and those that would be next in line. So that would mean close family members, and even their wives, if he really wanted to go that far. He needed to have as much leverage as he could, and he needed to secure as many as he could to properly have everything destabilized. He would also be doing this to make sure he made the Huts dislike and even hate him. There was no way he was going to let go of such a chance. The Huts had sent some of their mercenaries over, but the Emperor within the Unigen system had already either captured, bribed or killed them. This led to the Hut Cartel needing to take even more action, action which included labor they were not used to. They were not a species with the best endurance out there, and it would be extremely hard for the Huts to move themselves. It was built into their biology, making them extremely powerful and have a great defense. But that would be at the impact of speed. Of course, there are always outliers within the bunch, but in general they were kind of sitting ducks. Anakin would also be taking advantage of that, but he would do so in a manner after he finds a reason to go to war with them. Again, he could always just declare a case's belly. That would have everyone be freed. But that would just be too dangerous. If any of the slaves from within even thought about fighting back, then that would only lead to a disadvantageous outcome for them. Not for Anakin as that would provide him with many distractions. But was he really willing to just forego all of the lives of these people? No. That would just be silly. Next on the list for what the Huts would do and what they did, was have themselves buy as many droids as they could even funnily enough, some droids that were a part of his own Skywalker Industries design, and attack the Unigen system again. They were unsuccessful in this attempt, and assumed to themselves that the Emperor would not retaliate, especially for a planet like the one they had taken over. They weren't stupid however, and wouldn't be spending any more money on trying to siege the Emperor on Unigen. That was until Anakin had manufactured a plan to allure them into the planet. There were messages and rumors about some big jackpot being found on Unigen, and that was why the Emperor was interested in taking it over before anyone else could find out. This certainly pulled their attention again, and they just couldn't let up and try to go in for it again, and this time, while doing so, Anakin would take the chance to fully put on display their actions to everyone. He would broadcast what they were doing and trying to do while having his soldiers there act by retreating themselves. The Huts were foolish enough to attack a third time, which gave Anakin all of the evidence he needed and through a broadcast sent out towards all of his own people and the people of the entire galaxy to see. 
that Anakin will be going to war with the Huts because of their actions against him. Fast approaching from space was a ship fully prepared and armed. A ship of which there were some people on board that was ready to go to war, or at least seemed to be armed to the teeth, and ready to engage in some form of violence. General Grievous, sir. An armored man, larger than Grievous, shouted as he also gestured with one of his hands, making a gesture that was like that of a soldier showing a sign of respect. Yes, it is. Grievous greeted the man back, as he then went around making sure to both check and greet all of those on board. The battle wouldn't exactly be a nice one, and would have their squaring off against the huts, something that the Republic is, and was terrified of going up against. Sir, the situation at hand is that they seem to be quiet, a soldier reported. So they have gone quiet. Grievous looked over everything, and could tell that he would need to start commanding the armies a bit more efficiently. Yes, sir. They have also created a blockade of sorts, meaning that it would be quite hard to breach through their rather large fleet size. The soldier continued replying and giving information as efficiently and effectively as he could. Their numbers, Grievous asked. They don't seem to have as much, but I think from the gathered reports, that they have spread out their forces, thinking that we would attack from all choke points. The soldier replied, I asked for their exact numbers soldier. I'm sorry sir. The soldier replied while also bowing deeply to show that he would accept any punishment in a time like this. I will decide your punishment later, but you should take this as a learning experience. Come prepared, fully prepared the next time you meet a superior. Grievous gave some friendly advice. What would happen if you had meet the emperor with your incompetency? Yes sir, I will remember for the god emperor. The soldier was now on the ground, but he wasn't exactly in that position because of Grievous, but instead, because Grievous had mentioned Anakin, the precious precious god emperor of the sense into most of the emperor as well. Man, I get the idea of the emperor being a divine being but there is no way that I would ever go down to that level of devotion. Grievous thought that within his head as he both simultaneously pumped for the action to come while at the same time observant of those under him. One might wonder he didn't really question the behavior, and only made a small mental note on this soldier's action, and that was because he was desensitized. Desensitized to what the sense did and most of all, because of the amount of time he has spent either within the Emperor and even on Dathoma, he was still exposed to the madness of the Emperor, the chaotic, mad, mad order of the Emperor. If the Jedi were ever looking for peace, and if the Sith were ever looking for their chaos, then everything would be found within the Emperor. All of those aspects that take from the best of both worlds were found from within, and Grievous loved it. It was something he could totally get himself behind, especially since Anakin wasn't all peace-loving, and was even starting a grand-scale war. A war of which would have him sent a field, leading and commanding people like he had done all those years ago, with his old body. Even before the cyborg form thanks to Anakin, where he was a proper biologically living being. Of course, he has his own body now, a new old body, recreated from the leftover DNA of his previous self. Walking around the deck of the ship, there wasn't only just the synthetic marines that used to be living droids on board, but there were other things. Other things that were specifically going to be used as cannon fodder, or something like that as they were also upgraded to be as good as possible. Droid of course. How many droids do we have and can we deploy them straight away? Are they the pilot kind or do we only have simple combat droids? Grievous was asking Spitfire questions, as while he had gotten a report already before he had come. There was still a problem of logistics. It was never perfect, and there could be mistakes in the coding or system. We have access to combat droids, a few medic droids for the synth soldiers as well as some pilot droids. That can be used as a forward attacking force. Another soldier, different from the one before, stepped forward to give this information. Grievous wasn't staying around in one place and was moving throughout the area to make sure everything is ready to go. They would be launching and declaring war soon, and Anakin was so gracious as to give the huts to prepare some level of defense. While they had taken care of the mercenaries and the hired droids, the huts still had access to their very own army retinues. It only made sense as if they didn't have their own standing army then how could they still be in control? Money is a powerful thing, but it is something dangerous to hold for the owner, as people could get greedy and just take it from you if it is left unprotected. Are the medic droids set up? Yes, sir. Are the combat droids ready for planetary deployment? Yes, sir. Grievous came to a stop as he gazed at the large amount of smaller vessels. That house some other weird-looking droids. That seemed to have the capabilities to pilot a ship. A starship to be exact. Gesturing towards all of the smaller vessels, Grievous then asks. Are the pilot droids ready for deployment as well? He looked into the eyes of the man that was larger and taller than him, and it was quite intimidating. One doesn't just spend some time under Anakin within her persona of Vader, and not adopt some of his intimidation tactics, or the way Vader would hold himself. Why yes sir. In the end, while the synths were trained particularly trained through normal training, Nothing like what the actual creator of the Sky Seed intended, as it was quite backwards. At least to Anakin it was backwards, and he instead decided that it would be better if he just generalized and specialized things to make it easier on the sense. Being loved and respected through hypnotherapy wasn't exactly what he wanted, but it would still be used when their bodies went through the growth process. Watching off from a distance within the hangar bay, Grievous oversaw the pilot droids and their small ships take off, going into the distance and forming a small formation. Some were in weird formations that looked as if they had no purpose, while others seemed basic and normal, while hiding the true strength of what they could pull off. There are other things in play as well, from the battle droids that would be on full display, and the medical droids also there to help heal any of the synth marines. Within the throne room, Anakin was on display through a hologram, and some huts were on display as well, 
given that negotiations were going on right now. A war wouldn't just happen straight away with no back and forth between the two opposing parties, as the one that doesn't want for the war to happen would try and get the other side to let up. This is exactly what the Huts are trying to do right now. Negotiate with Anakin, where they would offer him many things. This is if they are scared and wanted to not be demolished. But the Huts have a different view of their situation, especially since they know that they have more money, supposedly have a larger and greater wealth than the Emperor, and they believe that they could bribe Anakin. If not Anakin, then they could offer wealth to all of those within Anakin's armies, whether they be from foot soldiers to those higher up in command. In this instance they believe that they are on the top of the galaxy, with them being on the top of the long list, according to the food chain. It is true that they have a large amount of wealth but Anakin would be able to contest them, and even then, their attempts at trying to bribe others would be unsuccessful within the Emperor. The fervor and zealotry had already reached a point of no return a long time ago, and it would truly take something drastic to happen for the people to turn against Anakin. Those within higher positions may be more prone to doing so, and Anakin was waiting for those elected officials, some that were corrupt to just try. To what do I owe the pleasure? Anakin was speaking with those that were a part of the higher. No, highest management positions within the Hut Cartel. They were quite intimidating to see, given that they were large tanks that could mostly resist and be immune to physical damage. That is just a part of the evolutionary route they had taken, and it had paid off very, very well. Pleasure. Please don't try to humor us, puny Emperor. We the Huts take your threats very seriously. Instead of relying on someone to help communicate with Anakin, the Huts didn't even bother because they believed that Anakin would know their language. It wasn't like it wasn't public information that he used to be a slave specifically on a planet owned by one of their own. Anakin would be using a combination of the normal galactic standard language along with their own to make sure they play into the fact that he is below them. It works wonders to have your opponent underestimate you, especially since he wasn't within his Vader persona. A persona that had been retired because it would make the Emperor look weaker than it actually was. Then there are those within that would try to do something, because the supposed military leader was no more, or at least had vanished, who would believe that Anakin was Vader even with all of that religious squaler from the people, or more specifically created as rumors that was integrated into the legends of Anakin. A mythos was already starting to formed, and some parts of it had already been done so, with Anakin becoming the center of the Emperor and people's world. It was certainly strange, if not flattering at some level for Anakin to know that they thought so highly of him. Puny Emperor, eh? Anakin said as he looked at the huts within their holographic forms, many as they were, Anakin knew without a doubt that they would be easily dealt with. You must have an idea of why this is happening, correct? Anakin asked them to see if they did have an idea of why but it would seem that they didn't see the full picture. His plan had worked. What are you talking about, Slave Emperor? Of course this is because we, the Huts wanted to take something. Something that is not yours and should be ours. Their laughing could be heard as multiple found this funny. It would seem that you are a jester instead of our almighty leader then. How could you create jokes when I am right in front of you? Do you not fear for the well-being of your subjects, those that you all lord over? Anakin wanted to see if they had some level of care. Jester, how dare you? Whatever it is you want, you better call off your armies and retreat back to whence you came, slave. It would seem that Anakin's display of talking ruler to rulers didn't seem to affect them much. They felt assaulted by Anakin, insinuating that they would even dare to feel anything for those underneath them. It was the world of business for them, and there was no need in getting involved with those that were beneath themselves. Insulting me won't do you any good, and in fact it would only worsen the situation if you all were to be captured. Anakin could start to use the force on them and kill them even though he was so far away but he still needed to capture them all, instead of doing that. What he could do however is intimidate them. I advise that you all take caution when insulting someone. Anakin said as on the other side, the hut leader started to feel some pressure. It was as if something was wrapped around, and it also felt like some life force or something similar had been taken from them. This was so prominent that one of their fellow members, who was quite advanced in age now was starting to wither away. You see this. This is your fate if you do not surrender to me and follow through with my terms. Anakin stated, and made sure to at least kill one of them. In doing so it would set a precedent that they shouldn't get on his bad side. You dash one of them started before Anakin started to choke hold him, and started to make sure that they knew that he is the one doing so. He makes the same choking gesture to imply what he is doing. Stop that. One calls out and Anakin lets go. This is what is coming for you. Your wives, your children, the entirety of your families. Anakin looks around at all of them as his eyes came to life within their own projection of him. Instead of the blue coloring the entirety of his body would take, they could actually see that Anakin's holographic eyes went from blue to purple, the same color as his natural eyes. Never. You slave boy. You and your mother will pay for what you have done. The huts will have their revenge. One of the hut leaders said this, but they would immediately start trying to evacuate their families wherever they may be. They don't want their offspring or loved ones to come into any harm. They were incorrect in assuming that Anakin would just kill off all of their family, because what he would be doing is putting on a front. He wanted to make them believe he was just going to go on a mad slaughter, but that would be detrimental to those beneath them. While it is true that the Hut Cartel had created a monstrosity over their own semi-republic, but they had normal people under themselves as well. Not everywhere within Hut space were there criminals of all calibers. So be it. The communication was cut, and this was the final straw before it would lead to an all-out battle. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.